Enjoy, Dan. Hi, everyone, and welcome to .NET Conf. Focus on Blazor. .NET Conf is a live, free, online streaming event where you can learn everything there is to know about .NET, your platform for building anything. Uh, last September at .NET Conf 2019, uh, we had three full days, 24 hours per day of live streamed content all about .NET from folks both on the .NET team here at Microsoft and also from the community. We had so much fun that we just couldn't wait another year to do it again. So today, we're kicking off our, fir our first focused uh, .NET Conf uh, event where we're going to take a full day and dive deep into a specific uh, .NET topic. These uh, focus events will be spaced throughout the year, and you can find all about upcoming events at focus.netconf.net. Now, today's topic is Blazor, and we have a wonderful lineup of speakers and talks covering everything Blazor related. We're going to cover everything from how to deploy Blazor into production today to exciting future areas of investment. My name is Daniel Roth. I'm a program manager on the ASP.NET team. Welcome to Blazor, your full stack uh, solution for building web apps with .NET. Now, why use .NET? Well, .NET is your platform for building anything that can run anywhere. You can use .NET to build applications from uh, the desktop to gaming to mobile and to the cloud. .NET is a, um, uh, is a mature general purpose programming platform that is built to be fast and secure. .NET comes with a common set of innovative languages, tools, and frameworks that you can use to stay productive no matter what type of app you're building. Millions of developers use .NET to get their job done. Uh, .NET Core, our cross-platform and open source implementation of .NET, now has over 1 million active developers using it every month. .NET also has a great open source ecosystem uh, we have now uh, accepted over 100,000 pull requests uh, from the community as we've built the platform together. If you contribute to .NET Open Source, thank you for making .NET what it is today. And we're not done. We've got a lot more to do. Uh, just last September, we shipped the next major release of .NET Core, .NET Core 3. Uh, and it is now the fastest adopted version of .NET Core ever. Also, last month, uh, we shipped .NET Core 3.1. So if you haven't installed it yet, go get it. Uh, .NET Core 3.1 is uh, a long-term support release, an LTS release, of all the great features that we shipped in .NET Core 3, uh, including support for Windows desktop apps with Windows Forms or WPF, uh, support for C Sharp 8, and also support for build building full-stack web apps with Blazor. .NET also enjoys a rich ecosystem of partners uh, that build great tools and controls to help you build beautiful apps that are fully featured uh, really fast. Um, many of these uh, partners also build uh, control, uh, component libraries and tools for Blazor, like the ones that you see on the screen. Uh, these uh, components include powerful components like grids, tab views, charts, and so on. Uh, they build them so you don't have to and so that you can stay productive. We were also thrilled to see the .NET Foundation announced uh, today that DevExpress has joined the .NET Foundation as a corporate sponsor. Uh, DevExpress joins a group of corporations that are helping to drive the future of .NET uh, both as a platform and its ecosystem. You can read all about that announcement on the .NET Foundation's blog. So what is Blazor? Well, uh, .NET has always had a great story for building web applications with ASP.NET. In a typical .NET web application, you take your .NET code, you stick it on a server, and that code then generates HTML or JSON responses in response to browser requests. But if you then wanted to uh, have any logic that ran on the user's device uh, in the browser, then you had to switch languages and write JavaScript using typically a framework like Angular, React, Vue, or whatever the latest JavaScript framework of the day is. 
having to bridge between these two different languages, frameworks, and ecosystems adds cost and complexity and code duplication. Blazor is a client-side web UI framework that enables you to build your entire web applica application with just .NET. With Blazor, you can build beautiful, responsive, single-page apps, spa apps, uh, without having to write a line of JavaScript. It turns you into a full-stack .NET web developer with your existing .NET skills. Using Blazor, you can uh, write reusable web UI components with C Sharp and Razor. You can share your code uh, across the client and the server. And if you need to still call into JavaScript, like you have that JavaScript library that you still need to use, you can still do that with Blazor through JavaScript interop. Now, how does that work? Well, Blazor apps can operate in one of two different modes. Uh, the first mode we call Blazor Server. Blazor server apps uh, run your components on the server on top of .NET Core. Uh, the Blazor server app then sets up a real-time connection with the browser, typically over a WebSocket using SignalR. Any UI events that then happen in the browser are sent to the server and handled by your components, which then render. Uh, Blazor then keeps track of any changes that are made uh, to the UI using a sophisticated diffing algorithm. Uh, any changes are then sent back down to the browser and applied to the live DOM. Blazor server apps use a very thin client, uh, which can run great on um, low-power devices and in older browsers. Your .NET code runs on a full .NET Core runtime, so normal .NET features like .NET debugging just work. Blazor server apps can really simplify your app architecture by eliminating the need to stand up additional APIs or HTTP endpoints. Uh, also, all your code stays on the server. So as you write more .NET code, uh, your app size doesn't grow. It stays the same size. A Blazor server uh, shipped with .NET Core 3.1 LTS. So it is ready for production use today. The second mode of Blazor apps we call Blazor WebAssembly. Blazor WebAssembly apps run your components directly in the browser using a WebAssembly-based .NET runtime. In a Blazor WebAssembly app, your components are downloaded as normal .NET assemblies along with the runtime into the browser and executed directly in the browser. As UI events occur, they are handled directly by your components in the browser. They, the components render. Blazor tracks the changes and then efficiently updates the DOM. Blazor WebAssembly apps uh, have no required server component, so they can be deployed as pure static sites, for example, on GitHub pages or as, uh, using Azure Static Site Hosting. Uh, they can also support offline scenarios like you might have in a progressive web app. Now, Blazor WebAssembly is still in preview, and it's not recommended for pr production use just yet. It did not ship as part of .NET Core 3.1 LTS. Uh, but we're actively working on it, and we expect to ship it later this year. And I'll share more about the Blazor WebAssembly roadmap later in this talk. Both of these modes, both of, the, both of these hosting models, share the same component model. And what that means is that you can use the same components regardless of whether you're writing a Blazor server or a Blazor WebAssembly app. Also, it means that you can easily switch between the two hosting models without much effort. It's easy to get started with Blazor. To get started, go to blazor.net. You're going to need to install .NET Core 3.1. If you want to try out the Blazor WebAssembly preview, you're going to need to run an additional command to get the Blazor WebAssembly template. For tooling, uh, if you're on Windows, you can use Visual Studio. Visual Studio 2019 16.4 includes Blazor tooling support. Uh, as well as .NET Core 3.1. So if you have that already, then you should be all set to go. If you're on a Mac, uh, you can develop Blazor apps now with Visual Studio for Mac 8.4, which just shipped last week. If you prefer to use Visual Studio Code, you can develop, develop Blazor apps with Visual Studio Code uh, by installing the C Sharp extension. All right, let's take a look at Blazor in action. All right, so to set up your machine with Blazor, what you're going to want to do is go over to blazor.net. That's the one URL you should remember from today. 
All right, when you go there, that'll bring you to the Blazor homepage. You're then going to want to click on the Get Started button, which will then take you to this page, and you just follow the steps to set up Blazor on your machine. I've already done that, so let's go over to Visual Studio and create our first Blazor app. Let's create a new project. We're going to select that we want to create a Blazor app. Just look for the purple flame, click Next. Uh, that looks like a good name for a Blazor app, Blazor app 1. Click Create. And then here you see those two options for creating Blazor apps, Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. For this demo, I'm going to select Blazor Server. Click Create. And now Visual Studio uh, created for me my first Blazor Server project. Blazor Server apps are normal ASP.NET Core web applications. Uh, they run on .NET Core. We can see that by looking at the project file. You can see that this project is targeting .NET Core 3.1. Uh, if we look in the startup class, we can see that there's just a couple of lines of code here uh, to set up Blazor Server. Here's where uh, it's adding the Blazor Server uh, services into DI. And then down below, you can see there's also an endpoint being added for the Blazor Server hub. That's the hub that will handle those real-time connections with the browser. This app also has a single Razor page in it, a normal CSHTML file. This over here, host.cshtml. Let's open that up. In this page uh, is where we're adding the Blazor server script. That's the script that will actually establish the real-time connection back to the, uh, the Blazor server hub on the server. And then up above, we're rendering the root component of the app using this component tag helper. And that's all you need in order to get Blazor Server set up in your ASP.NET Core app. Uh, you can add Blazor Server to your existing uh, ASP.NET Core, MVC, and Razor Pages applications, uh, and then add components to your existing views and pages. There's no need to rewrite anything. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and get this app up and running. We'll F5 to build and run. Visual Studio will then kick off a build, build the application, and get it hosted on, uh, on IS Express. And we should see a simple uh, SPA-style application. We can navigate around the app using these tabs. We can then use the browser nav tools to navigate forwards and backwards. Uh, this is all client-side routing-based. Uh, Blazor is intercepting the browser navigations and then routing those uh, requests to the appropriate components to then render. On the Home tab, we have some simple uh, HTML content. On the Counter tab, we have a button that when we click the button, the count goes up. Normally, this would require uh, JavaScript to make happen because there's no page refresh happening here. But to do this, I didn't have to write a single line of JavaScript. This is all done with .NET and C Sharp. We can see that by looking at the implementation of that Counter tab. That's in this Counter component in Counter.Razor. Here it is. Um, we can go ahead and set a breakpoint right here in this increment count method. And if we go back to the counter tab and click the button, boom, there we just hit our C sharp code, which is handling that UI event. Let's go ahead and let that continue, and we'll go ahead and, and clear the, the breakpoint. Um, this counter component, its, its rendering logic is implemented using Razor syntax. Razor is a combination of HTML and C sharp. Up at the top, you can see this app page directive. Uh, and it's specifying that this component is routable, that it has a route. And the route in this case is slash counter. That means any navigations to slash counter should end up here. We then have some normal HTML content, and we're using a little bit of Razor syntax here to render the value of this current count field. We then have a button, and it has an onClick attribute, which normally would contain JavaScript, but here we're pointing to our increment count C sharp method. So every time this button gets clicked, Increment count gets called. This uh, uh, C sharp current count field gets incremented. The component automatically re renders, and that's what's updating the UI. Pretty cool. On this fetch data tab, we have a dynamically generated table of weather forecast data. This tab is implemented by the fetch data component, which is in uh, fetch data.razor. Uh, a little bit more going on here, but still looks pretty, pretty similar. At the top, we have that page directive again to specify the route for this component, slash fetch data. Uh, this component is using the at inject directive to inject a service into the component. Here it's injecting a weather forecast service, which is going to get populated into this generated uh, forecast service property. Blazor supports dependency injection, uh, just like all ASP.NET Core apps do.
Then we have some HTML markup. Uh, down at the bottom of the component, we can see one of the Blazor component lifecycle uh, methods being used. Here, this component, when it's initialized, it's calling that weather forecast service to get the uh, weather forecast data. And it's uh, setting that on this uh, weather forecast array field. Then up above, in the rendering logic, when it's rendering out the table, it's using that weather forecast array and a normal C sharp for each loop uh, to render each row of the table. It's just that simple. So that's fetch data. Um, the layout of this application, like this left uh, sidebar, this purple sidebar with the tabs, and this little header element up at the top, that's all implemented using a layout component. We can see that in the shared folder. Main is the layout component for this app. We can tell it's a layout component because it inherits from layout component base. And it's setting up the, this left sidebar using this uh, custom nav menu component. And then the main body of the app, including that little header element at the top. It's using this special body property uh, to specify where the content from the different routable components uh, should be rendered, so right here. Uh, where does the layout for the app actually get, uh, get specified? Why is it this particular layout component? Well, layout is specified using the built-in router component in, in Blazor, which in this app is being used in the app's root app component. And we can see that over here. Here's the app component. It's using the router component. Um, this is the component that will go and find all the routable components in the app and uh, correctly uh, route uh, navigations to those components. And it's specifying also that the default layout should be that main layout component. Awesome. So that's uh, this simple application. We just built our first Blazor app. Uh, now let's take a look at a more realistic uh, uh, Blazor, Blazor server application. So this is a simple recipe app. Let me go ahead and get this running. All right, so in this app, we have a nice list of recipes uh, with delicious looking pictures. It's got a search uh, text box at the top. Uh, we can start searching for recipes. Um, let's see, let's search for something with uh, maybe some chocolate. Yeah, okay, we got some Godiva angel pie, some salted caramel six layer chocolate cake. That sounds delicious. All right, cool. Uh, what else? Maybe we can search for something with uh, strawberries. Um, this app supports you know, partial searches, so we're seeing uh, strawberries Romanoff, strawberry lemonade, and then straw and hay fettuccine. Uh, apparently, this is a real thing, you know, fettuccine with straw and hay, I guess. I don't know. We, we can click on the, uh, the recipe to learn all about it. Here's our recipe uh, details page. We see a, a summary of the average uh, star reviews for this uh, recipe. Apparently, no one's reviewed it yet. Um, maybe it's because it has straw and hay in it. I don't know. It uh, looks like it doesn't actually have straw and hay in it. I guess that's just a, a thing you, uh, that you call your fettuccine, straw and hay fettuccine. Uh, down below, we've got the instructions for the recipe, uh, and then some tags, and then a little UI widget for specifying reviews uh, for this recipe. Uh, so for example, if we wanted to, to post a review, let's say, like, uh, what should we post? Um, this is great. Um, and it's straw and hay, right? So, you know, my, my horse loves it. Uh, five stars. Submit. Great. And then um, maybe another review. Uh, gross. Uh, tastes like grass. Uh, one star. All right. And as you can see that as we add reviews, they get added to the bottom. And then up at the top, it's calculating the, the average review. Again, no page refresh happening here. This is all being done in a, the style of a single page app. Okay, so that's this little recipes app. How is this all working? Let's take a look at the implementation. Uh, let's take a look at this home page first. Uh, that's in this index component, index.razor. All right, so at the top, we see that page directive again. It's got a route. Uh, so this is the component that should render at the root of the app. We're using dependency injection to inject our uh, recipe store into this component. We then have a custom search box component, which is rendering that search box at the top. It's got some normal HTML attributes, and then it's uh, allowing me to, it looks like it's allowing me to specify a callback when a search occurs. The search query change callback will then call my search method. All right, then down below, we're rendering out uh, an unordered list of all the recipes, and we're using another custom component to render out each recipe. 
And down below in the code block, we can see once again, there's one of the Blazor component lifecycle uh, events being used. When this component is initialized, it calls into the recipe store to get the initial list of recipes. And then when any search occurs, it queries the store based on the, the query provided in order to get the filtered list of recipes. So that's how that, that main home page is working. This recipe card, that's a custom component. We can see that over here in this components folder. It's pretty simple. It's mostly just rendering out static content. It is using this star rating component uh, in order to render the average star rating for this particular recipe. Here you can also see that we're passing a parameter into this component, the recipe that we want to have rendered uh, in this card, and that's then used above. Parameters are just public properties that are attributed with the parameter attribute. All right. Uh, that looks pretty simple. What about this search box component? Well, that's a little bit more interesting. Here's searchbox.razor that implements that, that component. So this search box is mostly just a normal HTML input. It has a couple of extra things going on, though. It's using this attributes um, um, uh, directive attribute in order to add any additional attributes that were specified on the component uh, to be rendered right here on this input tag. So all the additional attributes on the component are captured by this additional attributes parameter and then get rendered right here. That's how we're able to override the default placeholder, which just says search, with our custom placeholder, which says you know, search for recipes. OK, and then we have this bind directive attribute, uh, which is setting up a two-way bind between the value of the input and this search query uh, property, which is down below in the code block. So search query is just a normal C sharp property. And so this is uh, what's happening here is a two-way bind. So anytime the value of the input changes, then this search query property uh, gets set with the new value. And then any time that the input is re-rendered, the uh, value of the input is initialized using the value of this search query uh, property. Uh, so it's a two-way bind going both ways. And you can also configure which event you want to use uh, for uh, when changes occur on the, on the input. Here we're saying that we'd like to use the on input event. So every time I type on the keyboard, uh, this, uh, this bind should occur. All right, cool. So that's two-way data binding. Uh, what else do we got? Well, um, we're, we're triggering that bind on every single keystroke. Uh, we probably don't want to do a search with every single key, keystroke. Uh, that would flood our server probably with a whole bunch of unnecessary searches. Ideally, we would wait for a period of time after the user has stopped typing and then do the search. Um, that's called debouncing. And here we can implement some simple debouncing logic for our search box using just normal C sharp. And you can see that done here. Uh, we have a normal timer uh, class, a timer instance, which is from the you know, system.timers. And you can see that in the setter of the search query property, every time the search query property gets set, we stop any timer that's already running, and then we restart it. And then down below, in on initialized, we're setting up that timer, uh, specifying its interval to be the value of this uh, de debounce parameter, which by default is set to 300 milliseconds, but you can change it. Um, and then when the timer elapses, if it actually makes it all the way to the end without being reset due to another keystroke, then it's going to call this search event handler. The search event handler is down here, and every time that search event handler fires, it then invokes our search query changed event callback, which is again specified as a, another parameter up above. That's the that's the uh, callback that we specified when we used the component on our home page. So every time that timer expires, this callback gets called, which calls my search method on the home page, which then executes the query. So that's how you can implement some simple C, uh, debouncing logic, all with C Sharp using Blazor. All right, so that's pretty cool. Um, what about the recipe details page? Let's go back to uh, our uh, straw and hay fettuccine. All right, so how is this page implemented? Well, that page is implemented using this recipe details component. Again, it's a routable component. This time, the route actually has a route parameter, uh, so it can capture the ID of the recipe that we want to display details about. It's using a dependency injection to get the recipe store. And then most of this is pretty straightforward. It's just rendering out details about the recipe, the recipe name, uh, where the recipe came from, and how many servings it has. There's that star rating component again to uh, show the average star rating for this recipe. There's an image for displaying that big banner. And then we're rendering out all of the ingredients for this recipe. Here we're just using a normal C-sharp for loop. 
uh, to render out each of the, the ingredients as a, a checkbox list. And then below, we have the instructions being rendered for the recipe. Uh, we're again iterating over all of the um, paragraphs in the instruction, uh, instructions and rendering them as normal p tags. Uh, we're rendering that list of tags at the bottom of the page so that you know, it's easier to search for our recipes. That's that section at the bottom. Again, using a normal C sharp uh, for each loop. And then at the very bottom, we have this star rating reviews component that's being used to render this uh, star ratings UI uh, at the bottom. Now, the star rating component and the star rating reviews component, those are com custom uh, components, but they're not implemented in the app. Those are actually implemented in a separate class library that's referenced by the app project. They're both in this star ratings project over here. This is just a normal uh, .NET standard class library project that's set up to be able to compile uh, Razor files uh, as uh, component classes. So the nice thing about this is that because our components live in this class library, we can then reuse them from multiple projects and in multiple applications. All right, so let's take a look at how those components are implemented. Here's the star rating reviews component. It has two parts. So first, it has a form uh, that you can use to post new reviews. We'll go over that in just a second. And then we've got another uh, C sharp for loop that's rendering each of the reviews that have already been posted. Uh, it's uh, you, you know, putting the star rating for that uh, given review uh, and also, uh, um, also uh, the text from the review and uh, you know, putting a horizontal rule to separate each of the, the, the ratings. All right, that looks cool. Uh, so what's up with this, this form? Well, um, this form is being implemented using these built-in uh, edit form and input uh, components. Uh, edit form and the uh, corresponding set of input components are a set of built-in components that render normal HTML uh, form and input tags, but with the addition of an edit context that is used for uh, uh, validation. So here we can see that this edit form is being set up to use data annotations uh, for validation. Um, the actual validation rules themselves are specified on the model type. So here our model is this review instance, which is down below. And the, on the review type, if we go look at it, the review type has normal data annotations to specify that these properties are required and putting limitations on their range and their, their length. Standard data, annota data annotation stuff. <clears throat> we then have that star rating component so the user can specify what star rating they want to use and then the input text area component. So if we go back to the form, if we try to submit this form, for example, without any content, uh, validation kicks in, and you saw there was this validation summary component that then displays all of the validation errors for us. As I then use the, um, um, the form in order to provide some review data, you can see that those validation errors automatically start to disappear. Uh, this recipe is so-so. Uh, and then Tap off that, and you can see the, all the validation errors are now gone. I can now submit the review. And so this on su valid submit callback only gets called if all of the validation then passes. So that's forms and validation uh, with Blazor. All right, cool. So that's how this app is all, all functioning. Looks great. Now, because these components, like I said, are uh, for star ratings, are being implemented in a separate class li library, that means we can now use them in any app that we'd like. Um, let's go ahead and try to use them from the app we created previously, you know, the first app that we created at the beginning of this, of this demo. Uh, how do we do that? Okay, well, first let's take our star ratings uh, project and let's go ahead and pack it. So we're going to turn it into a NuGet package using, uh, with Visual Studio's help. So pack this uh, star ratings project. That'll kick off a build and then create the NuGet package. Great, that looks good. Okay, now we should be able to go into the folder for this project and the bin directory. And there, there's our star ratings NuGet package that we just created. And we can publish this on NuGet.org or wherever we'd like. I've set up a local feed on my machine. I'm just going to copy this package into that, uh, that feed. And then let's go back now to our original uh, Blazor app. Let's get it up and running again. And where should we add some reviews? Um, let's add some reviews to this uh, weather forecast page so that people can post reviews about the weather. I mean, people love talking about the weather, right? You know, to express how you really feel. So, okay, let's see if we can do that. All right, so let's add a NuGet package, manage NuGet packages on Blazor app one. Let's browse my local feed and let's see if we can find our star ratings package. There it is. We'll just install that. 
and accept all the terms and conditions. Installing the NuGet package. And there it goes. Great. OK, uh, first thing we should then do probably is to add a using statement for the namespace of that package. I'm going to do that in this imports.razor file. Imports.razor is a file that where you can specify a bunch of Razor content that will get imported in all the files down the, the folder hierarchy from that, from that file. So it's a convenient place to put a bunch of common code like using statements. Great. So now we've got our using statement all set up. Uh, let's now go to our fetch data component where we want to add uh, support for reviewing the weather. Uh, we're going to need a place to store our uh, weather reviews. So let's create a little list of review right here. We'll call it reviews and a new list of review. Perfect. That's where we'll store our reviews. And then up here at the top, maybe. Maybe right here, let's add a p tag and we'll put, use that star uh, rating component. And the value of it will be, uh, let's see, reviews. Yeah, reviews dot. And then I have a little uh, helper method, um, what was it, average, yeah, average rating, a little extension method that will calculate the uh, average rating of all the reviews in that list. Great. We'll just close that off. OK, let's see if this is working. If we go back to the app, you can see that it's already detected that uh, changes have been made. And it's telling me I just need to refresh the browser. We'll go ahead and do that. And yeah, OK, we're seeing some stars at the top. No reviews so far. Now we need a way to add reviews. So let's go down here to the bottom and we'll add the, that star, was a star rating reviews component. Get lovely IntelliSense. Great. Uh, this asks me to pass in the list of reviews uh, that already exist. So I'll pass in my reviews list. And then we need to wire up this on submit review callback um, to handle any reviews that get submitted. OK, and I don't have that method for that to handle that yet. Let's go ahead and add that. Let's add a void on submit review method right here. It takes a review. And let's just do reviews.add that review. All right, so we'll just add the review if it, one gets submitted. And we should be able to say on submit review right there. Perfect. IntelliSense is working. That looks great. Make sure that all the red squiggles go away, and they do. Let's go back to the app. We need to refresh again because we made some changes. Awesome. OK, so we're seeing our kind of seeing our form at the bottom. It doesn't look very nice. Uh, it's not picking up all the uh, lovely CSS styles that I painstakingly created. Um, those CSS styles are in the um, class library project. project. Uh, you may have noticed this www root folder in the star ratings project. If we expand that, you can see there's our uh, star ratings.css file, which has all the nice styles for, for uh, rendering the stars. Um, there's a new feature in ASP.NET Core where you can include uh, static assets like this in class libraries and then have them get picked up when the project is referenced or when the uh, project is packaged as a NuGet package and that NuGet package gets referenced. So this star ratings.css should be available to my app. There's just a simple convention that I can use to get it. Let's go to the host CSHTML file, the, you know, the, sort of the, the root page of our uh, Blazor app one, and we're just going to add another link to that CSS file. The convention you use to point to uh, static assets in a library is underscore content. And then the name of the library, which I believe in this case was star ratings. And then the path to the file under that www root folder in the library. So in this case, it, I believe it was star ratings.css. And if we save that and go back to the app, F5. And there we go. OK, cool. So we're getting our styles now. All right, so we should be able to post some reviews about the weather. Let's see, what does it uh, look like? It's kind of really hot, uh, kind of warmish. Yeah, it's kind of a mix. Uh, let's say um, uh, uh, it would be great if the weather could make up its mind. Uh, two stars. Oh, that's too long, too long. Uh, the weather <laughs> should make up its mind. Two stars. There we go. And submit that. Great. Uh, and then I love variety. Uh, five stars. 
All right, cool. And you can see that as we post reviews, they're rendered below, and the average review up at the top, average star uh, uh, rating is being calculated and updated without having to write any JavaScript, no page refresh happening here. There, we just reused our uh, star ratings reviews uh, component in our Blazor server app. Pretty awesome. All right, so that's Blazor in action. Um, this is just the beginning of what Blazor is uh, capable of. Uh, to learn more about Blazor and its component model and all of its features, uh, definitely go check out the Blazor docs on the blazor.net site. Work through the tutorials there. Uh, we also have a free public open source Blazor workshop that you can uh, work through at aka.ms slash Blazor workshop. Um, this workshop consists of a series of self-paced labs that you then uh, use to build this uh, pizza store site uh, with many of our uh, favorite British pizzas. You can see it's a British-themed uh, pizza store site. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Definitely go and check that out. Now, Blazor server uh, is built to scale. Uh, Blazor server can handle tens of thousands of concurrent active users. Uh, we test Blazor Server at scale by taking a Blazor Server app and then hammering it with increasing a uh, number of active concurrent clients. These are active clients, so they're interacting with the UI, you know, clicking on things about uh, once per second. Uh, when we test Blazor Server uh, on a you know, relatively small VM, one virtual CPU, three and a half gigabytes of memory, uh, it can sustain over 5,000 concurrent active clients. Uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, if you uh, increase the size of the VM to four virtual CPUs, uh, 14 gigabytes of memory, it can then handle over 20,000 concurrent active, uh, active users uh, without any degradation in latency. Now, it can actually sustain more users than that, um, but as at that point, the, the latency starts to, to, to creep up a bit. Uh, the main uh, bottleneck for Blazor server uh, appears to be memory. Um, so these are baseline numbers. Um, real app behavior will depend on how much your app uh, allocates uh, per, per connected client, uh, primarily, uh, and then also your client behavior and your corresponding network conditions. But I uh, hope you can see that as a core capability, Blazor Server actually scales really well. If you want to learn all about scaling your Blazor server apps, be sure to check out Ryan Novak's uh, Scaling Blazor Server Apps with Azure Talk later today at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, here are some examples of customers that are using Blazor today. Uh, Pivotal is using Blazor for their public Steel Toe uh, website. Um, Piv uh, Steel Toe is Pivotal's cloud native solution uh, for .NET. Uh, why did they choose Blazor? Well, they said that using Blazor made it simple to design their website just using C Sharp. Uh, Deployed is a startup uh, that's using Blazor to build software for managing statements of work. Um, they wrote their entire app using C Sharp and .NET and just 51 lines of JavaScript. Uh, in future Blazor releases, we hope to make that number even smaller. Video Sys Broadcast is a company that makes broadcast uh, TV equipment, like hardware, hardware racks for uh, broadcast TV. Uh, these uh, hardware racks have a uh, UI panel on the front, and they were able to use Blazor Server to rapidly develop a unified front panel and remote UI for use in a broad range of their products. Uh, BST Global is a uh, leader in ERP and business management uh, software. They're using Blazor Server to uh, take their solution uh, to uh, the web. Uh, and why did they choose Blazor? Well, it's because it allows their developers to stay productive using C Sharp. Internally at Microsoft, uh, we're also using Blazor. Um, despite our guidance uh, to that Blazor WebAssembly is not production ready quite yet because it's still in preview, uh, we went ahead and used it anyway. Um, not recommending that you should do the same. Um, Try.net is an in-browser experience for trying out C Sharp and .NET uh, with, with just a browser. Um, the code, you just type some code into the browser and then you can click run and we'll, we'll run it for you. Originally, this technology, Try.net, uh, used uh, a backend 
uh, system, a backend pool of container instances that they would use to take your code, they would compile it, and then run it in those isolated uh, container instances. Uh, this backend infrastructure was pretty expensive to maintain, especially considering that most of the time the code was just people you know, running Hello World. Uh, they were able to use Blazor WebAssembly to instead run the user's code client-side in the browser and then were able to dramatically reduce uh, the cost of their backend infrastructure. The Blazor community also does lots of awesome stuff. Uh, they create uh, component libraries, JavaScript interop libraries, really cool sample apps, articles, videos, blogs. You can check out all things Blazor related in the community at the Awesome Blazor site. That's at aka.ms slash awesome blazor. You can also chat with folks in the Blazor community on the Blazor Gitter. Uh, there are lots of folks there all the time uh, to help you get started. All right, so we've taken a look at just you know, a little bit about what Blazor uh, is, is capable of. Let's now take a look at where we see Blazor going in the future. We envision actually an entire spectrum of applications ranging from web apps all the way to full native applications uh, that you will be able to build with Blazor. Now, we've already seen Blazor Server, where you can build rich, interactive web apps um, using uh, Blazor and .NET Core. Later this year, we will ship support for Blazor WebAssembly, where you can then run your components client-side on the user's device uh, using WebAssembly. You can extend your Blazor apps uh, to become progressive web apps using existing open web standards and then enable more native-like features like offline support or the ability to pin your app to your, the home screen of your phone or other OS integrations like uh, having it show up in the Windows 10 start menu. Blazor hybrid apps are native .NET applications that use web technologies for their UI, like HTML and CSS. We've already shared some experiments publicly of creating uh, Blazor hybrid apps, for example, using uh, Blazor with Electron to build cross-platform desktop apps. Blazor native apps are, again, uh, native .NET applications, but now they're using the native UI elements of the underlying platform. Uh, with Blazor native applications, you're no longer using the web technologies to build your UI, like HTML and CSS. You're using the underlying components of the, of the platform. But as a web developer, you get to leverage your knowledge of Blazor's component model and idioms. All right, so where are we at with this spectrum? Well, Blazor WebAssembly, uh, now that we're done with .NET Core 3.1, we've shipped it in the, as an LTS release, uh, shipped Blazor Server as, as an LTS release. Our focus has now shifted completely to shipping Blazor WebAssembly later this year in May. Uh, this in initial release of Blazor WebAssembly will be based on .NET Core 3.1, and it will then also ship in a future update of the .NET Core 3.1 SDK. Now, because this will be the first supported release of Blazor WebAssembly, it will be a current release, not an LTS release like the rest of .NET Core 3.1. Uh, to help make that clear, we will update the versions of the Blazor WebAssembly packages uh, to be 3.2 instead of 3.1. After May, after that release, Blazor WebAssembly will then move into .NET 5 and become part of the normal uh, .NET release train. Here are the features that we have planned for the May release of Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly will support .NET Standard 2.1. It will have support for WebSockets, as well as the .NET SignalR client. It will have full support for debugging, both in the browser and also in Visual Studio. Uh, we will support auto-rebuild uh, so that you can do fast, iterative UI development. Uh, IL trimming to keep your app size small. We'll support Brotly compression also to reduce the app size. Uh, we will integrate with ASP.NET Core's uh, static web assets uh, functionality. Uh, we will support all of the standard authentication options from ASP.NET Core. And we'll, of course, also add support for localization. All right, what about Blazor Hybrid? Uh, well, we have uh, a couple of Blazor Hybrid experimental projects uh, that you can try out. 
Um, we've already shared previously um, an ex uh, experiment for using Blazor with Electron. And you can try that out at aka.ms slash Blazor Electron. More recently, Steve Sanderson also shared a really cool new experimental project called Web, Web Window. Uh, Web Window is kind of like an Electron light. It's like Electron, but without Node.js, which we're not going to be using because we're, we have .NET Core, and also without the embedded Chromium shell. This makes the application much more lightweight, both in terms of size on disk and also memory consumption. Uh, you can check out Web Window at aka.ms slash Web Window and see how it can be used with Blazor. Uh, exploring Blazor hybrid scenarios is going to be a major theme uh, for .NET 5. And if you want to learn all about uh, what's happening with Blazor WebAssembly and also Blazor hybrid scenarios, be sure to check out Steve Sanderson's talk on Blazor Future Features uh, right after this session. I'm also really excited to announce a new experimental project for Blazor Native. The Experimental Mobile Blazor Bindings is a new experimental project that we just made public today that lets you build fully native apps with Blazor. Uh, it includes a complete set of native mobile components for both Android and iOS. It gives you 100% access to native APIs like GPS, Bluetooth, media, and, and more. Uh, you can use existing .NET libraries from your Blazor, uh, Blazor uh, native application, all done with, with .NET. You should check it out by going to aka.ms slash mobile Blazor bindings. And also later today, Elon Lipton is going to do a whole session on the experimental mobile Blazor bindings. Uh, you should check that out at 1 p.m. Pacific time. All right, here's the schedule. For .NET going forward, um, we shipped .NET Core 3.0 in September and then updated it in .NET Core 3.1 uh, in, well, uh, last month on, uh, well, in November, on November 33rd, I guess. <laughs> um, .NET 5 is then scheduled to ship in November of this year, and we expect to have a major .NET release uh, every year thereafter, with even numbered releases uh, being LTS releases. Uh, we're squeezing in the Blazor WebAssembly assembly release in May uh, of this year, after which the Blazor WebAssembly will then become part of .NET 5 and then continue on as part of the normal .NET release train. Uh, for Blazor Hybrid and Blazor Native, there's no committed roadmap yet. These are just experimental projects. Uh, the future of those projects, of course, depends on feedback that we get from users like you. All right, so in summary, Blazor is your solution for building full stack web apps with C Sharp and .NET. Welcome to Blazor. In sessions later today, you'll be able to learn all about how you can build uh, rich, interactive UI components using Blazor and integrate them with your existing ASP.NET Core web applications. Blazor Server has shipped with .NET Core 3.1 LTS and is ready for production today. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly uh, is still in preview, but is coming in May of this year. Uh, be sure to try out the new Blazor hybrid and native experiments. And uh, if you haven't get, uh, already, get started with Blazor today by going to blazor.net. And with that, I'm now ready to answer some, some questions live. If you'd like to answer, uh, ask any questions, uh, about Blazor, uh, you can go to Twitter and use hashtag .NET Conf, uh, to ask a question, and our moderators will, will post them and get them all set up, and we'll see what we can do for you. Okay. <laughs> we do have some questions, Dan. That was great, uh, by the way. Um, actually, we have a ton of questions. There's so many amazing flip questions. Mic. Oh, flip my mic. Okay. Hold on. Let's turn the mic. On. <laughs> yes. Okay. We can hear you now. <laughs> we can hear me now. All right. Oh, much cool. Better. We actually have a ton of questions. So um, actually, uh, let's uh, let's take this one here. It's about security. Okay. okay. Hey, Donikoff. If security isn't a factor, what are the pros cons to using DB context directly from a Razor page versus the traditional SPA way of taking talking to APIs to get data, and why? All right. Cool. So that's that's really about um, you know the differences between the different Blazor hosting models. So if you're, 
If you're building a Blazor server app, remember your code is running on the server. Your components are already there. They have access to the database. If you want to open a DB context connection to your database, you can do that. There's no need to like create an API endpoint that you then use to talk to yourself because you're already on the server. So if you're on the server already, you can just go ahead and talk to the database. There's no security concern there. You're already within your, security, uh, your um, secure server environment. If you're building a Blazor WebAssembly app, well, that code is actually running client-side in the browser. So to access resources on the server, then you do need API endpoints that you can talk to. So you would expose whatever data you want to expose through a, like a normal HTTP API or uh, whatever type of service you'd like to. Um, a common pattern is to abstract away the data access that you do in your application using the service. And then what you can do is you can have different implementations of that service depending on where your components are being hosted. So you could have an implementation of that uh, service that if you're running in Blaz a Blazor server app, then it just talks directly to the database. If you're running client side in the browser, then that implementation of that service can be calling API endpoints, which then talk to the database. And as far as your component code is concerned, it looks exactly the same. That's how you can abstract away those type of uh, hosting model specific concerns. Awesome. Cool. All right, how about another one? Um, here's a couple about roadmap. So uh, waiting for focus. This was actually, he asked the question before it even started. Got in the um, so you really might have early. actually answered this, but first two <laughs> questions. Which is, what is the roadmap of Blazor? I think you did show that, right? May um, of this year. Yeah. Blazor, Blazor WebAssembly, I think, is what the uh, Yeah, so when's the first about. stable release of the production environment? It's a good, is it a good idea to start work now on a new project using Blazor Wasm with the latest version, or should people start using the server mode now? Great, great question. So, the, um, we don't recommend going into production with Blazor WebAssembly right now because it's still in preview. Um, we're still working on it. Things will change, like there will be some API churn in the hosting model, not in the component code, because the component model for Blazor WebAssembly is the same component model that we use in .NET Core 3.1. It actually is the component model in .NET Core 3.1. So that part won't change, but the hosting model code will shuffle around a little bit before we, we ship. Blazor Server, it's available in .NET Core 3.1, it's LTS, it's ready for production use today. A really common pattern is some customers are starting out with Blazor Server if they want to eventually move to Blazor WebAssembly and then uh, planning to flip their apps over. Um, Blazor Server is also a great solution for many, many applications. A lot of people are being successful with it. Uh, so that's something you can do right now. Um, if you are waiting for Blazor WebAssembly, um, that will release in May, at which point it will then become a uh, supported, uh, supported framework. Cool. Um, yeah, I think we still have some time for more questions here. How about this one? This seemed interesting. We're developing a Blazor SPA and are concerned about performance. It will have a large number of on-screen components. Can you explain how we ensure all the components are not reevaluated, Razor scripts run, when a small change takes place? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So Blazor is really clever about this. So Blazor actually keeps track of changes as they get made and uh, will only run the components when they're, when they're relevant in the component hierarchy, and also will only touch the DOM um, when changes have been made to that part of the DOM. Uh, Blazor has a very clever diffing algorithm that it uses, so as components render, it keeps track of what was rendered previously and what was just rendered. It calculates a diff, and that's what it actually uses to, to update the DOM. So from a UI rendering perspective, Blazor is actually really efficient, and I don't uh, envision any issues there. Uh, in terms of uh, runtime uh, performance for like your, your code, like your, your business logic, uh, Blazor Server is running on a normal .NET Core runtime, so it gets all the performance benefits of .NET Core, which is blazingly fast. You know, arguably one of the fastest stacks on the, on the planet. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly apps are running on a WebAssembly-based .NET runtime. That runtime today is a, an IL interpreter-based runtime. So it's not the, the fastest thing on, on the planet. It ha doesn't have a JIT. Uh, it's not uh, running your C-sharp code as raw WebAssembly. It's actually interpreting your, your .NET IL on the fly. Uh, in the future, we plan to uh, address that runtime performance concern for Blazor WebAssembly using what we call ahead of time compilation, where we can take your .NET code and compile it directly to, to WebAssembly to speed up your app's hot paths. Uh, ahead of time compilation is not slated to land for the May release, but it is something that we're looking at in the .NET 5 timeframe. Cool. 
Um, cool, we have time for more questions here. So here's a good one about testing. So how do we test Blazor and do stuff like component tests or integration tests that are possible in, say, React? I think we have a testing session later we in the day. We have a whole yeah. talk okay. on this today. So great question. Yeah, definitely check out uh, Eagle's talk uh, later today. I don't remember the exact time, okay. but you can find it on the agenda. Um, Steve Sanderson has put out um, uh, an experimental project that he put together that has a test framework for doing unit testing of your Blazor components. You can also do end-to-end -end style testing using uh, components like Selenium. Uh, Eagle has his own testing framework as well where you can like uh, write your tests using Razor syntax. He's got a whole bunch of stuff that uh, you'll definitely want to check out if you want to learn about uh, all things testing related in Blazor. Yeah, uh, God, there's so many questions coming in. I actually <laughs> lost my place. So there was like a couple in here. I was like, guys, hold on. Because <laughs> like, um, we actually have a few more minutes still. Uh, let's see, how about this one? I just random pick. Can you talk about how Blazor Client will work with Azure AD B2C using JWT for auth? Are there good examples today, or will this be more ba baked in May? So in May, we will implement support for all of the different standard authentication options that we use in ASP.NET Core. So that includes using authentication with ASP.NET Core identity, um, using authentication with uh, Azure AD with like organizational accounts, uh, using Azure AD B2C, and also using Windows authentication. Uh, the plan initially, I, be I believe, is to use a cookie-based approach. So we will do the handle the authentication dance with Azure AD B2C on the server and then establish an authentication uh, cookie. But fundamentally, the authentication flows for Blazor apps are no different than what you would do with any SPA-style application or ASP.NET Core application. Um, the only difference between these two apps is that in one case you've decided to write JavaScript, and in the other case your code is is you know executing .NET IL and C Sharp. But the protocol flows for authentication uh, remain exactly the same. Cool, that's awesome. All right. Um, Actually, I, on that one, just uh, yeah. I think um, Javier has a talk later today on JavaScript interop. That's right, he does. And in his JavaScript interop, I know one of his demos is he uh, is taking the uh, JavaScript uh, authentication logic in the ASP.NET Core React template that we use for doing authentication with Identity Server and showing how you can use that in a, a Blazor application. So if you're curious about Blazor, JavaScript interop, and also authentication, that would be a good talk to, to check out. Absolutely. Um, OK, I actually thought that this one was uh, pretty good right here. Um, because we've been talking about the benefits of Blazor, just C Sharp, that's the benefits, right? Uh, but what other benefits would you say there is for using Blazor over other popular frameworks like React or Angular, excluding that C Sharp developers are happy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you, know, you can't say that enough, though. Like, the whole, like one of the great <laughs> value props of Blazor is that you can now do full stack web development with .NET. You're not right. having to bridge these two different worlds having code duplication, you know, write code validation logic once in, in .NET and then again in, in JavaScript. So like, like JavaScript developers have had with Node.js, basically, yeah, right? Yeah, if you're yeah. a JavaScript developer today, you're probably pretty happy because you have a full stack uh, right. solution. Um, but I think there's also a bunch of just general benefits with using .NET that I think uh, anyone will find compelling, whether you use .NET today or not. Uh, Blazor has a really great tooling in Visual Studio, Visual Studio for Mac, uh, VS Code, so you get great IntelliSense. It's super easy to get started with. You just file a new project and you're already up and running. Uh, it's built on the you know, maturity of the .NET platform. You have a stable build uh, pipeline. Uh, you've got Visual Studio for tooling. You have .NET standard as a stable API surface area. Uh, it's got a great support policy. So you know, you're really taking advantage of the entire .NET ecosystem when you decide to bet on, on Blazor for, building your, uh, for handling your front-end web UI needs. And you know my favorite, you can take your skills and then you can build anything else with .NET, That's right? True. Just like going to your, back to your first slide. So thank you so much, Dan. That was a great introduction to the rest of the day. Um, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we want to take it on now to the next session, which is uh, Blazor Futures with Steve Sanderson. I'm going to toss it over to Javier, who's got Steve on the phone. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, yes, we got Steve Sanderson on the phone over here. Uh, you can see him behind me. Hey, Steve. How's it going? Uh, Hello, so, yeah, we're going to get started here. Um, let me, um, how's it going, Steve? Uh, you ready for your talk? I am ready for my talk, yes. Am Perfect. I on? Okay. I, I can't right, hear him. Great. Uh, well, let's um, kick this he's off. Up, you're all set um, to go. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Take it away. All right, great. So let's start this. So from what I understand, I have to click on some buttons to make you able to sh see my screen. 
Um, so I'm doing that right now. And then hopefully you can see my screen. And if you can't, then somebody better do something to interrupt me. So let's start this session. Uh, thank you for choosing to come to this. I'm really glad that you are choosing to spend a bit of your time uh, on this session. Um, so my name is Steve and I work at Microsoft on the ASP.NET Core team. And my focus is on Blazor. Uh, I've been doing this for two and a half years now, so quite a while. And in this talk, I'm quite excited to show you some of the things that we're thinking of doing next or pretty soon or maybe a little bit further off in the future. Now, this talk is going to be a little bit more aimed at uh, more advanced scenarios than the one that Dan just did. So if you are new to Blazor, there may be aspects of this that are not familiar to you. Uh, but don't worry, I will do my best to give you some of the um, uh, background as we go. Uh, but if there are parts you don't get, well, never mind. Uh, there are lots of other talks that will give you um, more of introductory stuff as we go. So what I want to do with this talk is start with an existing Blazor application, uh, an application that we've had around for a little while. And I'll show you how we could add some cool new features to it using things that we've not actually shipped yet but are thinking about doing. Okay. Now, the application that we're going to be using in this talk is a sample application called Flight Finder. And some of you may well have seen this before. It's been around for quite a while now, from pretty much the beginning of the whole Blazor project. And if I start that up, then hopefully you will be able to pick up on what it is pretty quickly. So it's an example of a site that people could use to search for and book flights. And it's built as a pretty standard Blazor WebAssembly application. So our user could come along and they could say something like, OK, I'll use this autocomplete thing. And I want to go from Tokyo's Haneda Airport. And let's say I want to go to Paris, Charles de Gaulle. And I would like to fly there uh, this coming Monday. And I would like to come back the following Friday. And since this is entirely fictional, I might as well, in my imagination, go first class. And I'll hit the search button, and that will go off to the server, and it will get uh, a set of flight data results back from the server and display them. Now, this is not real data from an actual flight database. This is just random data that the server comes back with. Uh, but that's not really the point of this talk. You could implement that sort of logic on the server if you wanted. Uh, we can also change the sort order between the cheapest or the quickest, depending on which we prefer. And when the user has found some flights that they like, they can click on this Add button and add them to their shortlist and maybe compare this uh, relatively cheap flight versus this much more expensive one. OK, so that's what the UI looks like. Now let's have a little bit of a look at some of the code behind there. So in the solution, you'll see that we've got four projects. And I'm only actually going to talk about three of them right now. Uh, we'll start with this flightfinder.client. That is a normal Blazor WebAssembly application. So this application is composed of various Blazor components, each of which is one of these Razor files. You saw a lot of those in Dan's talk just a minute ago. And we've also got bits of c -sharp source code that implement various other things. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that is compiled to normal .NET assemblies. And then it's sent down to the browser, and it executes on WebAssembly inside the browser uh, using the mono WebAssembly runtime. And we've also got these other projects. We've got flightfinder.server. And that's the server-side component of our application, which has got some MVC controllers in it. And they are responsible for serving data back to the client in JSON format whenever the client asks for flight results and things like that. And then finally, at the bottom, we've got this shared project, flightfinder.shared. And in that project, we can put any code that we want to share between the client and the server. It's a normal class library that both of those other projects can reference. And so we've got various domain types in there. For example, airport. And we're defining that an airport is something that has a code and a display name. Uh, we've also got, for example, search criteria. And that's got all these properties, where you're going from and to, and what dates you're traveling, and what your ticket class is, and things like that. OK? Uh, now, let's have a look at how the Flight Finder itself, the client, is built. Well, the best place to start with that is this component main.razor. That's the top level root component for the application. And that um, imports our other components, such as search component that's up there at the top. And below that, we've got search results. And over on the right, we've got this shortlist component uh, where the user's selections show up. And then the other interesting thing is we've got this AppState concept. And in this application, AppState is a regular C-sharp class. 
that's implemented over here. And this contains a lot of the actual state management within the application. So we've got what are the search results we're displaying? Is there a search in progress and things like that? And it's also responsible for making requests to the server. So when you do a search, it's going to use HTTP client to post a JSON request to the server, sending your search criteria and get back an array of itineraries. So that's all very well. But this form of JSON-based data access has got some drawbacks. Let's think about those. So let's see what happens in our browser when we hit the search button. Well, what we see is that we make a request to the server, and it goes on this particular URL, API slash flight search, and we hard-coded that into our application here. It's also a post request, which we've also hard-coded in, uh, which is all very well. But how do we know that that's really right? How do we know what the right URLs for things are? There's nothing to to check at compile time that we've actually got correct URLs. Another drawback to this form of data access is that the data that we're sending is very verbose because it's all in JSON format. So here you can see the payload that we're sending to the server, uh, this very verbose text-based JSON data. And the response that's coming back is also uh, JSON data, which is not very efficient on the wire. So considering these two drawbacks, the fact that we have to hard code lots of assumptions about URLs and things, and that it's not very efficient on the wire, you might think, well, could there be a more efficient, more modern alternative to sending JSON over these unstructured URLs? And the answer to that is yes, there's lots of other alternatives to that. And one of them that's been gaining a lot of traction recently is gRPC. gRPC is Google's remote procedure call mechanism. And for the purposes of the application we're building, we can think of it as being just an alternative to sending JSON over HTTP. And the ASP.NET team did quite a lot of work during the 3.0 release to add very, very good support for gRPC on the server. So we can use that with server-side ASP.NET Core. Uh, one of the advantages is that it's designed for poor performance. So unlike JSON, it sends compact binary data over the wire. So your uh, amount of bandwidth use will be much less. And also, it's designed to be language agnostic. So when you design a gRPC service, you define a language agnostic proto file. And that then can be compiled or generated into strongly typed server and client classes that are used from different languages. And that guarantees that the server and client are in sync and you don't have to have things like URLs. Now, the other really great feature of gRPC is that it's not REST. So you don't have to have arguments with your coworkers all the time about what the right HTTP method is for something and what different HTTP status codes are supposed to represent. Because none of those concepts exist, it's just a much simpler, more low-level RPC mechanism. Now, traditionally, it's not been possible to use gRPC from browser-based applications because it relies on HTTP2, and JavaScript doesn't expose any APIs for HTTP2 features. But that is changing because gRPC Web is an extension to gRPC that makes it possible to run it on normal HTTP 1.1 connections, so you can do it from browsers. And James Newton King from the ASP.NET team has been hard at work creating a set of prototype packages that add gRPC Web support to ASP.NET Core on the server, and they also work with Blazor WebAssembly on the client. So let's have a go now at changing Flight Finder so that instead of JSON, it's working with gRPC data. Okay, so let's go back to our source code and have a look at this Flight Finder shared project. And you'll notice that all these different domain classes have been written by hand, okay? And it's gonna be a little bit different when I switch over to a gRPC-based solution. Now, I don't have time to show you all the steps involving switching to gRPC. I'm just going to show you the result of doing so. So I'm going to switch over using my Git client um, to check out uh, a gRPC version of my application. So what's changed then? Well, now you'll see that inside my shared project, I've got this file flightdata.proto. And if I open that, you'll see this is the language independent definition of the gRPC service. I've got this service flight data and I've defined a couple of endpoints on it, airports and search. And these define what data the client will send and what the response type from the server will be. So in the case of getting airports, we don't send any data. We send an empty request from the client to the server and it replies with an airports reply. So what is an airports reply? Well, that's defined here. And you can see that it contains a repeated collection of airports and each airport is something that has a code and a display name. Similarly, 
The search takes a search criteria and it returns a search reply. And those things are defined down here. So you can see search criteria has got all these uh, properties on it that you would expect and search reply has got our itineraries and they're all defined. So there's quite a lot of stuff going on inside our proto file. And the cool thing about this is that the tooling in ASP.NET Core will generate .NET classes for us from this. So I don't actually have to write an airport class. That's just going to be generated for me. Uh, same with all these other types of things like search criteria and itinerary and so on. Now, you might think a drawback to generating this code is you can't really customize it, but you can because if you want to add some extra properties to these generated classes, you can easily do so because they're partial classes. For example, on this itinerary class here, you'll see that I've added an extra partial class for itinerary in which I've been able to define some extra properties. For example, I've defined total duration hours, which is computed by adding these other two duration hours together. OK, so now I've got that. I can use this to expose a gRPC service from my server instead of needing MVC controllers. And that's what I've done here. And I'm not going to really get into how that works because that's just standard server side gRPC. And you can read docs about that. The more interesting things for us right now is what does it like to cons what does it look like to consume that? in a WebAssembly Blazor application. Well, the way you would do it is since you've also got a reference to this shared project, you've automatically got access to all the classes that have been defined, uh, that have been generated from the proto file. So we now just have to access them. And the way I'm doing it is defining a dependency injection service. So here, if you know about Blazor, you'll know we generally on the client have a startup CS class in which we can configure any services that are available in the application. And here, uh, this block of code, which I know you won't necessarily understand all of, the important point is that it defines a flight data client. And I don't have to write any code for flight data client. That's generated automatically from the proto file. The only thing I have to specify is what's the URL of the backend server that it should connect to. And what I've done here is I'm using this navigation manager service to say that the URL is just whatever URL the browser is currently on because I'm hosting my UI on the same server that I'm hosting the gRPC web backend. So that's what this complicated looking code actually does. OK, and now inside my app state, when it comes time to request some search results from the server, I'm not using HTTP client anymore. I'm now using this flight data client service, which has been code generated and injected through DI. And I can just call a strongly typed method on there, like search async, pass some criteria to it, and get back itineraries. And I don't have to specify a URL or an HTTP method or anything like that. It's all just sorted out for me. So let's try that now. I'm going to run that in a browser again, and we'll see if we can really consume gRPC services from a Blazor WebAssembly client. OK, so what happens now on the wire when I click on search? Well, first thing to note is that hopefully we did actually get some results back from the server. We did. And then if we look inside the browser's network tools, you will see that what we did now is we made a request to a URL that is determined by gRPC. We don't have to decide it ourselves. And the data that's been sent is not JSON anymore. It's now this compact binary data that we can't really even read. Uh, there is actually a text-based format for it if you want, but it's more efficient to use the binary format. And the response that comes back is also binary data which is efficient on the wire. And we didn't have to say anything about URLs, so we can be certain that the client and the server are always talking the same language. OK, now to give you a little bit more of a sense of how this works out, let's have a go at adding an extra gRPC endpoint and calling it. So let's say that I want to keep track of what things people put in their shortlist. So when I click this Add button, I want to tell the server that the user has added something to their shortlist. I want a way of tracking it on the server. So to do that, I'm going to add an extra gRPC endpoint that the client can send a message to. So I'll go to my proto file, and I'll go to the list of services, and I'm going to add a new one here called add shortlist item. And it will take an itinerary, and it doesn't return anything uh, because we're just sending data to the server there. And now on the server, I can go to my flight service, and you see it inherits this flights database base class which is gener automatically code generated for us. And so now I can try to override this code generated method called add shortlist item. And I can put in whatever server side implementation I want. 
And in this case, since it's just a demo, all I'm going to do is log the fact that this method was called to the console. So we can see that the server really got that message. Okay. Now, the last thing to do is to actually call it from the client. That's very easy. I can go to my app state class here, and this is the method that gets called when the user adds stuff to the shortlist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to be an async method because all client server communication is async. And then I'm going to say await flight data client dot add shortlist item async. And you can see that that's automatically shown up in IntelliSense because of the code generation. And it takes an itinerary, so we'll pass the one that's being added. And that's it. We're done. Okay, let's try that out, shall we? See if we can really call this new method from the client. So that comes up. And I want to show you what comes up in the web server's console output because that's where we're logging this. So now, back in the browser, when I click on the search button, you will see in the background immediately, uh, well, when I click the search button, the results appear below. But when I click the add button for this $1,100 flight, then immediately in the console output, you'll see the server receive this message, adding to shortlist the $1,100 item. So it was absolutely trivial to call this method on the server from the client with this very efficient binary data on the wire. And that's the cool thing about using gRPC. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I want to move on to another interesting future feature that we're thinking about. And this one is to do with testing. So when you're testing Blazor components, as it stands today, you've basically got two choices of how to do it. And this is true pretty much for all web-based UI when you want to test it. You could either write unit tests with something like XUnit or NUnit, and that allows you to write tests that operate at the level of .NET objects. So that can be very fast and very robust, but it's not talking about the rendered HTML. It's just talking about the actual code representation, the actual .NET code. The other approach that you could use is a browser automation approach. And that would use something like Selenium to start up an actual browser instance and then automate the act action of clicking on buttons and making assertions about what gets rendered into the UI. Now, that's nice because it's very high level and lets you talk about the actual HTML elements and click on them and things. But it can be slow because it's automating a real browser. And it might not be so reliable because unless you're very careful, you end up making assumptions about the ex exact timings of renderings and things like that. So that made us think, well, is there some way that we could offer the best of both worlds when you're testing Blazor components? Could we somehow give you the speed and robustness of pure unit tests by not using any actual browser and letting you still work with the underlying .NET objects and mocking out DI services and things, but combined with the benefits of browser automation so that you can make assertions in terms of the rendered UI the HTML elements with CSS selectors and so on, and do simple things like clicking on buttons and making assertions about what happens. So that's something that we've been working on producing a little proof of concept for. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of how we can do that for our Flight Finder application right now. So what should we write a test about? Well, with, with this test prototype, we can write tests either about individual components or about the whole application. And I'm going to start by writing a test about an individual component. And the one I'm going to write a test about is this shortlist component over here. And you can see that it starts out empty, saying zero items. And then we add stuff in, and they show up both in the title and with this complicated markup down below. So let's write some tests to make sure that this is behaving correctly. And that's why I've got this project flightfinder.client.test. And I'm going to add a new test class into that. And I'm going to call it shortlist tests.cs and I'm going to just paste in a little bit of code that I've already prepared. Uh, so what it's going to look like is this and I'm using X unit. So that's what this fact attribute is about. And I want to assert that initially it's empty by default. So what would that even mean? Well, let's have a look at the source code for our shortlist component. You can see that what it does is it receives a parameter from its parent, which is the list of itineraries that it should display. That's the things in the user's shortlist. And at the top, it's got an H2 element that displays the count of that collection. And then below that, it's got a for each loop that loops over all the itineraries. And for each one, it creates one of these unordered list elements. And it's got a massive block of markup inside that. OK, so let's write an assertion that is initially empty. Well, first, how do we get an instance of our shortlist component that we can render? Well, using this test framework, 
we can create something called a test host. And then using test host, we can say, please create an instance of the shortlist component. Again, strongly typed. And simply by doing that, we can then make some assertions about what UI it's rendering. So we can say there should be an H2 element and the text on it will say shortlist zero. And if we look for some unordered list elements, well, that set will be empty. There's nothing in it because we haven't got any shortlists to render uh, just yet. So let's try running that, shall we? Uh, if I go over to the test explorer in Visual Studio, then when it updates after recompiling, then we'll see that we've got one test in there right now. And if I hit the run button, it's going to compile stuff and we'll see that initially everything goes green. Can display empty test has passed. So that's great. OK, now let's add a test uh, to do something slightly more interesting. In fact, let's do a little bit of sort of test driven development in a sense, uh, because there's an aspect of the behavior here that I'm not very happy with. I'm not very happy with the way these prices are being displayed. I think it's pretty ugly that as well as showing the dollar amount, we're also showing the cents. That's pretty strange. No one really cares that there's 15 cents there. Um, I would like it to round these numbers to the nearest whole dollar. And I want to design that using tests. So how can we test that? Well, we'll start by making a test method, rounds prices to nearest unit. And I'm going to create an instance of the shortlist component. But this time, instead of being empty, I'm going to pass a parameter to it to say that I want it to have these two itineraries in there, one for fake airways, one for test airways, and they've got different prices. And then I can write some assertions about the rendered UI. First, we'll assert that the shortlist should have two items in it this time, because that's what we've passed. And then we'll write assertions about how they're rendered. We'll say the one for fake airways should say $123, because we're rounding down $123.45. And then the one for test airways, which is 456.78, that should be rounded up to 457. OK, now we can run our test and we'll see if it actually passes. And we know it shouldn't pass because we haven't actually implemented this rounding behavior just yet. So if we run it, you'll see the test initially fails. And if we ask, why has that test failed? Well, let's see what the assertion was that failed. It's kind of hard to see with the screen resolution, but you will see that we expected it to display 123, but it actually displayed 123.45. OK, so we know how to fix that, right? We'll go to our shortlist component and we'll find where the price is rendered. And it's rendered right here. We've hard coded a dollar symbol and then we've just got the price. So that's not a great way of writing this code because in .NET, there is a proper way of formatting currency values like this. We can say price dot two string and then we'll give the format string C. And that means render it as a currency value. And I'm going to put zero, which means zero decimal places. And then simply by doing that, I can run this test again and we'll see if it changes from failing to passing now. It has to recompile everything and hopefully it will run. And this time, instead of failing, you'll see it's now passed. So we've got our test actually proven to work. And if you want to, we can even run it in a browser. And so now when I add stuff to the shortlist, you'll see it's rounded to the nearest whole dollar. OK, so that's better. Right. Now, I said that we can write tests not just for individual components, but if we want, for the entire application. And we can do that pretty easily because the application itself is just a component. You remember that we've got this main component at the top level, which has got everything in it. So I can write a test for main. And then I can test things like how data flows between one component and another. So what I want to write a test for now is something to do with the user experience around searching. There's a bit of a problem with the UX at the moment, which is that when I click this button, there's no indication that we're waiting for data to come back from the server. Just nothing happens until the data comes back. And that's not great because the user doesn't know whether the data we're showing here is stale data or whether it's actually the up-to-date data for their new search. So the way I want to fix this in the UX is that I want this whole bottom left portion of the screen to be grayed out while we're waiting for search results to come back. So you click search, it gets grayed out, and then the data comes, and then it becomes not grayed out anymore. It's a fairly complex interaction, so I want to specify it using a test. So I'm going to create a new test class here, and I'm going to call it search flow tests. Okay. 
and it's going to be about stuff to do with searching. And again, I'm going to drop in a little bit of code that I've already prepared. And there's a little bit more code this time. So let's see what's going on here. So like before, we're using test host. Um, but unlike before, I'm creating a test version of the flight data client. And that allows us to intercept any requests that the component tries to make to the backend server so that we can mock that out and return fake data to simulate different conditions. And then down here, I'm adding all these services to the test dependency injection container so that the component will actually use them. And then finally, I'm ready to write a test. OK, so I want to test that we gray out the search results while we're loading. And to do that, I'm going to create an instance of the main component. And then I'm going to define what it means to be grayed out. So I'm going to say that things are grayed out if the results area has got this CSS class gray out on it. And then I can write an assertion with that. I'll say that by default, initially, we are not grayed out. Grayed out is false. And we expect that test to pass because we're not graying anything out just yet. So if we have a look now, we've got our search flow tests, and I can run that. And what we should see is that that test goes green, it's passed. OK, now let's go a step further. Let's say that now, when we're searching, we should be grayed out. So we'll find the submit button for a search, and we'll click it. And at that point, is grayed out should become true. And then even more clever still, we'll say, we'll simulate the flight data client sending back a response from the server. And at that point, we should not be grayed out anymore. OK, so that's the entire flow of interaction. And I'm going to run the test again. And hopefully this time, it's going to fail. OK, and it does fail. And we see the assertion that failed is this one on this line. It didn't become grayed out. And that's not surprising because we didn't implement that yet. How can we implement it? Well, it's pretty easy. I'm going to go to my main component here. And then on this results area component uh, element, I'm going to add a conditional CSS class. And what it's going to look like is this. I'm going to say, if the search is in progress, then we'll have the gray out class. And if not, we won't. And that's all there is to it. So now when I run again, hopefully that test that was failing before should now go green. And we'll know that we've implemented this behavior correctly. So wonderful. And if you want to see that for real in the browser, I can come back and you'll see that now, whenever I click search, that bottom portion becomes grayed out. At least I hope that's coming through on the stream for you. All right. So that's about testing. Right. Let's move on to the last major area that I'm going to be talking to you about. So far, we've been running all these applications inside browsers. Dan gave you an example of a Blazor server application that runs in a browser. And I've been giving you an example of a Blazor WebAssembly application that also runs in a browser. But what if you didn't want to run in a browser? What if you wanted to make an installable desktop application so that the user can have it on their start menu, their app home screen, or whatever, and they can perhaps integrate with the operating system? Well, traditionally, there have been two ways to do that. You could make a progressive web application, or a PWA. And that's great because it's very lightweight. It installs from the browser instantly, uh, and it's immediately available on the user's device. But it's not so great because it's still running inside the browser sandbox. So it doesn't really have any native access to the underlying operating system. You can't put native code in it. And if you do want native code, you would traditionally use something like Electron which does give you the ability to integrate with the operating system in whatever UA you want. But traditionally, Electron apps have been quite heavy to download and run. And that's mainly because they bundle their own complete browser instance. So again, that had us thinking, is there some way we could create the best of both? Could we make something that's lightweight to download and run, but also allows you to write native code? So it isn't subject to the browser sandbox, it isn't running on WebAssembly, it's running native code. And that brings us to this experiment called Web Window. OK, let me show you how we can use it. Let's say we want to create a native desktop version of our Flight Finder application. And I'm going to do that by adding a new project. And I'm going to choose a C Sharp console application. And you might think it's a bit strange that I'm making a console application, uh, but just bear with me for a minute. And I'm going to call it flightfinder.desktop. OK. And when that is created, it will be a normal console application. And you know what these things look like, right? It's going to display Hello World. So if I run it, then I'm just going to get this black screen that says Hello World. All right, so that's all very well. But I don't want to create a text-based application. I want to create a proper graphical application. And for that, I'm going to use this web window package. So first, I have to add a reference to it. And that's going to look a little bit like the following. 
here we go. Here's a reference to the web window package. You can see it's a preview or purely experimental package. And once I've got that, I can use it. So I'm going to say var window equals new web window. OK, need a namespace. And I'll give a name to my window or a title. I'll call it my cool app. And then what can I do with that? Well, the simplest thing I can do is navigate to string. And I can give some HTML markup. So I'm going to say, hey there. This is nice. All right. And then I'm simply going to wait for the user to exit the application. So all being well, when I start up my console application now, you will see that it brings up an actual graphical window. And it's going to use browser rendering technology to render this. So unlike an Electron-based application, this is not bundling its own browser. This is using whatever browser technology is present on the operating system that I'm running. And it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's very lightweight, and it still gives us the ability to do browser-based applications that are still installable. Okay. Now, I don't actually want to hard code some HTML. What I want to do is host my entire Flight Finder client application inside here. And that involves about five steps, and I won't have time to show all of them to you right now. So what I'm going to do, again, is I'm going to switch to a different version of my repo here that's got the hosted Blazor application inside Flight Finder Desktop. Okay, so what's different? Well, what's different now is that I'm referencing webwindow.blazor, which is a version of the webwindow uh, experimental, experimental package that knows how to host Blazor applications. I'm also referencing my Flight Finder client project because that contains all the components I want to run. And finally, I've got all this MS build goop down at the bottom, and that knows how to copy all the necessary static assets for CSS and fonts and things into the desktop publish output so that when it's published, it produces a self-contained runnable application. OK, so if I run that, let's see what happens now. When I run it, what should come up is a Flight Finder titled window. And inside there, we've got the actual application. And it works. I can run it, and I can get my data back from the server, and I can add stuff to the shortlist, things like that. Now, you might be wondering, did I have to change a lot of stuff to make it run inside Web Window? The answer is no. I didn't have to change anything apart from one little thing. The one little thing that I had to change, and I'll show you, is uh, on the startup class, uh, I had to change the URL that we're talking to the uh, back end on. So normally, we would get it from the browser. But when we're, when we're running in desktop, we don't have any particular browser. So I'm getting it from a config file here. So I've got this config file, appsettings.json. OK, so that's the only change I had to make. OK, now, since .NET Core itself is cross-platform, and Blazor is cross-platform, or Web Window is cross-platform, that suggests that we should be able to run this application on other operating systems as well. And so I'm going to show you that. Over here, I've got a Mac. And I've cloned the same repo onto the Mac. I didn't have to change it in any way. And because all this stuff is cross-platform, I can say .NET run. And that's going to compile the same application. And when it runs, it's going to show up on the Mac as a native looking application. And it works. Well, it kind of works. There's one thing about it that's a bit weird. Uh, when I go to the Alt tab window, you'll see I've got this really ugly console application icon. And that's because the operating system still thinks that this is a console application. But I want to make a true self-contained Mac app bundle that could be distributed to other machines and installed and have a proper icon and such like. And it's quite easy to do that. And I've made a little script that does it. And you'll be able to see this when I publish this repo. Um, that's going to publish a self-contained version of the application. And it converts it into a Mac app bundle with an icon and puts it on the desktop. So you could make this downloadable. You can copy it into your applications folder and such like. And you can simply double click on it. And it shows up. And we see we've now got the application coming up. And we've got a proper icon for it. And it's really, as far as the user is concerned, exactly like a regular Mac native application with the same code that also runs inside the browser on WebAssembly. So that's all I'm going to have time to show you. One last little thing that I'm going to go through in the next couple of minutes is a very quick update about Blazor WebAssembly application sizes. And I'm bringing this up because a bunch of people have been asking questions about this lately. And I want to give you a sense of where we're going. So when you create a Blazor WebAssembly application today and publish it, the downloadable application size is just over 2 megabytes. It's 2.05 megabytes. And that is 
some of that is the fixed mono WebAssembly runtime that's common to all apps, and some of it is your own application code and your own .NET uh, assembly dependencies. Okay, so we've done a lot of work to bring it down to just about two megabytes. Uh, it's kind of impressive that we've got a whole .NET runtime there, uh, but it's still pretty big, and we want to find ways of making it smaller. And we've done some work in the current milestone uh, that is going to bring it down a little bit. Uh, when you first see this uh, chart there, you probably think, whoopie doo that's not a very big improvement, is it? You've reduced it from 2.05 megs to 1.9 megs. Well done. Um, but it's slightly better than it looks. Uh, what we've done in this current release is we've enabled the linker to strip code out of the Blazor framework assemblies. Uh, as well as the underlying .NET base class library. And the benefit that we're going to see from this is that as we add more and more features to Blazor in the future, it won't make applications bigger. We can add as many features as we want, and as long as you're not using those features, you won't pay any cost for them. Okay. Now, going forwards, we've got a goal of making it a bit better still. And our target for our initial May release of Blazor WebAssembly is to get down to under 1.5 megabytes by default. And we've got a way that we think we can do it. And the approach that we're planning to use is introducing some more aggressive pre-compilation. This will happen during the publish phase of the application, so you won't see it during development. But when you publish, we'll spend about 20 or 30 seconds uh, doing some very aggressive compilation um, compression on the artifacts that are produced. And we believe, or our proof of concept shows that that gets down to just under 1.5 megabytes. And there's no real drawback to doing this. Uh, it doesn't make things take any longer when people run it in their browsers. It just makes it less weight on the wire. So this is strictly a good thing. It doesn't cause you to lose any features or anything. So uh, hopefully, that is something that we'll be able to include in the May release, and that improves things. And I'll just remind you that these numbers only refer to the first time a user goes to your site. Everything is cached, so when someone comes back for the second and third time, they uh, are not really paying the cost to download any of this stuff because it's all cached already. These numbers are just for the first ever visit from a given user. Okay, so that is all I'm going to have time to show you. Uh, in summary, we took an existing Blazor application, Flight Finder, and we improved the way it did data access by changing over to gRPC. We then added some tests using the prototype testing framework uh, that showed you how we can uh, get the sort of benefits of browser automation combined with the benefits of pure unit tests. And then finally, we turned the whole thing into an installable desktop application in just a few minutes, and we showed that that could run cross-platform. So. I hope that has been of some use to you, and I hope that some of that has been exciting. Uh, I'll encourage you to stick around for some of the other great talks that happen later in this conference. And for now, I think I will see if there are any questions that I'm able to answer. So how do I do that? Hey, Steve, thank you so much for your presentation. We actually do have a uh, time for two questions. Uh, yeah. Let's see, uh, can we put them up on the board here? So we can look at them. Okay, question number one is, hey, Steve Sanderson, I tried yeah. web window uh, today, but was not able to ex use external Razor class library in it. Can you please share the Flight Fender desktop code? We'd like to see more code on it. Yes, I will definitely share the repo that I've been doing all the demos from today. Perfect. And one of the things to mention along with that is we're going to gather all the repos from the speakers and we're going to put them out on GitHub so people can, can look at them after the conference as well. So we, we'll start doing that uh, with these sessions. Uh, we have another Very question good. here. Um, Will Blazor native UI be able to access the computer's hardware? I'm thinking of IoT apps that will need to read and write to a serial port. OK, so with the web window demo that I just showed, that was not running on WebAssembly. That was running native .NET Core code, okay. which can directly access any API from the underlying operating system. So yes, you can absolutely uh, access whatever you want there. Uh, there's a different approach to writing nat native Blazor applications, and that is the mobile bindings for Blazor that is going to be shown by Elon in one of the talks later today. That's a whole different technology stack, but that also gives you a way of uh, executing Blazor applications on the bare metal of the operating system. Uh, that one's more focused around mobile, uh, but that also can do what you're asking there. So yes, there are certainly ways to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, everybody, I'd like to thank Steve for taking the time. Uh, he couldn't make it into campus today, so that's why we had to do a Skype call. So thank you so much, Steve, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. Uh, we have uh, Chris Sainty coming up after a quick little break here as we get him called up, and we'll be right back with more .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. Thank you.
Welcome back to the .NET Core with IoT series. In this video, we're going to walk through the Blinky sample code and understand what's going on. So I have the Blinky sample from the GitHub repo open over here in Visual Studio Code. At the top, you can see it has a using statements for the GPIO library that we will be using to control the LED pin. In the main part of the program, we've created a variable for pin number 17, which as per the breadboard connections is what the LED is connected to. The next two values are how many milliseconds we want the LED to be on and off. This creates the blinking effect. The next important line is line number 20, where we create an instance of the GPIO controller. This is what enables us to interact with the pin. So we open pin number 17 and we make it ready for output mode. This means that we will be sending current to that pin to then trigger the LED connected in the circuit. Next, we have this line, this section over here, which basically sets up the command prompt to listen for control C to end this loop. Until then, this is going to continue. Within a while loop, which is constantly set to true, which means it's going to infinitely keep blinking the LED light, we are basically sending a high and low value for time in milliseconds to turn it off and on. So if we walk through this code, you will notice that first we open the pin 17 and send pin value high, which passes voltage to the LED to turn it on. And we pause the program for light on for one millisecond. Then we send pin value low, which reduces the amount of current and closes the circuit, and then leave the program to sleep for 200 milliseconds. When this thing runs in loop, it creates an effect of off and on and therefore blinking the LED. That was a quick and simple walkthrough of the LED blinky code. Join us in the next video, where we will do an advanced sample of using a temperature sensor on a Raspberry Pi. All right, everybody, we are back with .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. We have Chris Sainty on the phone call. Chris, pleasure to meet you again. Uh, yeah, how are we? <laughs> We're doing great. Uh, so you're here to talk to us about routing A through Z. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Perfect. All right, take it away. We're anxious to hear uh, your content. Cool. Let's get going uh, with some screen sharing. So let me do that and let's get PowerPoint going. Cool. So uh, first of all, let me just say hello and hope. Oh, <laughs> yeah, nearly forgot. There we go. Cool. So um, yeah, I hope everyone's really enjoying uh, .NET Comp Focus on Blazor so far. Let me just introduce myself. My name is Chris Sainty, and I'm a lead software engineer, and I'm also a Microsoft MVP. And today we're going to be talking all about routing A to Z in Blazor. So I've divided the session up into kind of two halves. The first half, we're going to be in PowerPoint. We're going to look at uh, all the various parts of uh, routing in Blazor, and then we're going to move over to Visual Studio for the second half and go through some code demos. So we'll crack on because uh, we've got a lot to get through. So um, let's start off by looking at some real fundamentals. What's the difference um, between traditional web apps and Blazor apps in terms of routing and navigation? So we're going to load a traditional web app. We're going to type an address into in a browser. We're going to go off to a server. The server is going to return us the initial page for that application, and then our uh, a browser is going to render that page for us. Once we've got the application running, we can then click on links within the application. And every time we do this, again, we go off to the server, we get the uh, page back from the server that we've uh, that the link points to, and then our, our browser renders that page for us. So that's quite straightforward. Now, the, the key thing to take away here is that no matter whether we're using uh, HTML pages or whether we're using frameworks like MVC or Razor pages, which create dynamic pages, we're always moving uh, between uh, entire pages. And we're always doing that by going back to the server, downloading a whole page, rendering a whole new page every single time. So how does this differ in Blazor? Well, we load a Blazor app in the same way. We obviously type an address into a browser. We go off to a server and we're going to get an initial initial page back from the server for that application and then our browser renders it so i'm going to show this through with the blazor webassembly app because i think it's a little bit clearer and then we'll look at uh, blazor server as well so we get that index page and we render our application but once we're in the application things become very different when we click on links in blazor applications those uh, navigation events are intercepted by blazor 
and they're funneled through to Blaze's router component. Now, the particular link that we've got here is trying to navigate us to a, a root of item slash two. So Blaze's router is going to use that information and it's going to look at a routing table that it keeps in memory. It's going to try and find a route that matches, which in this instance would be the second one in the list. Now, the squiggly brackets ID is um, something called a root parameter. And um, if you don't uh, if you don't recognize that, don't worry, I'm going to cover those a little bit later. But anyway, take my word for it, that's the route that's going to match. Blazor's router then knows that the item details component is the correct component to handle this route. The route is then going to load the item details component and run it. That's going to generate some UI updates. And then Blazor will apply those UI, update, UI updates and the view will update for us. Now, the eagle eyed among you may have noticed that the URLs changed as well. So there's some magic going on there to give us that impression that we've moved to a new page. But really, we've never left the browser. We've stayed inside of that initial index page that we originally downloaded. And this is where single page applications get their name from. We're operating over a single physical page. So Blaze is dynamically changing the content depending on which route that we're requesting. Now, is there any difference in Blazor, uh, Blazor server apps? Slightly. When we click on links in Blazor server applications, the navigation event is transmitted over SignalR back to Blazor's router that's running on the server. However, from this point forward, everything pretty much continues as it did before. Blazor's router is going to look in the routing table. It's going to find a route match, and then it's going to load the component that handles that route. Again, it will run the component, calculate UI updates. These will then get transmitted back over the SignalR connection. And then again, our browser will, browser will be updated uh, with, ever, with whatever that new page component looks like. So that was a really high level view of routing in Blazor. So let's start diving a little bit deeper now and we'll look at the router component and, and the various uh, things that it has to handle. So if you've not seen it before, this is, the, uh, this is the router component in Blazor and you can find this in the main app component. Now there's three things that we need to provide the router in order for it to work correctly. The first one is this app assembly. And this is where we can tell the router where to go look to find page components. Now, page components are just regular components that have a page directive at the top of them. Blazor's router is going to scan whatever assembly we give it, and it's going to go and find these page components, and it's going to uh, use them to generate this the routing table I was referring to in the earlier slides. The next bit that we need to provide the router is a found template. Now, this is where Blazor is going to load uh, the, the component, the page component, which handles a route once it's found a match in the routing table. The job of actually rendering that component is handled by the root view component, and it knows which uh, component to load uh, via information contained in the root data object, and that's provided by Blazor's router. That will contain the type of the component that needs to be rendered along with any parameters that that component needs. The other job that the root view does for us is it provides us the ability to set a default layout for all pages within the application. So by default, that's the main layout component. Now, if you do have a scenario where you have certain pages that you want to use a different layout, that's cool. Uh, you can specify a layout on a page directly, uh, and that would overwrite any value set here by the default layout parameter. And then the final piece of the jigsaw is the not found template. So uh, this is what Blazor uses when it can't find a root match in its routing table. Uh, the default setup is to use a layout view component. That's a simple component that allows us, again, to specify a layout to use. And then whatever the child content is of that layout view will be displayed within that layout. So by default, it's this P tag with this, sorry, there's nothing in this address message. Now, again, this is all customizable. You can change this. You could change the content of the layout view. Uh, you could remove the layout view entirely, and you could put your own component in there. Uh, it's completely up to you. So I mentioned a second ago, Blazor goes off and scan, uh, Blazor's route scans the assembly we give it to discover page components. But how does it actually discover these page components? How does it, how does it know what they are and identify them? So in order to uh, make a, a regular component into a page component, we use the page directive, which is, uh, you can see it in this uh, uh, top left of the slide here. The second part of the page directive is the uh, root template that this particular component will handle. So this component here would be loaded whenever we went to the items route. But Blazor's router doesn't actually look for these uh, page, uh, page directives um, themselves. It actually looks for something else. So what does it look for? Well, 
all Blazor components are compiled into classes. So this particular component would compile down to a class that looks something like this. And as part of that process, the page directive is uh, transformed into a root attribute. And then, then the root template that we've specified in the page directive is also passed into that root attribute. And it's these root attributes that Blazor, Blazor's router is looking for. So it scans that assembly we give it. It looks for any components that are decorated with this root attribute. And then it goes off and it stores them in something called a root entry. And the root table just contains an array of these root entries. So the root entry is made up of two pieces. It's the template that that component handles, and then the handler, which is the type of the component. There are a couple of other bits on a root entry, but they're really not relevant for us. We won't worry about those too much. But that's the key pieces of information. So the next bit that we're going to talk about intercepting navigation events. How does Blazor's router actually know when we click on links and how does it get the information about the route that we're trying to get to? So we're going to look at an example here. We're going to try and navigate to this item slash two route. So how does this work? Well, when we click on this link, then uh, the link click event is going to get intercepted by Blazor's event delegator. Now, Blazor's event delegator handles all of the eventing uh, in Blazor applications, but it does have a special use case for navigation clicks. So there is a navigation manager which sits in the JavaScript part of Blazor, and that registers a callback with the event delegator specifically uh, for link click events. So when we click the above link, the event delegator is going to intercept that click event, and then it's going to in invoke that callback on the navigation manager. The navigation manager is then going to go off and it's going to do some checks. So the first thing it's going to do is going to check see if interception is enabled. Now, this is enabled by Blazor's router when it boots up, and it's quite an important check because if the router is not there, it has it's failed to boot, whatever, then um, the navigation manager is not going to continue to handle the event because there's nothing further downstream to deal with it. The next check it does is for modifier keys. So this is where we hold down control when we click a link in order to open it in a new tab or a new window. If the users chose to do that, we don't want to we don't want to interfere with that. We want to allow that to open in a new tab or a new window. In a similar vein, there's a check for a target attribute. So a target attribute is a way of specifying programmatically that a link should open in a different location, be that a new window or a new tab. So again, if one of those is present, then the navigation manager is not going to handle the event anymore. There is a slight caveat with that one, though. If the value of the uh, target attribute is underscore self, then the navigation manager will continue to handle it because underscore self effectively means open where you are. And then the final check is to see whether the route that we're requesting is within the scope of the base URI. Now, the base URI, if you're unsure, is set in either the index.html page of a Blazor web application or the underscore host.cshtml in a Blazor server application. Now, usually, this is just set to a forward slash, and it's this tag here. And this effectively means that the application is running as, at, at the root. So if we, were, if we had a Blazor app running at this URL, contusostore.com, uh, we would just have the base tag set to forward slash, which means the, uh, the Blazor app is running at the root. So the root would handle all routing uh, or all navigation uh, events within, within the app. However, if we're hosting a Blazor app as a sub-application of an existing app, so say, for example, we had our Blazor app running uh, at uh, contusostore.com slash Blazor, well, we wouldn't want our router to interfere with any routes that didn't begin with Blazor. So we can set the base tag here to be slash Blazor, and now the route will check that as part of this process. So if the route that we're trying to get to does not start with Blazor, then the router is going to leave the event alone, and it's going to assume we're trying to navigate away from the application. So once all these checks happen, if any of them fail for whatever reason, then the event is allowed to continue as normal. So that will execute in it down its normal path. However, if all of these checks pass and the navigation manager feels it should deal with them, it's going to do two further things. It's going to update the browser history in the address bar. So I touched on this in the earlier slides. This gives us that feeling of navigation, okay? And it means that things like the forward and back buttons on the browser are going to work and things like that. And then the next thing it does is it calls a function called notify location changed. Now, this function essentially just uh, fires a callback over to C Sharp. 
Now, depending on whether we're using Blazor WebAssembly or Blazor Server, this goes two ways. If we're using Blazor Server, this goes back over the Signal R connection and enters C Sharp that way. Uh, and if we're using Blazor WebAssembly, then we use some JavaScript interop to call back over um, and go back into the C Sharp world that way. So once we do this, uh, we're going to hit the Navigation Manager that's in the C-sharp part of Blazor. Now, this is something you may be familiar with if you've done any Blazor development. This is the navigation manager you may have injected into your components to uh, use the URI property or uh, hook onto its location changed event and things like this. And this pretty much is what this uh, location change callback is going to do. It's first gonna up, oh. Oh God, sorry, hold on. Let me just uh, get back to where I was, my... Uh... Application's gone a bit nuts there. Ooh. There we go. Let's get through here. Cool. So there we go. So what's going to happen is the first thing it's going to do is update the URI property on the navigation manager to wherever we're trying to get to. So in this case, it would be item slash two. And then it's going to raise a location changed event on the navigation manager. And this is what the router is listening for. So the router is then going to take the information, it's going to check the URI property on the navigation manager, and it's going to check that against its routing table. If it finds a match, it's then going to hand, uh, load the component that handles that route. So that's how we go from clicking a link to the router actually loading the correct page component. So the final bit I'm going to talk to you about in slides is route matching. So how does the actual route matching process happen? So say we're trying to get to this route, so we're going to go to tech slash cameras. So we know that uh, the Blazor's route is going to look through route entries in order to find a match. And up till now, I've always sort of said the template is this, uh, this full string, this uh, slash text slash cameras. But actually, the route entry object doesn't store them this way. It splits them on the slashes into segments. So this particular route would become uh, tech and cameras, okay, as two separate segments. The router does a similar thing to the route that we're trying to get to. It splits that down into segments as well, so tech and cameras. And then it just does um, some checks to see if everything matches. So the first thing is a second. Oh, dear, oh dear. Sorry, I, I do apologize. Uh, the first thing it does is a segment um, count match. So here we can see we've got two segments in the template on the left, and we've got two in our requested route on the right. So that's a segment match to start off with. Uh, and then the next thing it does is do a segment by segment check. So it, these are just string comparisons because all segments are treated as strings. So tech and tech, that's a match. So that's cool. And then cameras and cameras, that's a match. So in this instance, uh, the router would consider this a match uh, across all segments, and therefore the route matched, and it would now try and load the camera list component to handle that route. Now, the other thing about route matching is where route parameters are involved. So I've touched on those a little bit. Uh, I touched on those a little bit earlier. So here we're trying to navigate to item slash two. So in this instance, uh, the template would look like this, but as we know, it's stored in segments. So that would break down into two segments, items and ID. Oh my good Lord, sorry. Uh, so let me get that. So that would break down in two bits. So again, we do the same thing. We do a segment count match here, and then we do a segment by segment match. So we're doing a string comparison here, which is items and items. So that would match. And then the next thing is this squiggly brackets ID, which is a root parameter. Now here, the router is just going to push whatever is in the second segment of the requested root into that root parameter. So in this instance, this would all match. So again, this would be another, uh, another match, the root would match, and it would load the view item component in order to handle that. I'm going to talk to you a bit more about how roots, uh, root parameters work in the demos, because uh, I think it's a bit clearer there. But I just wanted to touch on this now in the slides. So that is it now in the slides. And I apologize for my computer going a bit nuts doing that. So uh, I'm just going to come out of PowerPoint now and I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio. And we're going to go through some demos. So first of all, I've got a solution here and I've just got a uh, brand new Blazor server application. Um, it could be Blazor WebAssembly. There's, there's nothing uh, specific I'm doing here to one hosting model or the other. And the other thing I've got is a Razor class library. Now, I've set up a project dependency from uh, my Blazor server application uh, to the Razor class library. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is how you can load page components that aren't actually in your Blazor application directly. So 
here's the app component, and this contains Blazor's router. We talked about this earlier. And we can see that we have the app assembly, uh, and we're passing in our Blazor applications assembly as a value there. So how can we uh, load a page component from this Razor class library? Well, the first thing is I'm going to repurpose this component one dot Razor. I'm going to make it into a page component. OK, so I'm going to do that by using the page directive. And we're going to get a root template of RCL. OK, so that's all I need to do to make this a page component. So now I've done that, how can I tell the router where to find it? Well, I can use the additional assemblies uh, parameter on the router. And this just takes an array of assemblies. So I can pass in as many as I want. So let me just quickly type this out. And we can do this the same way as we did above. And I can say razor class library dot component one. And I can say scan that assembly. OK. So that's all, that's all I need to do. Blazor's router is now going to scan the app assembly we've provided along with whatever we've put in this additional assemblies parameter. Now, to make life a little easier, I'm going to open the nav menu uh, component. I'm going to add a link to our new page just so we can uh, navigate to it a bit easier. So I'm going to put the root in here, which is RCL. And I'm just going to update this. Uh, uh, the name for that link there. So um, quickly while I'm here, I'm using the NavLink component uh, to do this. This is a great little helper component that comes out of the, block, out of the box with Blazor. It just generates a normal anchor tag. Um, but what will happen is when we're on the RCL route, it's going to apply an active class to that anchor tag. So this is great. You can then style active links, which is, uh, can be really useful. So we've got all that in there. So I'm just going to save that. Now, if I uh, jump over to the browser and do a refresh. Now you can see I've got this uh, our new link on the side here, this RCL page. And when I click on it, you can see the route has updated in the address bar here. We've moved to the RCL route and we can see we've now got that component loading from the Razor class library. So that is how we can uh, load uh, Ray, uh, Blazor pages from external libraries, which is quite cool. So. The next thing we're going to talk about is root parameters and root constraints. So we talked about those a second ago. So we're going to have a look at them in a bit more detail. So I'm going to repurpose the counter page for this. So if you've not seen the counter page before, it's just a, a simple page where I can click and increment the counter. But what happens if we want to increment the counter from a different starting value instead of zero? How can we do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some modifications. I'm going to add an additional page uh, directive. I'm going to give it a template of counter slash and I put these squiggly brackets in and I say starting count. So this is how we define a root parameter. We use these curly braces and then we give it a name. But how can I access what's in there? How can I use this in my component? Well, I'm going to remove this uh, private field. I'm going to create a parameter on the component. And I'm going to call that starting count. So that matches the same name as I've given my root parameter. And then what's going to happen here is when Blazor's router um, uh, does the match, it's going to pass whatever value is in that segment of the root into that uh, property that I've just defined, that root uh, that component parameter. So I need to make a couple of changes here just to make everything uh, work. So let's put starting count there, and we'll do the same there, and we'll save that. Cool. Now that should be all we need to do. So let me just go over to my browser and I'll do refresh. And if I click on the counter page, you can see it started from zero as it did before. But now I should be able to go slash 10. Oh, oh my keyboard is not happy today. There we go, slash 10, hit enter. Oh, but now I've got an exception. So this is odd. So what does this say? We're unable to cast object of type string to type it system in 32. So let's go back to the code and try and understand what's gone wrong here. Now, you may recall when I was talking about root matching, I said all segments are treated as strings. And that's exactly what's happened here. The root is treated with the value in this segment as a string. However, I've typed my uh, component parameter as an int because I want to work with it as an int within my, within my uh, component. So Blazor's router doesn't know this, so it's tried to pass it in as a string, and that's why we've got that exception. So I need to tell the router that whatever is in this segment of the root needs to be castable to an int. And I can do that using something called a root constraint. 
So if I do colon uh, int like this, now I'm saying to Blazor's root of whatever value is in there must be convertible uh, to an int. And if it's not, then this is not going to be uh, a root match. So by doing that, if I hit save, and I'll, I'll jump back over and I will just do a refresh. And now we've got everything working as we wanted. We've got our current count starting at 10 and it's working as it did before. I can change this now to 101 and hit enter and we can see it's starting from that current count again. So that's all good. And just to make the point even more, if I now change this final bit, if I put foo in here, for example, and hit enter, you can now see that we're hitting Blazor's not found template because that is no longer a root match because foo will not, uh, we cannot cast foo to an integer. Cool. So that's a quick whiz through root parameters and root constraints. So the next thing I want to talk about is programmatic navigation. So that's quite an important thing in uh, most applications. There's going to be plenty of occasions where you're going to want to navigate to different places uh, programmatically. So how can we do that? We're going to leave the counter component as it was. I'm going to move to the index page and we're going to make some modifications here. So I'm going to inject. Um, oh, can't type today. I'm going to inject the navigation manager like so. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to paste some code because it's just a little quicker. And then we're going to walk through it. So what I've done is I've added a input to the index page and I've bound it to this private field, which is an integer, which is going to be our starting count. So we're going to be able to type a value into this input. And then when we click this button down here, we're going to use the navigation manager and we're going to use its navigate to method to programmatically navigate to our counter component uh, with that particular start and count that we want it to use. Okay, so it's very, very simple to do this in Blazor. So that is all we do. So if we save, uh, if we save that off and then we go back to our browser and I do a refresh. So you can see here is our input and uh, our button. So if I now type in 12, for example, and hit go to counter, then you can see the current count is now starting at 12. I can go back. I can change that again to something else and I can hit go to counter, and again, that is all working, okay? So that's that's uh, a really, uh, really quick and easy one again. So uh, that's that's uh, programmatic navigation in Blazor. So the last thing I'm gonna cover, and the last demo I've got for you, is to how we deal with query strings in Blazor applications. So um, in order to do this, I've had to install a NuGet package, okay? So I'm just gonna show you that first. So in here, uh, if I just zoom in, uh, we'll go over here and up that. So this Microsoft ASP.NET Core Web Utilities. Okay, so that's got some helper methods that can allow us to deal with with query strings really easily. Because as it turns out, Blazor doesn't actually do anything with query strings by default. In fact, the root will actively ignore query strings. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and navigate to our counter component, and we're going to try and pass the start and count as a query string instead. So in order to do that, I'm going to make a quick change to um, this uh, piece, oh, oh dear, uh, like this. And I'm going to say starting count like this. So I've specified now a query string of starting count, and we're going to set the value to whatever we type into the input uh, text box. So that's actually all we need to do on the index page. We're going to leave that alone. So the rest of our modifications are going to be in the counter page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject uh, the navigation manager again, just as we did in the index page. And then I'm going to, again, copy in some code. So I'm just going to bring that on a new line just to make it a bit easier. So what we're going to do here. So first of all, I've overridden the uninitialized lifecycle method of the counter component. So this is going to fire when the component is first run. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to get the current URI, and we're going to get that as a actual URI object. So you can see here the type is a system.URI object. And in order to do that, we're going to use the navigation manager and we're going to use its to absolute URI method. We're going to again use the navigation manager to get the current URI as a string because we need to pass the, uh, whatever URI um, we're trying to get as a string into that absolute URI method. So that's going to give us this URI object. Then we've just got a little if statement, and we're going to use this query helpers class, which comes from that web utilities library. 
And then it's got a pass query method. And here we pass in the query string uh, that we want to operate over. And this is where using that UR object becomes really useful because we can just say URI.query and it's going to separate that query string out from the URI for us. So that's really useful. Then we're going to call the try get value method. And in there, we're going to say, right, we want to try and get the value for the start and count query string. And then whatever value that has, we're going to want to output it to this underscore starting count variable. If all that succeeds and we get a value come out, then we're going to uh, hit this bit of code here. And basically what we're doing is we're going to assign uh, the value of starting count to that starting count parameter we created earlier. Um, but before we do that, we're going to convert it to an integer because it does come out as a string. Now, it's probably worth doing something a little bit more robust in a real application than this, because obviously if this couldn't be cast to an integer, this would throw an exception and, and things would burn. It would be not good. So um, definitely do something a bit more robust. So that should be it. So if I save this off now and we go back to our browser, if I refresh, we head to the home component and I type in 12, for example, and hit go to counter. Everything has worked. So we can see here we've, we're navigating to our uh, counter component and we've got our query string here. So start and count equals 12. And we can see that our counter has correctly been initialized with uh, a start and count of 12. So uh, we can still click and increment. So that's all working as it did before. So it's all good. Doesn't look like we've broken anything. So. I appreciate that was quite a whistle stop. There's definitely a lot more we could talk about with routing, but um, but that is basically it from me. So um, hopefully we've uh, got some time left for some questions. And um, yeah, cool. we do have some questions actually. Hey Chris, yeah, we do have um, some questions here. Uh, Beth, did you put one up? Yeah, here for we me. Go. How about this one? Hey Chris, you want to shoot your camera and stop sharing your screen so we, people can see you? Yes, yes, Sweet. yeah. Let me just do it. Perfect. All right. Ooh. So we got a question from um, asking when to use Navlink and when to use a Nahref. Is there any major differences? Um, so it depends what you're after. So the uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Navlink component, all it really does for you is it applies that active class when you're on uh, when you're on that page that that link is for. So um, you would have seen through the demos there um, that. The menu on the left hand side every time i clicked on a link and i, I moved to that route uh, the background changed to a slightly different color and that was uh, because of some styling uh, that's implied in the that's applied in the default template so if you want to have that kind of stuff happen automatically then yes use the navlink component but ultimately that's pretty much the majority of what it's doing for you um, you can just use a normal um, href otherwise so if you're not interested in that that custom styling Perfect. Uh, Beth has another question up here. Let's take a look at it. Um, Chris, how do you deal with fragments such as slash help pages slash FAQ hashtag? Uh, how do I sign up? You know, sort so of how you build that up in, in Blazor. Uh, okay. So is that in terms of actually routing to uh, a certain place on place on a page? Yes, uh, exactly. That, yeah, like for hash. example, if I want to go to specifically uh, the midsection where I'm listing a speaker or whatever, whatever chunk of, of code I may have. Yeah, yeah, got you. Yeah, so I've had, I'll be honest, I've had this question quite a few times from various people. That I'll be honest, at the moment, it's it's not overly easy to do. You'd have to use JavaScript interop to do it. Um, so there's nothing you can do in Blazor out of the box. Um, you would have to call, uh, you'd have to create some JavaScript, and you, uh, I believe, something like you'd use Scroll to on an element, but yeah, it would be a JavaScript interop in order to do that. Perfect. So it's funny because we actually do have a great JavaScript interop session later on the day by Javier Cavarro Nelson, who is yep. a software engineer on the Blazor team. So please stick around for that and we can find out more about it. Beth, we have one more question. Did yep. you put the, oh, perfect. Oh, it's over here. Can we have a um, sample of implementing direct URL, something like, like it works out of the box in MVC? Direct URLs? Redirect. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was redirect. Oh, URL. Redirect. URL. I, I misspoke. Oh, redirect. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, you can actually do that quite. Uh, yeah, you can probably do that quite easily in Blazor in a, in terms of a component. Um, so you could actually have uh, a component at the uh, at the route that you want to redirect from, and you could override its uh, uninitialized, inject the navigation manager, and you could just immediately redirect to wherever you want to go. So you could handle it that way. It's not the most cleanest way of doing it, but you could do it that way right now. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of your day. Again, uh, we have a lot of great speakers. Most of them are from outside of the studio just because of logistics and trying to get people in and out. Uh, so, Chris, thank you for calling all the way from the UK. Um, My pleasure. Thank you for having perfect. me. Perfect. So what we're going to do here is Beth Massey actually has several announcements to give to us with regards to Blazor. Several. Several. <laughs> Take it away, Beth. Yeah. So while Javier's uh, setting up the next uh, speaker, um, I just kind of wanted to uh, go over a couple things uh, so that you guys not, might not know. Uh, one is we're doing, as Dan mentioned in the beginning of the show, uh, we're starting this uh Focus series, .NET Conf Focus. And so we'll be bringing you more targeted topics throughout the year. Um, so this one's on Blazor, of course. We have a full day of sessions that we're going on right now. Uh, but the next one we're going to be doing in March. And so we're going to do that one on Xamarin. So we'll have a focus on Xamarin. So if you're doing mobile development with Xamarin, you're going to want to stay tuned for that. Um, and that will happen uh, March 23rd, this is right now. So uh, we'll put all the information and details and schedule and all that stuff up on the website in the next couple weeks here. So we'll start advertising that for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we have uh, Carl Franklin from Donet Rocks podcast actually has a Blazor Roadshow um, that he's doing. So he's going all around, you know, and do and talking about Blazor. So you can go to blazerroadshow.com for information on that. Um, if you watch .NET Rocks, you're probably very familiar with Carl, the famous Carl Franklin. Um, Another thing we wanted to mention, if you are a Visual Studio subscriber or a Dev Essentials subscriber, uh, you can sign up for one free year of Code Magazine. Um, we did a special focus issue of Code Magazine in November, and it was all about .NET Core 3. Um, so uh, there's a great ar article in there on Blazor, uh, I think by Ed uh, Charbonneau from uh, Progress, which is he's speaking, I think, later today as well, um, and as well as a bunch of team members that have done a, a lot of great topics on .NET Core 3. So uh, go ahead and uh, uh, go to visualstudio.com, sign up for a subscription, just a Dev Essentials subscription if you'd like, um, and in your subscriber benefits, you can sign up for a free year of Code Magazines. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I think that's all I have for announcements at the moment. So uh, Javier, how's it looking over there? Perfect. We get cool. Yeah, cool. perfect. We're back. Perfect. It is the magic of the internet and cameras. That's just, this is how we do things here in Channel 9 Studios. So we got uh, Jimmy Engstrom on, on a Skype call as well. We are going to be talking about creating great UX in Blazor. So Jimmy, how's it going? Yeah, I'm going, doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, we're all ready for your presentation. Awesome. All right, take it away, I Jimmy. Will, I will switch over to sharing my screen. There we go. Can you see it? There we go. Welcome to this session about creating great UX with Blazor. Developers are known for making bad UIs and bad user experiences, but I believe that has changed a lot during the last couple of years. This is much because of frameworks, frameworks that helps us use standardized component with a min minimal effort. Another reason is that CSS has evolved a lot during the last couple of years, and so has web browsers. Compatibility issues are not as many nowadays. In the Blazor templates, Microsoft has included Bootstrap, a framework written by Twitter. There are a bunch of other frameworks as well, but I will focus on Bootstrap for the remainder of this session. For me, the big change was when my wife started a path down the UX rabbit hole, and we both started to realize the why. Why is this important? Why is this affecting the users? And why should we care? It all boils down to psychology, adapting the content on the screen to better work with a receiver, your user, probably a human. My name is Jim Engstrom, and I'm a Windows Development MVP. I work as a web developer at Eric Pounds Bank here in Stockholm. My wife and I run a startup called Awesome Dev, focused on future technologies like the HoloLens, for example. And we also run a podcast together called Coding Off the Work. And there's a bunch of, or actually two, Blazor-related episodes. But enough about me. We have about 35 minutes or so. And I want to share some of the reasons why you should focus on UX. 
and how I work with Bootstrap and SaaS. But first, we need to know the why. So let's start with the brain. If we know the limitations of the brain, we will figure out what we can do better. There are a bunch of neurotransmitters and hormones in our brain, but there are four that we usually call the happy chemicals, the ones that makes us happy. The first one is dopamine. So according to research, humans have about four working memory spots, plus minus one. You might have heard seven, but more recent research says it's three to five. Stress will decrease the working memory. So what can we do? Dopamine actually increases the working memory. It will make our users more motivated and more productive. To me, this sounds like awesome things to have in a user. So what can we do? We can add gamification. And I realize that that might not be the best solution for every application, but I will show you a couple of ways that you can, you can add dopamine or gamification in your business app as well. And we can add reward motivated behavior. The next hormone or, or a neurotransmitter is oxytocin. Oxytocin will make our users more grounded. They will feel happier and become more mindful. A very simple way is to add pictures of humans, our other avatars. It will create a connection to the site that, um, that is really great to have. I've been working with a conference and we've been using a tool called, called speaker.travel, a site that will help us book travels for our speakers. And they do this beautifully by using Gravatar images of the speakers that will create a connection from me to the site and from me to the speakers. MailChimp are using a mascot. A really, really nervous monkey is going to press that button when we're going to send out all the emails. It's, he's even going to give me a high five. Well done. You, we made it. Serotonin is the next one. It increases working memory as well. It will give our users a sense of belonging and it will regulate mood. Our users will feel more emotionally stable, less anxious, more calm, and get more focused and be more energetic. And we can do this by adding positive events. And again, our friend gamification. Very simple example of this is perhaps a step tracker or a wizard. The last happy chemical is endorphins. This will give our users a feeling of satisfaction. They will feel successful and get a feeling of achievement or even victory. And how do we achieve that? Well, you all probably already guessed it. Yes, gamification and positive reinforcements. But there is a bad guy in all of this as well. Cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone. It easily gives our users a sense of feeling overwhelmed. Multitasking is known to, to increase cortisol. Unclear error messages. So instead of saying an error occurred, say what happened and why. Suggest the next step. Find the right tone in your error messages. Perhaps you can be a little bit positive. Whoop, we made an oopsie. Or you can be a little bit more formal if your, if your site demands it. Oxytocin is also the known enemy of cortisol. So adding oxytocin will make your users less stressed. There are really two users to a project. One is the end user, the one that is actually, we are actually developing for. But there's one more, the, the one that codes, the developer. So when I talk about UX, I'm talking about UX from both the developer side and the end user. So let's switch over to, to Visual Studio. View, Angular, and React 
has a way to use scoped CSS. Now, personally, I don't see the beauty of it. Instead of sharing CSS between all components, scoped CSS rewrites the CSS rules so that that particular component is the only one that uses that CSS. But from what I've seen is that a lot of developers are super passionate about this. So, of course, I want to have that in this session. There are a couple of ways of doing this, but in my opinion, the best possible way to do this right now is to use a project called Blazor Scoped CSS by Alexander Reis. The syntax differs a bit from what we're used to in other frameworks. For, for Vue, Angular, and React, they're actually using Webpack or something similar to package the CSS and rewrite it as, um, as they go. But for Blazor Scoped CSS, it's a little bit different. So we're going to take a look at that. The first thing we need to do is to add the Blazor Scoped CSS NuGet package. I've already done that, so you don't have to see me do that. Then we're going to go into Configure Services, and we're going to add a service. So we're going to say Service, Add Blazor Scoped CSS, and we're going to pass in the assembly get, ex get executing assembly. There we go. Next up, we are going to go into the pages and into our host file. Our host file, we're going to add a style component or a style tag. Let's add a style, and the ID should be scoped CSS, like that. And then we need to add a JavaScript as well. And as you saw in the first uh, session, you can write script, and we can say content. And content's going, going to say that I'm going to look somewhere else. In this case, I'm going to look in the NuGet package Blazor scoped CSS, and I'm going to include a JS interrupt JS, like that. So then we can go to fetch data. And I have added a file called fetchdata.razor.css. So this is the file that's going to the file that's going to contain our CSS code. So let's create a couple of CSS rules. So my first scoped component, and then we're going to add a scoped scope ID. This is the one that's going to be replaced later on. So we're going to say that let's say background color is going to be red. I'm going to create another one, my second scoped component. Again, scoped ID. And we're going to say that background should be blue. And then we can go back into fetch data. And now it's time to add these components into our project. So the first thing we need to do is we need to add the scoped CSS components. So I'm going to say blazor scoped CSS dot scoped style. I'm going to say that the embedded style path is going to be fetch data racer dot CSS. Then we're going to add a parent, and it's going to be this file. And then after in it, we're going to make sure that the state has changed. I'm going to reference a scoped style. So let's create that scoped style down here. Blazor scoped CSS, scoped style, I'm going to name it scoped style. There we go. So now it's time to write some, some uh, styling. So let's create a, we're going we're gonna to check that is scope style complete. And then we're going to render a header. We're going to say that our class is going to be scoped style dot CSS scoped classes. And we're going to add a parameter scoped CSS classes. And I'm going to say that my first scoped component. I'm going to say that it's going to say weather forecast as well. Let's create a paragraph. I'm going to say it's class sky, uh, scope style. But this, one, this time I'm going to say CSS classes mixed. So I'm going to say non scoped CSS classes display one. So this is not going to be a scoped class. Then I'm going to say scoped CSS classes, my second scoped component. 
And this is going to be this component demonstrates fetching data from the service. There we go. So if I run this, we're going to see fetch data. So up here, it's going to be red and blue. So if we check out the code that is actually happening here. So on our header, we're going to have my first scoped component. And then the scoped ID is going to be replaced by isolation, which is my, um, my project name, pages, which is the folder, and fetch data, which is site, uh, the page. On the other one, is display one is going to be there because it's not a scoped one. And I'm going to get the, the my second scope component um, and, well, the same as above. If I check up here with a head, I can see that I have style, I have the scope CSS, and up here I have the rewritten styles right here. So that's the first demo. Let's close this down and return. Then we have SAS. So this is how we typically work. For those who don't know what SAS is, SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets. With a name like that, how can you not love this? So this is a way of writing CSS in a more programmatic way, using variables, nesting, and loops. So Bootstrap is distributing SAS files of their framework, which makes it really easy for us to work with. In my opinion, Bootstrap has a couple of problems that we are actually going to try to solve today. HTML is a markup language that should define the data on the page, not the layout. But with Bootstrap and, and many other solutions, we are forced, sometimes forced to add divs, we are forced to add some classes, and I'm not really a fan of writing classes everywhere for a couple of reasons. I need to remember the name of the class, or I need to check. And more importantly, my colleagues need to keep track of the class I, that I used in other, other parts of the application. So what we ended up doing was that we abstracted away a lot of these things and put them into components. Now, I know Ed Charbonneau is going to talk about creating components later today, so I'm not going, going to go into depth talking about how to create these components. I will, however, share the code uh, that, I'm, that I'm using uh, here. So the first thing we need to do is to go to getbootstrap.com and click the download button. It's going to take us to a page. I'm going to scroll down a little bit where we're going to find source files. I'm going to click the download button. Now we're all set. Let's switch over to Visual Studio. I'm going to close this one. I'm going to set this as a start project instead. So the first thing we need to do, uh, I've created a folder called styles. In that folder, I've, I've put my bootstrap 441 folder, and it's in C. CSS folder, I have all my, my SAS files. So I'm going to go into, uh, I'm going to close this one up. There we go. So I'm going to go, I've created a, uh, a SAS file called site. So what we do is we're going to type import bootstrap 441 CSS bootstrap. So now we're all set. Now we can run this application. And it's going to look just the same as the default template. Um, what we also need to do is we're going to create a compiler config. So I'm going to say that this file, styles.site.scss, that's really hard to say, it's going to output this file to www.root CSS and site CSS. So now we are all set. All right. But I want to change some things when it comes to how this looks. So in the main layout.racer, it looks like this by, by default. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, I don't want a sidebar. I want to have my, my menu at the top. So I'm going to get rid of that and just have the nav menu at the top. Next up, we have a, a, an about page or an about, about link. We don't want that either, so let's get rid of that. So now we have a div class main. And this is what I'm talking about. So in, in Bootstrap, we, we are kind of forced to use divs, or that's the recommended um, way of doing things. But in HTML5, we have a main class or a main element. So I can just get rid of this div and say, hey, I want a main instead. And then the, we have the last one, the div. We're going to replace that instead of content px4, we're going to say container. Then we're going to turn our eyes to the nav menu. So then this is how the default nav menu looks. We have a nav and we have a bunch of classes. We have navbar, navbar expand large, we have navbar light, and so on. So what I can do is I can take all of these and put them in a SAS file instead. So what I'm saying is that if I have a nav object, I want it to apply the navbar, the navbar expand large, I want it navbar light, and back, background light, and have that in that, put that on that nav instead. So now I can remove all the classes. So now I only have a nav. If we look uh, further down, I have an, uh, just beneath the nav, I have an anchor button and a div. I can do the same thing there. So I can take the nav bar brand, just move it there. I can take take the um, the toggler, move it there, and the collapse, move it there. So this makes our HTML look like this instead. Now I do realize that this is not the right solution for everyone. I might want to be a little bit more specific when it comes to the nav, but I can give it an ID and put the um, CSS there instead. The point is to move all the styling into the SAS files instead. And last but not least, we have the link. Same thing there. We have a nav bar, nav, nav item, nav link. So we're just going to move all of that into our navigation SAS file. And it's going to look like this instead. So if we, if we take a look at the nav, um, the nav component, it's going to look like this instead. Way easier to read, less HTML to, to uh, handle. So let's add our, our class there as well. So I'm going to say import navigation. And I don't have to supply SCSS here because it, it, it already knows that. So if I launch this, it's going to look something like this. So now I have the menu on top instead. It's going to work just as before. It's going to look pretty much the same. So let's go into form. So this is the default behavior of a form without any styling. So if I type Jimmy here, I don't know if you can see it, but it actually turned green. And if I do not supply an age, it's going to say, hey, age, you must supply an age. If we go back to Studio, I can, uh, we already saw a couple of demos with this in the beginning, but I'm using the required attributes to say that I need this to be something. I need it to be, uh, and if, if you do not supply it, I want you to print out, please provide a name. And the same thing goes with age. And what this is actually using is it's using the edit form, it's using data annotation validator, and it's using the input text and validation message. So this by default is going to add a class, or actually two classes, it's going to add modified and it's going to add valid in this case. And if we do the same thing with 
the uh, text box beneath, it's going to add modified and invalid. But Bootstrap has some really nice features. So we want to add and we want to add the serotonin dopamine into this, this solution. So what I can do is I can add, I can do like this. So I'm going to say that all input fields in my whole applications is going to add the form control. I want, uh, if it's invalid and if it's valid, I want it to have the form control. If it's invalid and modified, I want it to be invalid. And if it's valid and modified, I want it to be valid. So these are our um, styles or classes direct that lives in Bootstrap. I even said that every button in my solution is going to be a button and a button primary. This might be a little bit too far. So you might want to do like this primary button and add an extend button and extend button primary. What I really want to do is not to have specific styles in my project, specific bootstrap styles. I want to ex ex um, extract them away. So if we go to site, and let's say I want to import forms. So we go into our demo site, we're going to reload this. And pro tip, you need to save as well. So now it looks a little bit different. So if I type Jimmy, it's going to say check mark. Yeah, you did well. So this is going to add serotonin. It's going to say, hey, you did well. It's going to be positive reinforcements. It's going to work just the same with, with a red one. Yeah, and, and it's going to show the, red, the age field as well. Next up, we have the fetch data. So let's take a look at that. So I've, I've put, I've loaded a lot more data and I have added the reload button. So what is happening here is that the user doesn't get anything back. They, they don't know what is happening. Is it loading? Is it, is, is it just slow? Or is this all the data I have? Fair enough, this is perhaps a little bit too fast for them to, to do that kind of um, conclusion. But what I want to do here, I want to add something that shows them that I'm working on something. I'm going to go back. I'm going to add a spin kit. And I know that Ed Charbonneau is going to demo how to do this as a component later on. So spin kit. I'm not going to go into depth and show you this specific component. We're going to go back and I'm going to reload the page. So when I reload, I'm going to show you the spinner. I'm doing something, I'm, I'm loading the data. I'm also keeping date, temperature, and summary, the header, visible. So this is because you want to add dopamine again. You're building anticipation. You're preparing them for what data they're, they're about to see instead of just having a blank page. Now, research shows that just putting the data on a page, just switching it on all the data at the same time, Older people and younger people have a problem with that. The cognitive load goes up. And the load page of a page is really the time the page, the time it takes to load the page, as well as the cognitive load, or actually how, how fast you can, can understand it. So what I've done here is I have added an animation. So this animation is at 0%, I want it to be invisible. And I want it to be just a tiny bit smaller than, than the, the real size. At 85%, I want it to be fully visible. And I want it to be a little bit bigger. And at 100%, I want it to be fully visible and the right size. And then I'm creating a for loop in my SAS file. So I'm going to create 50 of these styles. It's going to take uh, the um, table row, and for each one of these, it's going to add a little bit of delay. So it's going to be kind of a waterfall effect, if you will. So it's going to it's going to load this a little bit, um, a little bit slower, but it's going to load it. It's fading in. So let's 
let's add that to our CSS as well. So we're going to import animations. So if we save and we go back, I'm going to reload. I'm not sure how well this is uh, transferring over Skype, but it's it's a very different experience, and it's not that it it doesn't take that much more time, but it will give the users more. What what we're actually doing here is that we're offloading the cognitive load to our visual cortex. So in this case. You can think about the visual cortex as a GPU. You're going to understand this way faster and way better. Let's take a look at another one. We have a form here. So I have a form two. It's going to look at something like this. So this is how we add gamification to our form in this case. So I have a first name. I'm going to say my name is Jimmy, because it is. And here I've added, I've, I've created a component that has the first, uh, it, in, it includes the label, it includes the text box, it includes a short description. What is your name? And when I've typed that in, it's going to say, hey, nice to meet you. I can type in my last name. And I even have a, a way of adding a watermark here. So I can say, well, I'm a developer. Wow, developer, you say, that sounds interesting. And as you can see up here, I have a progress bar. So I can see that I'm 43% done. And this is the game. This is a very simple way of adding gamification, getting, pe getting people to get a little bit more excited about filling out the form. Again, we have the checkbox and checkboxes and all of that. So if we go back to our, our form, so what I've done here is that I've added another attribute. I've added the display attribute. So I'm saying in my class that I'm, I want the name of this, uh, or the display name to be the first name. I want the description to be, what is your name? And I have the error message, please provide a name. Uh, and and I even have the I, I've reused the prompt to show the watermark. This looks like this in a component. So I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to blog about this. So please check out my blog in in the, the last slide. So this is so what we're doing here is that I have a label text, I have an input text, I have a small description. I can show errors. I don't have to show errors, but I can. Um, I'm iterating over the validation messages. I have a success message. So if it validates correctly, it's going to show me the, the um, success message. And if we take a look at all the components here or all the code here, it's using the properties on those um, components or, or um, my personal clause in this case. The progress summary is using a just normal um, progress bar that I downloaded from the internet. And it's using the validation summary that we saw in, in um, uh, Dan's um, example in the beginning, the first session. So this is, this is a copy of that. And it's going to use the same model to create what you see here. So if I remove my name, it's going to be, can please provide a name and uh, I'm, 29% done suddenly. Let's switch back. So I hope that you are, are as excited as I am about UX and what we actually can do with all of these things. So we do have some time for questions. Do we have any questions? Awesome. No, no, no. no. Uh, so we're going to have to go. So yeah, we're going to have to put it right Hold there. Hold on. Are we on? Are we on? Uh, we're, okay. we're learning a little bit. Hey, there we go. Okay. 
Cool. Put it on there, Beth. All right, so the next question we got, hey, is there a plan to integrate MS Fluent Design for web natively as an option with Blazor? Saw there's a community project on it. Have you heard anything about that, Jimmy? I have not heard about that. I, that would be awesome. But, I would love that feature. Well, well, let me ask you this. Why would you love it? So for, for other people who haven't heard about it. So I love the Fluent Design pattern. I, since I'm a Windows developer, uh, developer MVP, I, I'm, I love SAML. I'm sorry, but I do. <laughs> I'm I'm not as as comfortable using HTML, even though that's my daily job. So I would love to see more fluent design in, in web pages as well. Perfect. Uh, I think we have another question that Beth had. Put Actually, up. it's more of a comment. More of a comment. Okay, so Blazor scope uh, CSS components from Jimmy Engstrand. This is pretty slick. So can can are you looking for people to help you with the project, or is this and you know, how how are you treating this these components? The um, uh, which, which components the are we talking about? The Blazor Scope CSS, the what you were showing in your in your presentation. Okay, uh, so that that's not my project. There's someone else, oh, okay. Alexander Rice, that made that component. Uh, I personally don't think that uh, I I like to have these these more generic styles when I when I do my development. I would love to have discussions with people that find this. But who are very passionate about this? Sure. But but I, I'm I'm personally not doing anything with that. Well, let, let me ask you this question. So I am I'm a serve I'm a backend or turbo developer. I've been doing ASP.NET for many many years. What would you recommend mm -hmm. to me, someone like myself who is very knowledgeable in the platform, to get used to understanding of what is what is UX? You know, how do we go about uh, about creating something that is uh, not necessarily attractive, but but usable and friendly for people on uh, for people to use my software outside of just using something like Bootstrap and something off the shelf. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, figuring out the why is the biggest change for me. So dig in, find find resources on the web. There's lots of, of things out there, and don't don't just do things because people say that you should do it a particular way but invest time in understanding why you should do it in a particular way. And for, for someone that is new, definitely use uh, Bootstrap or any other framework. There's no reason to invent the wheel again, if you will. Perfect, that's a great answer. We have another question as we were asking this. Are there frameworks available to directly inject serotonin and dopamine into our apps using <laughs> UI? <laughs> have have, have, have we figured that out of. one yet? <laughs> Not that I know of, but that would be awesome, right? And if we could find out a way to do it, we we it, the world would be just a better place. I'm assuming so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Jimmy, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. It's evening where you're at right now, right? That's why it's all kind of dark. We were yep. discussing that earlier. So that's the nice thing about um, .NET Conf is that we get speakers all over the world having great content, sharing, and uh, being passionate about what they uh, they do love. What we're going to hear, we're going to go into a quick break as we get Jeremy Lickness uh, from the UK. Actually, he's from Redmond, but he's in the UK, uh, up and ready, and another Skype call. So we'll be right back. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Bill. And my name is Nika. Thanks for watching our previous series with Scott and Kendra on object-oriented programming in C Sharp. This series is all about Link. So what is Link? Yeah, so Link, it's in the name. It stands for Language Integrated Query. And the cool thing about Link is once you know Link, uh, you can use it for any data structure. So you can use it for XML documentation, arrays, SQL databases. It's pretty sweet. Collections, whatever. Exactly. Things not for Microsoft, others can use it, right? Yes. Cool. All right. So let's look at this using try.net, which is a tool that we built that helps you explore different libraries in Link. So in the description, you're going to see a link to our .NET Try Samples repo, which is the one I'm showing here. And in the README, there is the installation instructions to go ahead and get started with the .NET Core SDK and something called .NET Try, which is a .NET global tool. And all the instructions are right here. Right. So first you need .NET Core SDK. And yep. then once you have that, you can go ahead and clone the .NET Try um, samples off this GitHub repository. And I've already done that. 
So we're going to start with the 101 link samples. And then you just have to run a tool called .NET, which you learned about in the earlier series, and then do .NET try. And that's going to start up a new browser window for me with all of these wonderful link samples. And once it loads up the browser, we're going to get a new localhost window on our space. And there we have 101 link samples and our friendly .NET bot. And we're not going to run all these. These are crazy. Yeah, I mean, link is powerful. So link let's start with one of the most common queries. Click right. the restriction operators link. All right. So restriction operators, the where keyword. And so I get this window, and I've got a run button. So now when I click run, I get this other window that shows here's the results from our query. So this query, if we look at, it's looking for lower numbers from num in numbers, like you say, just like SQL in some ways, where num is less than 5. That's kind of that restriction operator for where. And then we select the number. Yeah, so right. let's change that to a list. Right. So we we said we could do this with anything. So I'm going to change that numbers to a new list event. I'm going to have to change it on this side. That was one of the things we learned about earlier in our object oriented. That's the only change I have to make. I'm yeah, so you don't have squiggles. to change the query at all. It just yeah. works pretty much. And then we'll just run it again. And once again, there we go. All right, so let's look at a couple others here. So um, let's look at the properties of an object in the input sequence. So OK, so if I take this very next one, we've got a list of products. So that's some object oriented collection that we're building. And I'm looking at with that where clause here on anything where there's nothing in stock, right? So that should print everything that we've sold out. Those are the popular ones. And there, it's just looking at the same sequence, and it's printing out everything about that particular product. So what else can we do with this where method? Let's look at the, the last page, which shows the syntax for a where clause. OK. Um, so this this yeah. one does look different. Yeah, it's using a where method instead of the where keyword. That's right. So this one uses a where method. It actually does the same thing that we saw in these other ones that we were doing with this where clause and a keyword. What's different is the language compiler says translates one into the other. And there's a slightly different feature here. If you look this where clause or this where method, we've got two different arguments. One is that index that says it's its position of that element in the sequence. So if we run this one, what we're going to see is in addition to the strings up above that 0, 1, 2, 3 with the letters, it also knows the corresponding number, the number 0 and the number 1. And it has, it's printing out any words that are shorter than the value. So like the number 6 printed out has fewer letters than 6, and so on and so forth. And that's everything with the where method. Great. So let's look at that projections operator link right there. Right there? All right. Now we're on to select. We kind of saw some of these, but I'm going to just do one quick. So if we look, I've got one here where we're taking things in numbers and I'm mapping from one to another. So our first select just grabbed everything from our input sequence. And here you can see I'm taking something from a numbers collection. And what I'm selecting is the corresponding string from another array. So select lets us project into some other collection. And that's what we see in a lot of quick, just about every query. We'll see some kind of a where to filter something and some kind of a select to have some output sequence. So that was an intro to Link. And we also showed you how to use our try.net tool. And we also showed you all of the uh, 101 Link examples. And next, we're going to talk about the Link query syntax. See you then. Hey, everybody. We are back with .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. Uh, we have my good friend, Jeremy Lignus, joining us all oh. the way from the UK. If he were to be on campus, he would literally be standing right next to me. But because of the magic of the internet and technology, we were able to make it work out this way. So Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to speak to us uh, about state management in Blazor. What's going on with this? It's my pleasure. Very, very excited. I finally got to visit a UK office. I'm at the Microsoft scale up, which is underneath the reactor here. and. Uh, I've got some, some good tidbits. I think people will be excited to hear the information I have to share. Perfect. All right, let's get started. All right, sounds good. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's get over to the presentation. Start sharing. And we're going to pop over here. All right, looking good. As we said, all right, fantastic. Well, we are talking today about state management and Blazor apps. 
My name is Jeremy Lickness. I'm a cloud advocate with Microsoft, and I'm excited to share some tips, tricks, techniques, and solutions for you today. But before I get started, I want to set the stage for what we're going to talk about. So imagine just for a second that you're filling out the world's longest online form. And I know everyone's run into this. You've got dozens and dozens of fields. You've filled out your name, your birth date, the last seven cities you visited, tons of information. You go to click the submit button. All right, so everything's looking fine. We're good to go. Something disconnected. And you get that message that you're offline. No problem, right? So you're going to try to get back into your form. Unfortunately, you're forced to start over. That form's clear. You hit the back button, there's nothing there. That is not a great experience. In fact, users having that experience are going to throw the website in the trash can, figuratively, of course. So what we want to talk about is how we address this problem of managing state with inside Blazor apps. And the first thing I'm going to focus on is what do I mean when I talk about state? What is state inside a, a Blazor application? And it's really three key pieces of information that are part of that experience the user has on your website. The first is the HTML or the UI. This is literally the elements that are being retained in your browser. It's the document object model or the DOM and all of that information. Now, the UI is something that can usually be rebuilt from information, but it's important as a user if I navigate away and come back to a page and I'm expecting there to be a seamless experience, that that is a consistent piece of state that I'm presented with. The other is, of course, the fields and properties. It's the data that makes up your form. And it's not just the data output that you're showing, but it's the data being input by the hardworking user who's trying to get that information over the line to you. And then it's also the services. The beautiful thing about Blazor apps is they can register and run different services. And we want the state of those services to be consistent so that we don't have side effects or strange behaviors when we come back into the site. Now, as people working with Blazor know, there are, are two different Blazor flavors, if you will. And the first one is Blazor WebAssembly. This is the client-side Blazor. This is what is still in preview but it is that Blazor that runs completely inside your browser. When you're running Blazor WebAssembly, the state of your application is retained inside the browser's memory. That's the HTML DOM and code. Unfortunately, because it's inside the browser's memory, if you force a refresh on the page, or if you navigate away from that page, that's going to destroy that state and remove it from memory. So I want to give you a quick example of what that looks like, and then we'll go on to the other flavor of, of Blazor. Everything that I'm going to show you is inside of this repo. Don't worry, I'll share the link later on. That's this Blazor state repo. But what we're going to do is launch the client-side version of this. And what I did is I took an application that I built way back in the Angular days. I took an Angular JS application, if you remember those days, and I ported that to the newer version of Angular. And then when Blazor came out, I ported it to Blazor so that users and developers could see the experience and compare and contrast. This is a very simple health form. You enter some information. I'm going to put in some fictional info here. We've just entered a height. I'm going to enter a fictional weight. And it's going to update some of these fields, and it's giving me my body mass index and some other information. If I navigate within the application, so I'm clicking on this navigation, you can see it consistently shows the results. We've got the same results here. However, let's refresh the page. I'm just going to force a refresh, and we lost the information. So that's one issue right there. Let's put this information back in. And I'm going to enter that same weight. But this time, instead of clicking on the navigation, I'm going to force a navigation by typing it into my URL bar. And again, I lose that information. So that's not a great experience. That is client-side Blazor. Next thing I want to look at is server-side Blazor. In server-side Blazor, although you do have some state in the browser, most of that state is retained on the server. 
And it's retained in something that we call circuits, which is a signal R term. But it's basically think of a sandbox for every session that's connected to that, that Blazor server. So it's in the server's memory. And because the server is maintaining that circuit, if you refresh, force a refresh, or you navigate, it will retain that. That's in the server's memory. It's taken over for you. However, if that server goes down and it disconnects, when you reconnect, by default, that's going to go away. Let's take a look at the server-side example. I'm going to go ahead and close the client example. We're going to switch to Blazor State Server, set that as our startup project, and launch that. And we're going to see an identical form, and I think you'll find the way this is architected is, is pretty interesting. We'll get into that in a second. I'm going to go ahead and put the same information, 5 foot 9, winter 205 pounds. We're going to navigate to results, back to home. That looks good. Let's force a refresh. I'm just going to refresh my web page. And that refresh happened so fast you might not have seen it, but the server maintained that state. I'm going to manually navigate to results, and again, it's maintained that. So that's, that's great. That's a good behavior. But if I open up my IIS Express and I stop the site, I get this disconnection. Let's go ahead and quickly bring that server back up. Well, the server rebooted, so of course it's no longer maintaining state. We go back to the default. If I go to this tab and I reload, I'm back to where I started. This is the experience that we're trying to avoid. Let me close these and come back. So before I dive into the solutions, what I tried to package up for you is a set of solutions that will impact your code base as minimally as possible. No one wants to have to write duplicate code in every component, in every page that they add to a site. We would much prefer to have some sort of service that handles the state for us. Unfortunately, we can do that. I took an approach of lowest common denominator. I try to build libraries so that the libraries are as shareable as possible. So at the bottom of this, I have a view model that manages the health information. We can look at this project, Blazor State View Model. And if we look at the project file, you can see this is a, just a .NET standard 2.0 project. So this can be shared across .NET projects, whether it's a WPF project, it could be a Xamarin application, or in this case, it's a Blazor application. That's the view model piece of this. And I'm showing that here. We've got our WPF, our UWP Xamarin. The next step up, one of the things I love about the architecture of Blazor is the support for Razor class libraries. Razor class libraries are, again, they're .NET Standard 2.0 libraries, but they can contain view information, JavaScript images, and CSS that are referenceable from other Blazor projects. So if you're sharing things across multiple projects, you can use that, even server and client projects. So if we look at Blazor State Shared, we can see, for example, I'm just going to open up this age component. This component is shared across the Blazor server and the Blazor client solutions that I showed you. It's got some HTML markup. We've got age. We've got some calculations going on here. I'm probably not using Jimmy's sat or a CSS styling to do the, the best practice for how I'm handling the validations, but that's OK. This is a very simple validation if we look at the code. It's basically pulling in information from that view model. And then it's checking for a range. So if the age is outside of a range, it's setting an error state so that we have a flag and, and everything else. But the nice thing about it is I write this component once, and that component can be shared between the server and the client. This also is using this health model base. If we look at health model base, what I've done is I've injected the view model into this base class. And then after render, I'm opting in to property change notification. Now, this isn't necessary for state management. I chose to use the model view model pattern. Blazor doesn't have an opinion of what framework that you use. You're welcome to use whatever. Because I'm using the view model pattern, I can have this base component 
that basically tells Blazor whenever the view model changes. That's what we're doing here. Anytime some input changes, we inform Blazor, and it's able to re-render and update the UI as you saw in real time. So that's what this does. And this is shared if we look at our server project, and we look at our dependencies, and go into projects. You can see that what this is using is the view model and that shared. If we go into our client project, let me close this, come back down to the WebAssembly project, open up dependencies, you can see it's using that same project. So that's that next tier that we're using here. I just made a rhyme and I wasn't expecting to. But that's the Blazor and the WebAssembly. So now we know how this demo was architected. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. So there's several approaches to managing state in the Blazor application. It may seem obvious, but it is not so obvious to everyone that service registration is one way to maintain state. And it's sort of the first one I want to focus on. And that's using the services to configure services. And what do I mean by that? Because I just said everything's in memory or in that circuit on the server. Why do I care about this when I'm talking about state management? Well, if we come over to this screen, what I've done is just done a file new Blazor project. Just create a simple client-side project. I didn't customize it. This is the out-of-the-box template. And it comes with this convenient counter. It's got some great examples of fetching data, of navigation, and of using a counter. I've got this running. Let's go ahead and, and launch it. I actually had it on another web page. That's fine. Now, if we look at the counter, out of the box, we have this functionality. We can click it, and that's great. I'm going to go to my home page. I'm going to come back to the counter. And notice that the count reset to zero. Why is that? Why did that count reset to zero? It's because the count is a property on the component. And it's scoped to the life cycle of this component. When I navigate away and the component goes away, when I come back, it creates a new copy. And that component gets initialized with that zero value. Let's address this with a service. This is the first step into managing some state in our project. I'm going to create a new class. So I'm just going to do add class. And I'm very creative with my naming, so I'm going to call this counter service. You can see where I'm going here. This is going to expose a count property. And because I want the service to really manage this, I'm going to give it a private setter. And instead of directly manipulating the count, we're going to expose a method called increment that just adds one to the count. Very simple service. I'm going to use my favorite feature here. Remove unnecessary usings. Make a nice clean class. So we've got a class. Now we need to use that class. We're going to come into startup right here. And we're going to configure it as a service. Now, typically what we would do is we would create a singleton. I'm sorry, we would create an interface and have an implementation for that interface. Because I'm making a very simple demo here, I'm not going to take the time to add that interface. So I'm going to tell it the counter service is the signature and counter service is the implementation. But that provides one copy of that service throughout the application. And if you notice, my background suddenly got dark. I don't know if I need to wave my arms or run around, but we've got some uh, energy saving things going on here. But it's quite all right as long as I'm still connected to the internet, right? So let's go back to our counter class, and let's use the service. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask it to inject the service. So I would like a copy of the counter service. And let's just call it SVC for short. So now I'm going to let the Blazor framework hand off this copy of the component for me. Now I can reference that component, or that service, I should say. So instead of using the count on the component, I'm going to use a count on the service. And I have my full IntelliSense. Everything's working out fine there. On this click event, instead of calling the components increment count, 
I'm going to call increment on the service itself. And now I don't even need this code behind because everything's handled by the service for me. This is live coding at its best. What could possibly go wrong? Let's just run this and see what happens. I'm building it right now. And you know this trick, right? If it's taking a little long, we just move the mouse clockwise to speed up the build. And look at that. It worked. We're loading, and we're inside the application. Let's go to our counter. Make sure it still works like it did before. Great. We can click, click, click. We're going to navigate away, come back to it, and it's retained that count of nine. So that's what I mean when I'm referring to service registration. It's an important first step to be able to handle state within your application. Now there's another approach, and that's the demo making the counter count. There's another approach of encoding data in the URL. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think URLs make more sense as navigation rather than state, but you can set up properties in your route and you can set up parameters that get passed into a component and you can have the URL encode some of that information. Again, I believe this makes much more sense when you're approaching it from the perspective of navigation, where am I in my application? But that's also an option for you. Next thing we're going to look at is the browser's own cache. Modern browsers, especially the ones that support WebAssembly, have built-in options for a cache. Here you're seeing an example of the local storage API. And local storage is local to a site. This will be a cache that exists for my domain, for my URL. There's also session storage, which, as you would suspect, is scoped to a session. That means if I open a new tab, navigate to the same site, it gets its own copy of that cache. And depending on the functionality you're trying to capture, the type of state management you want, you can either use local storage or session storage. I'm going to show the example with local storage. First thing we'll do is actually take a look at the application. Down here, I've got a project called WASM Local. I'm going to set that as my startup project. And I'll run it to show you what the functionality looks like. And this will probably look very familiar to you. You've seen this application somewhere before. But notice that it's already pre-populated some values. I'm going to go ahead and change those to keep the example consistent. Bring this up to 5 foot 9, take this to 205. And then I'm going to go to the results. You can see that is consistent. I uh, will force a refresh. And it still retained those same values. Now we're getting somewhere. I'm going to force the navigation here to results. And it's preserved that value. Before I crack open the lid and go behind the scenes, I want to show you another example because the solution that I'm proposing will work for, local, for client side, WebAssembly Blazor, as well as server side. So let's set that server side as the startup project. Let's launch into some code. And again, you can see this has come pre-populated. Let's queue up our consistent values here that I've been using. Take this to 205. Navigate to results. Now, before I showed you that with the server side, those circuits maintain state. So if I refresh or force a navigation, then the results go away. But what happened is when I came here, and I went into IIS Express and I disconnected the server, in this case by stopping it. We get this disconnect. Let's go ahead and launch it again. First thing I want you to see is this new tab that launched came in with our existing values. There's the 5 foot 9. There's the 205. And the results are consistent. If I come back to this one and I reload the page, it also reloads. So now we've solved the problem. How did we do this? 
if I open up my developer tools, I'll give you some insights. I'm going into application, and I've navigated to local storage. Notice there's session storage. I talked about that. We're looking at local storage, and we've got this health model, which is just a JSON serialized version of our view model. If we come down here, it will expand it out and give us the different values. Now, I'm not going to be able to zoom and change it at the same time, but if you just take a look at the bottom part of your screen, while I change these values, I'm going to drop an inch off the height here. And we can see this change to 31.2, 1900. If we add that inch back on, we got 30.3 and 1913. So adding an inch of height for a male will add 13 calories to the basal metabolic rate, in case you were wondering. How did we do this? Let's go back into our code. Now, I implemented this in the shared project. So this is one solution, works for server side or client side, can be shared across projects. And the key to this is inside a storage helper. Before I go into the storage helper, I want to show you how we share assets across Blazor projects. In wwroot, oh, let's get into the right project. In wwroot, I don't know why it keeps bouncing around like that. Let me zoom in. I have a style sheet, and I have this state management.javascript. If I open the state management JavaScript file, it should look Pretty familiar. This is what I showed you on the slide. It's just that local storage. In my Blazor server local project, there's an app. I'm sorry, there's a. Let's go into pages. There's a host.cshtml. This is the host file for server side Blazor. You can see here I've included a style sheet, and the convention is underscore content the name of the assembly, and the path to the resource. The change from the previous example is that I also added this JavaScript, so it's available to the server-side Blazor. The client-side Blazor is going to look very, very similar. Instead of the host.cshtml, if we go into this WASM local and we go into wwroot, there's an index.html in that client-side Blazor project. This is the host for client-side Blazor. If we look at this, though, the convention is the same. It's underscore content, name of the assembly, and the path to the JavaScript. So very, very easy way to add this. The other thing that I did was I created a Razor view, a reusable component called Storage Helper. There's a few things going on in Storage Helper, so I'm going to step through this. We've got some using statements. We're injecting this IJS runtime. This is an interface for JavaScript interop. And it's great that Blazor's provided us an interface, because then if we're doing unit testing, we can mock that interface and not have to have it active within a browser for those tests to work. So we've got that interface coming in. We also have the view model interface. This is the interface for the view model being injected as model. I've got a template here that says, if everything's loaded, render the child content. Otherwise, show this text of loading. That happened so quickly that you probably didn't see the loading. You saw the Blazor loading, but not the, the component loading. But that's OK. If we had a slower connection, this would make it a better user experience. We'd probably have a progress indicator, et cetera. So we're tracking, has it loaded, is it deserializing? If you look at this parameter, this render fragment of child content, this is the convention that you use in Blazor to have a component that can wrap other components. Simply by exposing this parameter as a render fragment, Blazor understands that there's going to be content inside this component that it should also parse and render, et cetera. That's just a convention that it uses. Here's where the interesting things start to happen. When this component's initialized, we're calling the JavaScript runtime, invoking it asynchronously, and we're asking it to call this load method 
with a parameter which is just the name of the health model. If we go back to our state management JavaScript, state manager is sort of the namespace we've created. It's an object on the global window. And load is the function that just returns the value from storage. That's all this is doing is grabbing it. Now, there's a reason why I have this in a try catch block, and I'm catching invalid operation exception. Client side Blazor, this is going to work every time. Once that component's initialized, it'll call JavaScript, it'll pull from local storage, we're good to go. On server side Blazor, the rendering process is two step. There's a server side render that gets everything ready and emits the HTML to the client. Then there's another client side path that takes care of anything that needs that HTML DOM to be active. I'm catching this so that on the server side render when JavaScript's not available, when it throws that exception, I just say that's fine. We'll, we'll catch it on the client side. On the client side, this will go through. If we get that deserialized value, we deserialize it using the built-in JSON serializer. So we're just deserializing the health model. And if we get that deserialized value, we set this flag and we move the values over. So we've got this copy. Remember this, the view model variable is what I deserialized up here. The model with capital M is the view model being used throughout my application. So I'm moving it from what I deserialized over. The reason why I'm using this flag is because of what happens down here. When the model property changes, if it's deserializing, we return. Otherwise, we serialize it to storage. Basically, what this does is it says, anytime some property on the view model mutates, update the copy that we have in the cache. Now, this will happen anytime something changes, but you can set your preferences how you want. For example, if you want a batch update, if you want to capture a few changes, or even wait for a period of time, however you want to handle this. In my case, anytime it changes, I'm serializing it out. If I did this without the flag, just updating the model would get us into an endless loop because I would deserialize, I would update it to the model that would trigger a property change, the property change would serialize it, and we'd go back and forth. So I have this flag so it knows that, hey, I'm taking care of moving it from storage now you're fine, otherwise capture those changes. Now this is one component. Again, all this component does is it interrupts with JavaScript to serialize that JSON and it taps into that property change notification. If we look at the way we pull it into our application, again, something I love about Blazor, the way components work, is if we look at our server local, we have app.razor. This is where our router exists, and we just wrap the router in that storage helper. Just one place in the application, now it's automatically handled throughout the application for us. I don't have to do any other changes to code. Interestingly enough, if we come to our client-side project, and we look at app.razor, you're going to see the exact same. So I'm using the component from a shared library the exact same way to manage that state. The only other caveat I'll share before I move on to another method is obviously this is taking place in plain text. If you have sensitive information, then you're going to want to take some extra steps, either store it on the server, which we're going to talk about next, or encrypt it. Fortunately, there are a few ways that you can encrypt this. There is a data protection services package that you can bring into your application that's provided by Microsoft that you can use to encrypt and decrypt data. So if you have sensitive data, want to protect it one layer, there's a fairly straightforward API to do that. However, there's also a Blazor component that's in experimental preview right now, but it's a Blazor storage component that wraps all of this functionality for you and does the encryption and decryption. So that's another option that you can look into as well. And all of this documentation is available on the GitHub repo, by the way. So I'm going to step out of this and talk about server-side persistence.
Now, when we look at server-side persistence, this should not be unfamiliar. This is a typical interior application, and the model that we follow a lot of times in the web is we have our client that's running inside of the browser, and it's using APIs to reach out to a server, and that server is managing information. It might be using a SQL database, a NoSQL database, Cosmos DB, Azure SQL, whatever that is, that's being handled and marshaled back and forth by an API. We're used to writing applications that have very explicit interactions with APIs so that I click the save button and it's explicitly going out calling a save API. But there's no reason why we can't automate that to manage our state as well. What I'm going to do is jump into this. Now, I've already demonstrated that this will work consistently for server-side and client-side, so I'm just going to use the client model. What I did here is I created a project that's a, a Blazor WebAssembly project. But in this case, I ticked that little box that said ASP.NET Core Hosted. So what it did is it created the, st the project that creates the static assets for the Blazor client, but it also created a host so that I can stand up APIs and controllers. And in this host, I happen to have a state controller. The state controller is where you would do something like use a Redis cache or use SQL or use NoSQL or whatever persistence mechanism of your choice. In my case, to keep the demo simple, I'm just storing it in memory. I have a static dictionary. I'm not doing any you know, concurrent dictionary or anything like that. There's a lot of practices for production that you would want to look into. But to keep the demo simple, this exposes a Git endpoint. And the Git endpoint is I'm cheating a little bit and just getting the IP address that the Git's coming from and returning the model from the cache. And then there's a post of a view model that stores it in the cache. I'm using the IP address because I don't have any authentication wrapped around this project, again, to keep it simple. You would probably have a user login, authenticate, and you would be using that user ID or information as a key to store this. But this is as straightforward as we can get on a controller. On this endpoint, I can post a view model to it, and I can get a view model from it. Again, in my shared project, so I can reuse the code across Blazor projects, even if they're server-side or client-side, I created a state service. This state service gets a copy of the view model. This time I'm using constructor injection instead of property injection. It's getting a view model. It's getting this state service config option, and it's getting a copy of the HTTP client. Why would I inject the HTTP client? This is an important step if we're using the HTTP client in Blazor WebAssembly. There's a special configured version of the client that understands how to work inside the browser sandbox. You never want a new uh, HTTP client in client-side Blazor WebAssembly. You want to have that injected so you get the appropriate copy. On the server side, I'm assuming it just injects a, a fresh copy of the HTTP client. What we're doing is we're saving those values, and once again, because I'm using the MVVM pattern, I'm plugging into property change notification. If you were to use some other tool like Redux, Redux for state management, you would plug into your actions in Redux and do something similar. So there's an approach, there's some hook that happens when the state mutates, and that's what you plug into. I'm exposing this initialization method that's calling the endpoint. This is just using the HTTP client, saying get that endpoint with a URL that's passed in through configuration, deserializing it, moving it over. And then on the property change notification, it's posting it out. So this is doing a server post instead of a client cache. That's pretty much it for the, the details of, of how this is working. If I go into my project and I look at my startup, what I've done here in my startup is I've implemented this configuration service so I can inject the URL endpoint. Here again, bad practice. I'm hard coding it. You would use whatever configuration approach you want to dynamically pass in what that endpoint's going to be. 
but I need some way to pass that endpoint into the service. And then I'm adding the view model, adding the service configuration, adding the state service. The other thing that I have to do is I'll automatically handle property change notification, but I need to handle that initial load the first time you go into the application. So what I'm doing is in my pages, when I route to a page, when that page is initialized, I'm calling initialize on the service. Let's go ahead and set the server as my startup project. And run this. Okay, so we're in our default. Now I'm going to add in that weight. And I'm going to go ahead and force a refresh. And you can see it populated. I accidentally put 295 instead of 205. And if I force that navigation to results, we get a consistent result in results. And I'm just going to show you one more thing. If I open up my network, and I change a property, you can see it's making these calls to state. It's dynamically posting the update. And then when I refresh, it's calling it back. So that's a way of handling server side. Again, you could throttle it. You could have some checkpoint to save it, et cetera, however you like. So to recap what we covered, we could do nothing and have a, a terrible user experience. We can store it in memory, which is recommended so that your services are consistent. This will last as long as the session or the connection is there. We can do it on the client side with the cache and the storage that's available there. And then we can use the server side, and we have examples for these. All of these examples are in this GitHub repo, github.com, Jeremy Lickness, which is also my Twitter. Blazor State that also has links to the official Microsoft documentation for state management as well as some other tips and tricks for you. So having said that, I think we have a few more minutes left. I'd like to open it up for questions. Hey, Jeremy. Yes, we do have a couple questions that, uh, we're, that um, our viewers have been, putting on, been asking via Twitter. The first question is, I was wondering if Blazor component automatically refreshes when a property is inject an injected service or view model changes, or if we have to subscribe to its property change event and call state has changed? Uh, that's a great question. And that's why I wanted to emphasize that the state management for Blazor, or uh, yeah, the uh, change management for Blazor is opt in, it's not assumed. So if you're using an MVVM pattern, Blazor can make some assumptions. If a property on a component changes, it knows it has to re-render it. But if you're binding to a view model, there's no real way Blazor knows that view model. It doesn't have automatic detection that says it's using property change notification. So that's why I use that base view model to plug into the property change notification and call status change. So there is a way to inherit so that you only have to do that in one place. You don't have to duplicate that code across your components. But you do need some mechanism to tell Blazor that, yes, our data is mutated, and you should update by calling state has changed. Perfect. That's a great answer. So Beth has another question up for us. Let's see. Is it possible to have the app reconnect automatically without requiring the user to reload the page after you make any changes? Uh, right now, I believe that there's a timeout that's set, and then what it's going to do is if the server comes up within that designated period, it's going to auto-reconnect. So if it was just a glitch where a packet was lost or the server was down briefly, but once that timeout expires, it does force a, a manual reload. I suspect that there's an approach. I'm not as familiar with server-side Blazor. Let me add that caveat. I focused mostly on client-side Blazor, but I suspect if there's not something out of the box that there's some code that you can write in JavaScript, for example, that says after a period of time, pull for that connection and try that again. Perfect. That's a good and that's, that's a great answer. Uh, let's, I think we got another one up that up here. Perfect. Are there any current uh, libraries for handling state? I've heard of one called Blazor State. Do you know any, anybody uh, that's creating something that's reusable for people to just kind of plop into their applications? 
the main one that I'm aware of, because I, I believe it's refer, referenced in the Microsoft documentation, is the Blazor state. And the nice thing about that component is it doesn't force you to call JavaScript directly the way that I showed in my simple example. It provides an actual service for state management, and it does have the data protection services built in, so it's handling encryption for you. So that's a great one to look out for. I am not familiar with other out-of-the-box solutions, but it is a, a common problem to solve, so I wouldn't be surprised if they exist. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking the time uh, out of your evening to talk to us. We really appreciate uh, everything you presented for us. Uh, and that's it. Uh, Beth, actually, you want to yeah, showcase actually, something fun I, that we've been I, experiencing. I found a great <laughs> tweet by you, actually. <laughs> so while Javier sets up the next guest, uh, I wanted to show his tweet here. This is exactly what it looks like outside of the building of the studio right now. Um, and we are, <laughs> we are having a lot of speakers actually having to, that would normally be in the studio, may not show up because um, apparently the whole state of Washington shuts down when there's any snow. Um, we did actually even have someone from Philadelphia, Jeff Fritz here, um, and Javier, <laughs> who's basically somewhere in Iowa. I don't exactly know where, but they're very, very used to snow, and they went and picked up the crew today, this morning. So um, at any rate, it, it's, it's, it looks like this here um, today. So, and, and Javier drove me in today, so appreciate it. Anyways, um, so Javier's gonna set up the next guest and uh, just wanted to recap one an announcement that I said before if you missed it. Um, these .NET Confs are, are kind of mini .NET Confs. They focus on a particular topic because um, .NET is such a huge platform of, of many different things you can do with it. So we wanted to start these smaller series of events. Um, um, so this one's on Blazor. The next one is actually going to be on Xamarin. We're going to have Donnet Conf focus on Xamarin on March 23rd. In the meantime, there is actually uh, another event uh, between this on February 24th uh, that Visual Studio for Mac is going to have a mini event called Visual Studio for Mac Refresh. They're going to talk all about Visual Studio for Mac and all the amazing things you can do with that. Um, and it's not just mobile applications. They're going to talk about building cloud native applications with .NET Core and all kinds of great stuff. So, all right, I'm going to kick it back over to uh, the, the crew now. Um, so, uh, or no, to Javier. We're, Wait, yeah, we're gonna have ready. to go to a quick break, break. so okay. we can get Skype going, his set up here and going. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. Hi, I'm Sweeky. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I'm here to talk to you about IoT and .NET Core. This video series will learn how to use .NET Core to control IoT devices. So let's get started. Uh, so we're going to learn how to write apps in C Sharp using .NET and then run them on an IoT device. So let, to get started, let's see what we need. So our basic list of components will be split up into software and hardware. So the software that we need to get started today is Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. You can use either of them. It's completely fine. We'd be writing and building a lot of our code in the command prompt. And we'll be using Docker to run our apps on the Raspberry Pi. For the hardware that we need, our IoT device of choice today is the Raspberry Pi. So of course, you'd need a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we need a keyboard, a mouse, an SD card to load in the Raspbian operating system. Uh, you can get a monitor or a display screen. If you don't have either of those, you can even plug in the Raspberry Pi to your TV, and it'll work just fine. Uh, to make that connection, you'd of course need an HDMI cable. Uh, as part of the sample and demos that we'll work in, you're going to need a breadboard, an LED, a resistor, and connecting wires for the same. We'll be plugging in the Raspberry Pi to our machine. You can also use a regular USB charger to plug in the Raspberry Pi. And for our last advanced section, we'll be using a BME280 sensor, which is a temperature and humidity sensor. Uh, that is all you need to get started for right now. To follow along and see where the code is or everything else that we're working on, you can go on to the .NET GitHub repo. And under the IoT repo, you can see the getting started resources, which includes a list of everything that I just covered and links to more detailed information about all of it. So thanks for listening. So in this video, we learned what is going to be the overall story of this video series. 
You got a list of the software and hardware components that you need to get started. Join us in our next video where we will learn how to set up the Raspberry Pi to get it ready for .NET. And we are back with .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. We had to call in our next speaker, um, Javier Calvaro Nelson, who is speaking all the way from Spain about JavaScript two-way interop. Javier, how's it going today? Hello, good, thank you. How are you? I'm glad to be here. Good. Do you have to deal with snow like we're doing here in Seattle? <laughs> no, not really. It's all sunny here. Perfect. You know, that's, that's what we want to hear. So uh, well, what do you got in store, in, in store for us today? So I'm going to be showing you how to do JS interop and, and how to uh, be successful doing it, like how to solve the most common problems that people run into. Excellent. Take it away, sir. Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Javier Calvaro. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer in Microsoft. Uh, I work on the SP.NET core team, uh, mostly focusing on SP.NET and Blazor. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about JavaScript and uh, .NET interop in Blazor applications. Normally, when we build Blazor applications, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, start sharing. The Skype is new for me. Okay. So can you see my screen? Is that the cl is that the close button? Okay. Perfect. Uh, let me start the presentation. Yep. Uh, so as I said, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, JavaScript and .NET interop in in Blazor applications. Normally, this is not something that uh, we need to do very often. When we uh, work with Blazor, we like to be on the .NET side of things where like, we are happy and productive. But there are some cases in which we need to interrupt with the browser uh, in order to leverage some specific API or to integrate with some third party library uh, that uh, is not yet available in .NET. In many cases, uh, the community has already gone and built uh, a package that is ready for us to use uh, so that we don't actually have to uh, create the functionality ourselves. But in some other cases, we need to, there's nothing else we can do but to write some JS interrupt. So my goal here in this talk is to show you how to uh, interrupt with code running on the browser uh, and how to solve the mo most of the common problems when when doing JS interop. I'm hoping that at the end of this talk, you get a good grasp of on how to use uh, JavaScript interop, uh, and you can be successful at it. So, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to start my first demo. Uh, this is a very demo-heavy uh, presentation, and what I'm going to try to do is we're going to try to build an app that uh, says uh, hello from where you are from. Uh, for example, in my case, I'm, I'm in Spain. So uh, I have already a solution here where I have created some things so that uh, we can go a bit faster. I have this Blazor geolocation file, which is where we're going to put, we're gonna, where we are going to be putting our JavaScript code. I have this CD greeter uh, component, which is going to display hello from uh, my city and it's going to use. JS interop and the geolocation APIs to get your coordinates and based on that get the city you are uh, you are like visiting the page from, and then uh, I have a, a geolocation a location mapping service that I'm gonna use to map the the city to the to the specific coordinates. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this city greeter controller component. Sorry. And uh, we start uh, by simply displaying hello from my city. From. And we don't have a city yet, so we're going to create a property to hold that. And now uh, we're ready to start using JS Interop to actually get the, the location coordinates and to translate that into into city. In order to do that, 
we're going to override the uninitialized method, and I'm going to just paste the code here. And we are going to inject uh, the IJS runtime service, which is the service that we use to interrupt with JavaScript. So we're also going to need the location mapping service, which is, as I said, a service that I created to map the coordinates to a city. And with that, unless I've typed anything wrong, which I haven't, then we should be golden. So if I run my app now, and Visual Studio is taking some time, we are going to see uh, that it shows uh, it asks us for the for the location. Um, it's launching. Okay, so it says hello from somewhere. Uh, so we did something wrong. <laughs> uh, if uh, yeah, so obviously this is not going to work because we don't have our get location function defined. So the, the next thing we need to do is to actually define that function. And we do that in this placer.geolocation service. I've already registered this file into the, into the host file so that it gets loaded when it loads the app. And now if we reload, hopefully the demo will work. Yeah, there you are. So it says hello from Madrid and the, and the location coordinates. So now I'm closing the app, and I've actually really cheated a bit because I'm not pre-rendering the app. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to pre-render the app and see what happens. So if we pre-render the app and run again, we see a failure. And this is because we're, going, we're trying to use JS interrupt during pre-rendering, which is not something that uh, we can do because there is no JavaScript runtime available at that time. So the best way to do pre-rendering, if, if you are able to, is to instead of overriding on initialize async, do, on after, do it on inside on after render async. So there are a couple of things that we need to do different if we do on after render async. First, we need to check this is first render because on after render async will run every time the component renders. And then we need to explicitly call state has changed to tell Blazor that something has changed since the UI needs to be re-rendered. Uh, if, if we didn't do this, we would end up with an infinite loop of rendering, which is not something that we want. So now we can rerun the app. And uh, there we go. Hello from Madrid again. Now, this is how we do uh, JS interrupt from .NET to JavaScript. The most important thing is that the function that you create needs to be available in the global scope, uh, so in the window, essentially. And what we're going to do next is we're going to uh, do it the other way around. We're going to call .NET code from JavaScript code. Uh, in order to do that, uh, what we're going to do is we are going to change, to simulate a location change and an event that JavaScript is going to trigger that we call a .NET method to update the location. For that, we're going to create a button here that simulates the location change. And then we're going to add a couple of methods to handle the location update. So this update location method will will uh, take care uh, take new coordinates and will update will find the new city and and will update the the location. And then this is the handler for the button. Then we need to we're gonna change our our location. We're gonna change our JavaScript interrupt code to use a location service that we're going to inject in a few seconds. And that is going to take care of doing all the JS interrupt for us. It's, it's a good pattern to 
encapsulate all your JS interrupt code in a class, and that way you only have to look for it in in one place. Uh, so let's inject uh, this. Uh, well, we have to create the geolocation service, so let's do that first. I have the geolocation service ready here. I'm gonna copy it, paste it, and I'm gonna give you an ID. I'm gonna give you a rundown of what it does. So it injects the run the JS runtime. Uh, it defines an event position change. As you can see, we're using statics. Uh, this is not the recommended way to do this. Uh, I just want to show it to you for simplicity. Uh, but there are better ways that we're going to see later on uh, that you can use to do this. Then we have uh, this location uh, change static method, which is the method that JavaScript is going to call. If you can see, there is this JS invocable method that tells us that this is a, a method that is accessible uh, from JavaScript. And then here is the old get coordinates method that we saw a few seconds ago that simply wraps the, the original method that we had in the, in the component. So uh, with that, we simply need to uh, bring in the geolocation service. And uh, one last step is to register it in startup. So I have it here. Now, if I run the application again, we're going to see the same thing. We're going to see the button up. We're going to see hello from Madrid. And when we hit this change location, uh, nothing is going to work because we forgot to do the, the JavaScript side of things. So we need to actually implement those, uh, those two functions. And we're just going to add them here. And there are two simple uh, functions. One is notify location changes that will use this .NET object that is available for you when you're using Blazor. And invoke async will will do the the call to the .NET API, and the arguments for it are the assembly name and the and the method name, uh, in the, and then any any parameters that you want to pass. Uh, in this case, the the name needs to be unique across assemblies, uh, across your, in, within your assembly. Sorry. And then the simulate location change simply grabs a bunch of random uh, latitude and longitudes and then notifies of the changes. Uh, now, if we run the app, we'll see that it actually changes from Madrid to Barcelona. So that's it for my first demo. Uh, I'm going to go back to the, to the slides for a second. Uh, let me. See if I do this correctly. Yes. Then the main the main points is the main points we can take from here is it's very easy to use JS interrupt to call JavaScript from .NET. The best place to do it, if possible, is to do it inside on after render async, and that's because that's where we know uh, JavaScript interrupt is going to be available, especially if we want to support pre-rendering, and then we can call static methods. Uh, from JavaScript, but there are better ways to do it. Finally, uh, while I wrote my own library here, uh, there are many libraries in the community or, the, or libraries that the community has built to do this. So you don't have to be writing your own. This is, this is for the case where nothing else is there. So with that, uh, I'm going to move on to my next demo. Uh, my next demo is about uh, how to upload files uh, into your uh, application. So uh, there are many cases in which uh, we need to use JS interop to do something uh, like this, and there is no obvious way. If you, for example, need to upload a 10 megabyte file, how do you do it? So we're, in the next demo, we're going to build a small application that handles uh, the upload of pictures and shows them in the, in the main page. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to use JS interop to grab the contents from a file input, break it into uh, eight kilobyte chunks, um, base64 encode them, and send them all the way to the server where they will be collected. And once the, the, all the chunks are collected, we will be able to take some action on it. 
So with that, I'm going to go back to Visual Studio. So I already have a solution set up in a similar way. Uh, I have a JS file where I'm going to put all my JS interrupt code. I have an input file component that is going to handle uh, the file uploading process. Uh, I have a, a file uploader class that is going to implement all the small details about uh, doing JS interrupt with the client. Uh, and then I have an upload page that is going to offer me the chance to upload the page, upload, upload the image and display a result. So with that, let's go and start creating this thing. Let's go to the upload page first. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a label. And we're going to define an input file component that is going to take in a name for the name of the underlying input. And, uh, and, and it's going to define an event on file uploaded that will fire once the upload is complete and the, and the, upload can, and the file can be consumed. We're going to put that in upload. We're going to inject a repository to handle the saving the file. And then we're going to have a bit of code to handle the UI. So that's our UI code. If there is no result, we don't display anything. If the file was uploaded successfully, we will, we will display success. Otherwise, we will display failure. Uh, finally, we need to add the code to implement the actual logic. So we define the field for the result. And we define the save file uh, method that simply calls the repository to save it. If everything goes well, it says success. If something goes wrong, it says uh, failure. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to look at implementing the input file. So to implement the input file, we're going to start by creating an input field. And we're going to hold a, a reference to, to the field that we'll add in a few, in a few seconds. We're going to mark it as input type field. And we're going to take in two parameters, the name and the, and we're going to take two parameters, the name. And then we're also going to subscribe to the unchanged event, which is what is going to trigger the, the upload. So we are going to be implementing iDisposable, and we are going to inject the JS runtime. The next thing is to define the parameters that we describe in the in the page. So the parameters are here. Let me close this. Now uh, we need to define a couple of uh, fields. The, the first field uh, is a file uploader, which is a class that we'll create uh, in a few minutes uh, that will handle all the low-level details of uh, doing the JS interrupt, uh, handling of the chunks, and like firing an event once everything is done. Then we are going to override on after render async. And on the first time, we're, we're going to initialize this file uploader. We're going to subscribe to the upload completed event. And then we are going to initialize the the component. So I'm going to very quickly copy the rest of the code here. So these are just helpers. So on upload completed, we'll simply fire the event callback that, that our input component has. The start upload will check if, if we can receive a file at this moment, and we'll uh, instruct the JSI that it can start sending the file. And then uh, we want to implement this post because we're going to be handling uh, server resources like memory and things like that. And we want to get rid of those resources uh, if the user cancels the upload or moves to a separate page or something like that. So it's, it's a good idea to implement it as possible and make sure we free uh, up all the resources that, that we create. So now, we're going to go into implementing the file uploader. 
So I'm going to go here to this file uploader. I'm going to paste a bunch of code they already wrote. And uh, we're going to skip through the fields for a second. We're going to focus on the, on the methods. First of all, uh, we inject, uh, the, we receive the JS runtime, which we need to do JS interop. Then the, in the next line, we, do, we use this .NET object reference.create and pass a, a pointer to ourselves, which essentially what this does is it creates an object that we can pass uh, to the JavaScript side and that makes the object uh, visible to the, to the JavaScript side. So this way, the object can invoke uh, JS, invoca JS invocable instance method on this object. Then we define an event for when the upload has been completed. And we implement the methods uh, that we define uh, or that we were using in the input file component. So we have this initialize uh, async, which takes care of initializing the underlying JavaScript. And it passes down uh, the upload field, which is uh, an element reference to the element on the page, to the HTML element on the page that we're using. And it passes a reference to it passes the .NET object reference to this file uploader so that the JavaScript side of things can upload the file. Then this method simply returns an uploader reference, which is a way to keep track of an object in the, in the JavaScript side of things. This is just a, a number that we created. Then we have this can receive a method that is just a helper to know when we are able to receive a, a JS interop. I, when we are able to receive a new file. And finally, we have this begin receive file or begin receiving file that notifies the JavaScript side of things that we're ready to, to receive a file. Uh, and it uh, passes the uploader reference. Then uh, it re that returns uh, a file details. So file details is a very simple object which is just a name and a number of segments. So if we have, for example, a 16K, a 18K file, it's going to be an 8K segment, an 8K segment, and a 2K segment. Then the, the main method for receiving the data is this receive segment. And what we're doing in this receive segment is using some of the, of the new memory low-level APIs. To get to get a shared buffer of a given size, we are sending all the all the data base64 encoded. So we base64 decoded. Then we add it to the to the list of segments that we're keeping track of. And once all the segments uh, are collected, we create a new stream, which is uh, as it's this chunk stream class. I've created it myself. It simply exposes all the all the individual regions of memory as a as a uniform stream and then it calls the it fires the upload completed event with this file descriptor and and it can be consumed and then we implement this post so that in case something happens like someone uh, navigates to another page or something like that we can free all these all these precious uh, memory resources. So that's it for the file uploader. Now we need to implement the JavaScript side of things. And to do that, we are going to go to blazor.fileupload. And we're going to start by creating an initialized method. So this initialized method gets called by the file uploader, and it will receive the field that it needs to uh, watch and the, and the reference to the uploader. So this is the .NET object reference that we passed before, and this is the HTML element reference that is an element that we pass uh, when we initialize the field. We simply create an identifier for this, and we store all of them in a map. So you can imagine if you were to have multiple file upload uh, multiple input file uh, components, you would do something like this. 
you simply store them in a map or, or in an array or something like that and return an identifier to the server so that it can uniquely identify each one of the of the elements. Then we need to implement the only function that the server ever calls on the JavaScript side, which is begin sending file. And this begin sending file receives the identifier and simply searches for the uploader. That's why we use the, the uploader reference. And once it finds it, it calls begin send file. So on the JavaScript side, we have this file uploader class, which I have here. And this file uploader class, again, receives the field, receives the uploader. It sets everything up as fields. Then what it does when it receives a call to begin send file, it uses the field to find the list of files and then finds the finds the file name and the number of segments and then uses set timeout to start the file upload after it has returned so this is a small trick that we use because we cannot start uploading the file right away we tell the browser start uh, run this code immediately when you're free essentially this is what this means uh, and this send file is the method that takes care of of uploading the file then we return the name, we return the number of segments so that the file uploader is happy on the server side. And then in our send file method, we simply keep an index of the bytes that we have sent to the server. And while the number of bytes is less than the file size, we create a base64 encoded chunk. And we use this file uploader here to call the receive segment method on the on the base64 with the base64 chunk then i have a bunch of like helper methods here that simply will handle like figuring sizes and and base64 encoding and all that so if we go back to our file uploader we'll see that this receive segment receives the base64 encoded the code it, uh, and when everything is done it fires the event so we should be ready to save everything and run the application. And the first thing we're going to see when we run the application is we're going to see an image with the Blazor logo. And then we're going to try and upload our own image. Okay, so here's our Blazor logo. If we hit the upload button, we see our component. We can choose a file. I'm gonna choose my picture. And it says the file was uploaded correctly. If we go to the home, we can see the, the image. So that's how you do large file uploads in the using, using JS Interrupt. So I'm gonna go back to my slides for a second. So the main things we, we need to take away from here is that we can write JS in, we can write components that use JS interrupt to leverage browser specific APIs. In this case, for example, the the file APIs to grab the the file contents. We can use .NET object reference to hold on to state on the .NET side of things. And that's important because we don't want to have any solution that relies on statics and that might that might cause the that might cause server side blazor to share status state between between different users which is not something that we want then uh, finally as a reminder we should take care of disposing resources when we use js interop and we need to handle this carefully because if we fail to do this we can get into a pretty serious memory leak. So 
that's all for for doing something of a more complex JS interop. Uh, for my last demo, I want to show you something a bit more real, uh, which is the spa authentication. So what I did is I grab the support that we have for, for authentication on SPAS for the React Angular template. And then I went ahead and implemented it myself uh, for Blazor and using JS Interrupt. So that's what I'm going to show you next. So in this demo, there's not going to be live coding. Uh, I'm going to give you an idea of uh, how I implemented this. I started from the from the base React template that has a, an authorized service and a login and a logout component and a login menu. Uh, I I converted these components to be uh, uh, to be equivalent in in the Blazor side of things, and I put everything into into a into a Razor class library that I call Microsoft SPNet Core API authorization Blazor. So this has uh, it has this, uh, uh, this authentication based component that essentially handles logging and logout on the on the same component. So I combine those two. Then this authorized service is here in this authentication service. And I essentially took the JS code from the React template, added a couple of helper methods to make my life easier, and I was good to go. Then uh, I wrap all the calls to, to the JS interop layer into this API, authorization, API, API authorization authentication service. Uh, as you can see, I'm great at names. Uh, and all the, all the JS interop is, is handled inside, the, inside here. Then on the app side, I simply have a reference to the, to the project. And then I declare my own authentication controller to handle the, the authentication. So I also have a redirect to login controller that takes care of redirecting to the to the login path when the when a user is not authorized. And uh, I have the login display that takes care of showing the the user identity. So I'm gonna run the app. Sorry, I started debugging and it doesn't like it when I do debugging. Um, just I have all the settings to debug into the framework. OK, so we're here. We can log in. Just checking the login state. As you can see here, we are going to the author endpoint. I'm logged in and I'm authenticated. I can go to the user. I can see my access token, the claims in the token, the claims in the user. I can log out. And if I hit an authorized endpoint like fetch data, it automatically detects that I don't have the right scope and sends me back to the, to the login endpoint where I can log in again. and sends me back to where I was and displays the data. So that's full auth support in the same way that we have in the using identity server in the same way that we have for the React and SPA templates. And I built all of this in a day, I think, using, using JS interop and leveraging all the code from third party libraries that, that was already there. So most of the most of the implementation is here in this a API authentication service that simply has a bunch of method calls to, to JS interop. And you can see that I can be very uh, uh, smart or, or very uh, complex 
that is not that I don't have. I can write generics. I can I can use all those type of things. Um, then I have a method here that gets the gets the claims principle, and all of this is is piped through this authentication service. And if we see the authentication service, we're gonna compare it to the React version, which is this authorized service here. We can see that besides uh, a few things here like the imports and all the stuff, they are they are pretty much the same. You can see this is authenticated, get user. And they are literally uh, the same the same code. The main things this uh, authentication service have are actually at the bottom of the file where I simply created a class to hold on to all my on my state and to initialize it once. And what we do in the in the app, which is the parent that I like to follow, is the main class has an equivalent JavaScript side of things. It has a static a set of static methods that makes it easy to call. And we simply have an init method that initializes this a singleton. And and then helper methods that make it trivial to call the the JavaScript side of things. And then I, I piped a bunch of like random helpers here to do small things. So for example, I didn't want to write my own query parsing logic. And there is this URL URL search params class in, in JavaScript that you can use. So three lines of code and I didn't have to bring in a .NET library or uh, or uh, write my own parsing code essentially. So that's the end of my demos. I'm gonna back I'm gonna go back to the to the slides. So the the main things that I and that I want you to take away from here is that it's very easy to convert third party solutions to Blazor by leveraging JS interop. Uh, we can call browser APIs directly or, or leverage built in behavior. That's another good use case if we don't want to use a library, for example, like I did uh, just now. Uh, and we can encapsulate all the all the JS interop uh, code into a small portion of our app. It's not something that uh, creeps up uh, through all our components and elements. We can isolate it into a very small portion, or even better, use a library of one of the many libraries that that are out there. Um, so with that. I want to say thank you and share with you uh, a few final thoughts. Uh, we've seen how to use JS Interop to leverage browser APIs and, and third-party libraries. We've seen how to handle site uh, when doing JS Interop. We've seen how to support pre-rendering uh, and other scenarios by, by using JS Interop inside on after render. Uh, we've seen how to parse large amounts of data. And the most important thing to take away is that there's people that has already written these libraries for you so that you don't have to. So uh, with that, uh, I hand it back to you. Hey, Javier, thank you so much for the great presentations. We do have some questions on Twitter. Unfortunately, we are out of time for you to answer them live right now. So if you can hop on Twitter and look at the .NET, uh, hashtag .NET conf and look at those questions, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, we're going to go into a quick commercial break so we can get Eagle Hansen, who is going to be talking about testing um, all the way from Iceland. So we'll be right back with .NET Conf Focus on, Fla on Blazor. Hi, I'm Sweeky. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I'm here to talk to you about IoT and .NET Core. This video series will learn how to use .NET Core to control IoT devices. So let's get started. Uh, so we're going to learn how to write apps in C Sharp using .NET and then run them on an IoT device. So let, to get started, let's see what we need. So our basic list of components will be split up into software and hardware. So the software that we need to get started today is Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. You can use either of them. It's completely fine. We'd be writing and building a lot of our code in the command prompt. And we'll be using Docker to run our apps on the Raspberry Pi. For the hardware that we need, our IoT device of choice today is the Raspberry Pi. So of course, you'd need a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we need a keyboard, a mouse, 
an SD card to load in the Raspbian operating system. Uh, you can get a monitor or a display screen. If you don't have either of those, you can even plug in the Raspberry Pi to your TV and it'll work just fine. Uh, to make that connection, you'd of course need an HDMI cable. Uh, as part of the sample and demos that we'll work in, you're gonna need a breadboard, an LED, a resistor, and connecting wires for the same. We'll be plugging in the Raspberry Pi to our machine. You can also use a regular USB charger to plug in the Raspberry Pi. And for our last advanced section, we'll be using a BME280 sensor, which is a temperature and humidity sensor. Uh, that is all you need to get started for right now. To follow along and see where the code is or everything else that we're working on, you can go on to the .NET GitHub repo and under the IoT repo, you can see the Getting Started resources, which includes a list of everything that I just covered and links to more detailed information about all of it. So thanks for listening. So in this video, we learned what is going to be the overall story of this video series. You got a list of the software and hardware components that you need to get started. Join us in our next video where we will learn how to set up the Raspberry Pi to get it ready for .NET. Hey everybody, we are back with .NET Conf Focus on Blazor Day. Uh, I have Igor Hansen, who's all the way from Iceland, talking to us about testing components in Blazor. Uh, what do you got in store for us today, Igor? Yes, well, exactly that. I'm going to talk about testing Blazor components. So I'm going to expand on what uh, what Steve's, uh, Steve said earlier, hopefully, and uh, give some insights as well, hopefully. Perfect. Take it away. Yes, let me go ahead and share my screen. And this looks like the right button. Mm -hmm. And presentation, like this. And I think that's it, right? OK. So uh, like you said, Xavier, my name is Egil Hansen, and I'm a managing architect in Net Company. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Egil Hansen. So I'm calling in from Iceland, and uh, you might have a little bit of snow up there, but I have quite a lot, so it's even started snowing in my slice, as you can see. Hopefully, that'll be okay for everybody. Uh, no jokes aside. Uh, this uh, session is about testing basic components, so let's get started. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the basis, basics of testing basic components. Secondly, I'm going to show you different styles we can use when testing our components. Then I will show you how to interact with the component under test. And finally, we will look at different verification strategies available to us. This session will not cover the basics of Blazor, nor how to build uh, custom components in Blazor. So if you are new to Blazor, you might want to watch some of the other sessions first. I also won't be talking about unit tests in general or test development. So um, with that out of the way, uh, this session is based on my uh, testing library for Blazor components, which is available on Nougat and GitHub. The primary goal of the library is, is to make it easy uh, to build stable and maintainable tests in Blazor components for Blazor components. The library itself builds on top of other great libraries and frameworks. Uh, these include XUnit, AngleSharp, my own AngleSharp diffing library, and of course, Blazor. Uh, it also incorporates Steve Sanderson's testing prototype uh, that he published last fall. So big thanks to Steve for taking the time to create that prototype. It helped me add a bunch of uh, features I was missing in the earlier versions of the library. Uh, also thanks to all the community members uh, who have been providing input since the beginning and continue to do so. Um, and uh, all the samples I'll show today, as well as documentation, plus many more samples, uh, is available in the GitHub repository uh, at this URL on screen right now. OK, so with that out of the way, let's get started with the first topic. Uh, let's start by quickly talking about what it means to test a Blazor component. So you will need a way to provide input uh, in a Blazor-centric way to the component. Uh, that means you know pro providing input to the component. and injecting any services it, 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 it depends on. You also need a way to trigger uh, or invoke the component's lifecycle methods and render tree logic. And last but not least, you need to uh, need a way to verify the output of the component, uh, mostly uh, expecting the markup uh, generated. So this might not be a surprise, and, and you might be thinking, so yes, yes, Eagle, of course, that makes a lot of sense, but why do we need a testing library for that? Uh, you could have asked, uh, why can't I just new up uh, my component under test and use the regular frameworks I'm used to, like XUnit or MS test or NUnit, to test that with? Uh, so the main problem with that is that uh, a component doesn't know how to render uh, output. 
and there's a clear separation of concerns in Blazor, and components need a renderer to produce markup. The Blazor framework also ensures that the component lifecycle methods and re-renders happens at the expected moments. Uh, so my library helps with that, uh, and, and through a couple of abstractions we'll look at now. So the first abstraction is uh, the test context. It allows us to register any service we want to pass uh, to the component on the test, and it allows us to render a component or a fragment. So if we want to render a component, we first register any service it might need, for example, the JS runtime, and then we ask the test context uh, to render it uh, with any parameters we want to pass to it. The result of this is a rendered component or a rendered fragment. A rendered fragment is a rendered, sorry, a rendered component is a rendered fragment, meaning that all the things a rendered fragment can do, so can the rendered component. So uh, the rendered fragment gives us access to the rendered markup as a raw string, or as DOM nodes. The DOM nodes are provided uh, by the Angle Sharp library, which is a complete implementation of the HTML5, HTML5 DOM API. So that means you have access to all the APIs for working with DOM nodes that you know from the browser and uh, JavaScript. There are also two helper methods for querying the DOM nodes, find and find all, uh, which, which both takes a CSS selector as input and return uh, DOM elements. The, uh, through the DOM elements, uh, we get a convenient way to trigger any event handlers uh, that are bound to the DOM elements, uh, for example, the onclick event. Doing so uh, will trigger the C sharp method that is bound to the event, and a re-render happens afterwards, as you would expect. The render component gives us access to uh, the component instance from where we can expect public properties and uh, invoke public methods. You can also uh, render the component again uh, and uh, with new parameters if you wish to do so. So uh, there are a few other things we can do with these free abstractions, uh, but uh, these are the basics. Uh, with that out of the way, let's, uh, let's look at the different testing styles supported by the library. So the primary difference between the testing styles uh, is how we create the component under test and any HTML uh, fragments we uh, might need in our tests. Uh, the first style we'll look at is the C Sharp based testing style. Uh, it's uh, basically the same thing as Steve showed earlier. Uh, my library does it a little bit different, but uh, you should basically see the same, uh, same concepts and patterns here. So uh, let's look at a few uh, pros and cons with this style. Uh, on the plus side, in this style, everything is written in C Sharp. Uh, it is, in other words, just a regular X unit test you will be, be creating, uh, like, the, like the one you see here on the slide. Uh, so everything should feel familiar to you uh, if you do that. Uh, you are required to inherit from the component test fixture type, uh, which is a test text context like we talked about in the previous section. It also has a bunch of helper methods that will, helper methods that will make it easy, uh, easier to provide input to the component under test. So uh, on the minus side, even with the helpers, uh, if you have a component that takes a lot of uh, parameters, the code used to render the component can become quite complex and unwieldy, especially if you they also have to pass a child component, uh, which also takes a bunch of parameters as input. And, uh, and writing HTML markup in strings in C-sharp is, is also not ideal, although uh, string interpolation does make it a, a bit easier. So <clears throat> an alternative to this is uh, what I call razor-based testing. Um, and uh, the upside with this style is that uh, all your component and markup declarations happens, happens inside the fixture component. Um, uh, in Razor syntax, so uh, that is much more a um, much more natural way to declare your components and pass parameters to them. In the Razor test files, you are required to inherit from the test component base type. Uh, it is a text uh, context uh, and has helper methods for getting the component on a test and any fragment we define in the fixture. When the test runs, uh, the setup method and test methods uh, pass to the fixture. Uh, are called, uh, and we can use C# for interacting with the component on the test and verifying its output inside the test method. The test runner in Visual Studio and the console will uh, run these tests just like your normal unit test. It is, however, not uh, able to distinguish individual tests within the same Razor file yet. Uh, that's something I have a good idea of how to fix, but it's it's not pro a priority right now. So. 
uh, this is still experimental, uh, and since this is a new way of working with CIST, I, I consider this experimental and reserve sort of the right to change the syntax around a bit to get the best possible developer experience. Uh, and if you have any input or feedback uh, on how this should work uh, and, and could work better, uh, please uh, come and share that. The third style available to us is what I call snaps snapshot uh, testing. Like with the razor-based tests, snapshots uh, tests are written in razor files, and you are also required to inherit from the test uh, component base type in this style. Uh, those of you familiar with the Jest JavaScript testing framework uh, will probably see some similarities to this. Uh, a snapshot test basically consists of two parts, a uh, test input and an expected output. Uh, and uh, when the test runs, it will automatically compare the rendered result of uh, results of, of, of both and and using uh, using a semantic HTML comparison. Um, uh, this style is also experimental, uh, so a few key features are missing to support proper uh, snapshot testing. For example, automatic uh, expected uh, output generation and uh, the same limitation uh, that we had with the test runner uh, in razor-based testing uh, is also a, uh, also a, an issue here. So, uh, with that out of the way, let's look at a few examples. Um, right now, I'm going to start by focusing on C-sharp and razor-based tests, and we'll get back to uh, snapshot tests later. Uh, our component on the test uh, for the examples will be the bootstrap alert component, like the one we see here on the slide. It has a bunch of features uh, that will allow us to see various parts of the testing library in action. Uh, it allows us to pass header text and any child content into it as we wish. It allows us to uh, dismiss it by clicking on the X at the top right corner or through the dismiss method on an instance of the alert component. It uses CSS animation uh, to fade the alert away when, when it's, it's, it's dismissed. And after the dismiss animation is done, all the markup will be removed from the DOM. Um, we can pass in a text localizer uh, to, to it uh, through a uh, cascading value uh, that, uh, that it can use to localize the header text. Uh, it'll also trigger event callbacks before and after it is dismissed. And finally, it uses uh, the JavaScript interrupt to read how long the dismiss CSS animation takes to run in the browser so that the markup is not removed uh, before the animation is done. Uh, and just to uh, show you a brief demo of what we are going to test, we have it down here in my in my uh, browser, uh, and it's sort of the standard testing sample app we have. Uh, and you can see if I um, click the uh, button up here, you will see down here in the alert status section that will first show that it's, it's dismissing, and after a little while, it will show it, that it's dismissed, and then it will be removed from the DOM. So you'll see the sort of uh, hello.netconf will jump up. Uh, so let's go, and here it comes. If we quickly go back, we can also see we can click the Dismiss Alert button, which is an external thing to the alert component, and it'll do the same thing again. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, try and test this. Now, in the interest of time uh, and not having to watch me type in Visual Studio, we'll switch to my very special version of Visual Studio. We can call it um, the Power Visual Point Studio, where typos and compiler errors are a thing of the past. Uh, so we'll start with a uh, with a razor-based test where, the, where we typically pass in all the parameters and input that uh, we can to the, race, uh, to the alert component using the razor syntax. So this should seem familiar to, do, to you if you are used to Blazor. So first, in our razor file, we start uh, by inheriting uh, from test component base. Then at the top level, uh, we, fir we have our fixture component which, uh, uh, in which we declare the component under test component. The child content of the component on the test component is what will be rendered and passed uh, to the test method. Inside that, we declare a cascading value and pass in the localizer, uh, just as we do uh, in regular uh, razor, pa razor pages or components. Then we declare our alert component with its parameters, including uh, a component, uh, the paragraph component, uh, passed into it as its child content. Tests uh, and setup methods are declared below, so let's go and have a look at those. Uh, in the setup method, we just register the mock JS runtime that comes with um, the library. Uh, since the alert component has a dependency on the IJS runtime and cannot be branded without it. Uh, we also add our 
Yoda language uh, alert heading translation to the localizer. So uh, now we're ready to get our component on the test in the test method. This can be done in two ways depending on what you need. Uh, if you only need the functionality of the render fragment abstraction, uh, you call the non-generic version of get component under test. If you need the full functionality of the rendered component abstraction, uh, you can call the generic version of get component under test and pass in alert as the generic argument. Uh, we will look at how uh, to work with the uh, component under test or, or cut for short in a later example. Uh, so now it's time to look at this uh, example in a C-sharp-based test. In our C-sharp-based test, we start by creating a class that inherits from the component test fixture type, uh, and then we create our first test. Inside the test, we start by registering uh, the mock.js runtime in the service collection in the test, uh, test context, like we did in the Razor test. The, this could be moved to a, a test classes constructor if we have more tests that inside the test class that needs this. Um, then we declare a few variables to hold the content we want to pass to our alert component and initialize uh, our localizer. Um, now we are ready to uh, render our components. And this is done uh, by the generic render component method where the generic argument is, is the uh, comp component we want to render. In this case, it's, uh, it's an alert component. The render component method uh, also takes a zero or more parameters as input, which it will pass to the component during the first render. So for regular components, we can simply pass a tuple with a name and a value. So in this case, we are passing the value of the alerts header parameter, header, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the header, the value we want to set to it. Um, this can, be made a big, this can be made more refactor friendly by using the name of operator to capture the parameter's name from the component like so. So uh, this is how I recommend doing it, because even if it's a bit more noisy, because if you ref, re, uh, refactor the name of the header parameters in the load component, then you don't have to go and fix your test afterwards. Okay. So <clears throat> the next thing we want to pass to our load component is the localizer. The alert component receives that through an unnamed cascading value. So to help us do this, uh, we have the cascading value method, which just takes the cascading value as input. Uh, if you need uh, to pass in a name cascading value, uh, the cascading value method has an overload that takes a name as well as the cascading value itself as input. But uh, we don't need this in, in, in this case. Uh, the event callbacks are passed using the event callback helper method. Uh, it takes the name of the callback parameter as the first uh, argument and a func or action delegate as a second argument where the input matches the expected generic type of the event callback parameter. So note that uh, we are also using the name of trick here to make the parameter name a refactor safe. Last, uh, we need to pass in the child content of the alert component. We can do this with the help of the child content method. Uh, in this variant, we are using the generic child content method to pass in a uh, para paragraph component uh, to the alert component as we did in the razor-based test. The generic child content method takes zero or more parameters uh, that, should be passed, uh, uh, that should be passed to the uh, paragraph component when it is rendered. So uh, it is a lot like the render component method in that regard. If we just wanted to pass uh, in some markup or string, there is another child uh, content method that takes a string as input. Uh, but, to keep, but to keep things equal uh, with the razor test, uh, we don't use that in this case. Uh, and just to show you, this is the entire test so far. We will get back to the act and assert steps in a bit. Uh, the C-sharp-based tests can be more compact, uh, but uh, when a component takes so many parameters, then it becomes a little hard to work with. Uh, and I haven't even shown uh, an example of passing in a razor template where we unfortunately uh, have to step into sort of a render builder, render tree builder territory, at least for now. Uh, I'm hoping to build maybe a, a, a some helper methods around that as well. The good thing is that you do not have to pick a star uh, and only use that. All three stars can be used within the same test project, so picking the one best suited for the test at hand is definitely possible. Okay, so now let's talk about how we can interact with our component on the test once we have it. 
uh, we can work with and get the rendered markup in a few ways. Uh, the get nodes method returns the rendered markup as a node list. Uh, the get markup method returns the rendered markup as a raw string. And the find and find all methods can be used to query the DOM nodes. All event bindings available in Razor can be triggered on the DOM elements uh, they are bound to. This, examples, uh, th this example triggers the onclick event handler on a button component or button element. We can also render the component on the test again, uh, causing it to go through the component lifecycle. This can be with or without uh, new parameters. And last but not least, we can expect the component on test instance uh, through the instance property uh, on, on the component on the, on the test. Uh, so this is the basics uh, we need to, to know to, to work with uh, our component on the test. Okay, so with that other way, let's talk about some verification strategies available to us. So picking the right verification strategy is important. Uh, it will increase the likelihood that the test will not break unnecessarily and uh, be able to catch regressions if they happen at a later time. So we do not want our tests to, to break unexpectedly. We want happy diffs. Or as uh, coding, Yoda puts it, unexpectedly breaking tests leads to delays. Delays leads, leads to ang angry managers, and angry managers, well, that leads to tests being deleted or commented out. And we do not want that. So I'm not going to talk about general unit testing verification strategy here, but instead focus on verification of rendered markup. Uh, in this library, the two most common, appro uh, uh, common approaches, approaches to, to is t uh, targeted inspection of markup and performing semantic comparison of it. So let's take a look at each in turn. Okay, so by targeted markup verification, I mean the kind where you find and expect select nodes or elements in the rendered markup. This strategy can uh, lead to quite stable tests as they only break when the specifically target nodes or elements change. Uh, the downside of this uh, is that changes to other parts of the render markup will not be detected. So uh, you can obviously compensate for that by having more tests. Um, another issue to be aware of is that uh, changing indentation or adding light breaks uh, in your razor files can cause uh, text nodes to change even if it is an insignificant change uh, from an HTML point of view. So uh, your test will have to deal with insignificant white space to remain stable. So in this last example here, uh, we are using the trim method to do just that. The alternative approach is uh, the semantic markup comparison, where two pieces of a markup is compared and remain equal if they are semantically the same from an HTML point of view. Uh, this is supported through a library I built on top of AngleSharp called AngleSharp Diffing. The advantage of using this to compare markup is that your tests will be much more stable with regards to insignificant changes. For example, so let's consider uh, these two HTML fragments. Uh, we can change a bunch of things in either of them and they would still be the same when rendered in the browser. Uh, we could, for example, reorder uh, attributes on an element we could remove or add insignificant white space, or we could change the order of CSS classes in the class attribute. So these are just some of the examples of insignificant changes we can make to our rendered markup that doesn't break uh, our test when using the diffing library. Uh, we also get the possibility of doing more complete tests. Uh, we can verify all the rendered markup and thus be sure that only the DOM nodes we expect to have changed are changed. Uh, in the example here on the right, uh, we are using the markup matches method. It allows us to verify the rendered markup from our cuts matches the expected markup string. So uh, you might be thinking, yeah, Eagle, but that's neat, but I don't want to specify the complete markup each time I have uh, to verify some rendered markup. And you would be right, that would indeed not scale very well, and there would be a lot of and if there are any breaking changes, uh, you would probably have to update the expected markup in a lot of places. There are uh, good ways around this. Uh, one example uh, that works today and quite well is this here on the right. So here we ask our already, already rendered uh, cut to re-render with new parameters. Uh, then we call the get changes since first render method, which uh, 
produces a list of different differences between the marker produced during the first render and the second. Uh, that we can then verify only contains one change, and that change should be an addition in this case. So this verification style, uh, the semantic comparison style, can also be too sensitive uh, if you're not careful. Uh, and cause test to test to break when they shouldn't. Usually, because we are verifying more broadly than the test than the test actually intended to do. So there are a few ways to, to get around that. And one way is to, uh, is to customize the diffing method uh, using through special diff uh, modifiers uh, in the expected markup. Uh, expected markup can also sometimes be referred to as control markup. There are uh, many ways. Uh, to modify the diffing logic built into the library, the diffing library. One of the simpler ones are shown here, where the diff ignore attribute tells the differ to ignore the H1 element, its attributes, and any child nodes it might uh, have. The differ is also uh, configured to automatically ignore uh, the special attributes that blazer render the, that the blazer renderer adds to the markup. So, for example, uh, the the, the, the attributes it adds to track referenced elements or the event handler bindings. Uh, the compare uh, pair two method shown here, the last example, so that's another way to, to do the semantic uh, comparison. Uh, and it'll just uh, compare the render markup with some control markup and get and give you a list of differences that you can assert against, like we do here. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just get a cup of my tea here. So with that, Let's look at our exams again and try to interact with the component on the test and, and verify, uh, verify against it. So we are back in, uh, in our razor-based test from before. Uh, uh, in this test, we just want to verify the alert component renders correctly if all parameters are passed to it. Uh, to, make it uh, to make the comparison easier, we add a fragment component uh, to the fixture uh, where we specify the expected output from the alert component. So uh, let's go to our test methods below and see how we can use this. So down here in the test method, in the assert step, uh, we use the get fragment method uh, to get and render the fragment we defined in the fixture above. Then we can use the markup matches semantic comparison method to compare the output uh, from the cut with the expected markup. And that's all that's needed. Uh, now, uh, we have verified that everything is okay, and that's it. So uh, let's look at the C# -sharp version, uh, how that looks in the C# -sharp version. So uh, and this is our C# -sharp version from before. Uh, I've removed some of the um, parameters we didn't need, but otherwise it's the same. Let's scroll down to the search step and add some code here. Uh, so here we basically do the same as we did in the Razor test. The only difference is that we have to write the expected markup as a sharp string with all the fun that comes with that, uh, like escaping the, the, the attributes, for example. And then we just call the markup matches method again, and we are done. So that's quite simple uh, using the semantic comparison. So we haven't looked at any sharps, snapshot test examples yet. Uh, so let's try to write the same test in that. Uh, as with razor-based test, we inherit from the test component-based type in our razor file. Then we add the snapshot component with an inline setup action uh, where the mock.js runtime is, is, is registered. After that, uh, we add the test input component in which we declare the alert component as we did in the razor-based test. So I'm cheating a little bit here and skipping the localize on this example to keep things simple. And finally, in the expected output component, we, uh, uh, we we, we add, the, add the expected markup that we, uh, we expect to, to, uh, to come from the alert component. Uh, and again, that is, that is it. When this test run, it will automatically use the semantic markup differ we talked about earlier to verify that rendered markup from the test input and the expected output uh, are equal. And so let's change gears a little and, and, and try something else. Uh, let's now write a test for the dismiss logic in our alert component. Um, so I have the, uh, the dismiss uh, private dismiss method here from the alert component we can take a look at and, and, and go through and understand what we need to test. So first, uh, when the dismiss button is clicked or the dismiss method on the alert component is called, we invoke and await uh, the undismissing event callback. 
Uh, the event I actually passed to that uh, allowed the callback handler to, to set a cancel flag uh, that should abort the dism dismissal, uh, but we're not going to test that in this test, so, so we're not going to worry about that. Uh, next, uh, the alert component calls and, uh, and awaits the JavaScript function uh, that returns once the CSS dismiss animation is complete. So this prevents the component from removing its DOM elements before the animation is done. And finally, after updating some state, uh, the undismissed event handler is invoked. Uh, so this, uh, this flow is what we want to test. So uh, the test looks like this. Uh, first, we register our uh, JS runtime mock, and then we use the setup method to configure a planned invocation handler for the JavaScript function invocation we are expecting from the alert component. Then we define uh, a dismissing event and dismissed alert variable that should not be null if our event callbacks have been called. With those in place, we can render our alert component and pass in the two event callbacks. Now that we have the alert component, we can use the find method to find the button element, and we trigger the onClick event handler on that. So uh, for our first verica uh, verification, we find the alert element itself, and then, then verify that, this, that its CSS class does not contain the show class, show CSS class anymore. Uh, the show CSS class is what, uh, when it's removed, is what triggers the CSS animation to start. And we, uh, we also verify that the dismiss, dismissing event callback has been triggered by checking that the dismissing event variable is not null anymore. So this is the first part of this d d d the dismiss flow. And uh, now let's verify the second part. So right now, the alert component is asynchronously awaiting uh, for the JS runtime invocation to complete. Uh, since we configured the planned invocation in the arrange step of the test above, we can now provide a result to it, which will cause the JS invocation to return and the alert component to, con uh, to continue its, its work. We do this uh, with the help of the wait for uh, next render method uh, on the test context. This method uh, will execute the action we provide to it and, uh, and wait for the next render to occur. This ensures that the alert component has completed the last part of the dismiss step and has re-rendered before the test continues. Um, this allows us to actually verify uh, the new mark of this as, as we expect. So and now for our last verification, uh, which is uh, to verify that the alert component rendered no markup uh, and the undismissed event callback has was triggered. So that's the full test. Uh, uh, do note that uh, the verification interaction steps here would have been the same if this had been a razor-based test. So uh, the last example I think I have time for today, uh, uh, that shows some of the other verification options available to us. Um, and it is a test of the counter page that comes with a file new Blazor project template. So let me just briefly, I know you've seen it a couple of times today if you've been following the stream, but just to be sure everybody is following along, this is the counter, and when we click the button, uh, the counter increases. Uh, so in this test, we want to <laughs> verify that the counter correctly updates uh, when the button is clicked. So first, we render the, the counter, simple. Then we uh, find the button and we click it, so nothing too exciting yet. Uh, to verify that the counter uh, updates correctly, we use the get changes since first render method. Uh, it uh, returns a list of differences, uh, one uh, which we can use uh, the should have single text, chain, uh, text, text change method on to verify that, that there are only one change and that it is a text change and uh, that the text, text now matches the string we provided to the method. So this is, again, an example of using a semantic comparison where we ensure that there's only one change. Uh, the alternative, uh, we could have done this. Uh, here we just find the P element and get, and get the text content of that. Then we trim away any white space uh, and use the standard assert methods to verify the counter increased. This will also verify that the text has changed as expected, but it will not verify that there are no other, text uh, not no, no other changes in the markup. So, 
And now let's see if the counter behaves ex as expected if we uh, click the, uh, the button again. So first, uh, we use the save snapshot method uh, on the component on the test. It'll, it will save the currently rendered markup from the counter, from the counter component uh, in the test context, um, or in the component on the test. Uh, uh, we can use that later for creating a list of differences. Then uh, we find the button again and click it once more. Uh, so note that we actually have to find the button again since the button returned to us previously has been replaced during the render that uh, was caused by triggering it. So after triggering the button, uh, after click triggering the onclick event handler again, we can now use the get changes since snapshot method uh, to get a list of differences this time between the saved snapshot and the current rendered markup. And again, verify that there are no, there are only one, only a single text change. So, I do realize that I've never actually seen, uh, shown you any of these tests running. So let's jump over to Visual Studio real quick, and I'll just show you uh, that it is indeed working as I promised. So here we have our alert component, and this is the dismiss uh, method we, um, we we tested earlier, and you can see the whole alert component here. I won't go into details about that. Uh, you can find that on the GitHub pages. Uh, and uh, here, the alert razor test, here we have the test we saw before, it's defined here, and here is the test method. There are also a bunch of other tests you can look at um, in, in, uh, in, the, in that test file. Here we have the C-sharp version of the test, and as, again, you can see that's the same markup as we show on the showed on the slide before. And here we have the snapshot test. And the counter uh, test we just saw, uh, it's actually here, uh, and a shorter version where we don't uh, test a second click. And um, let me see if I can get my zoom to work. Uh, that's not it. Well, zoom it. Yes, zoom, okay. So, oh, I guess not. Here we go. Ah, so down here, we have our tests, we have our razor-based test, we have our snapshot tests, and we have uh, our all of our tests. So if we run these, we should hopefully see uh, um, a number of green uh, dots coming back. And it's building and compiling. I hope I didn't mess anything up with my random clicking. Yes, and here we go. And you can see that all the tests ran as they expected. There are actually um, a lot of tests in the in the test solution. Uh, so there's a lot of tests to dig into if you want to see examples. Just in the sample app, there are 31 tests. And uh, so that should be a lot of uh, things to look at. OK, let's get back to the slides. I'll just have to zoom out again. OK. Uh, so. There are a lot more I want to, to talk about, but there are also other great sessions waiting for you, so I'll stop here. Uh, thanks very much for the attention, and uh, we can uh, jump over to some questions now. Yeah, so Igor, thank you so much for the presentation. Unfortunately, again, we are, since we have a live speaker, we're going to have to uh, cut questions short. Um, so, sure. uh, however, we do have questions on Twitter, so if you want to take the time to go answer those. Uh, and, and I encourage everybody out right, right now watching the stream to keep putting the questions on Twitter. We're getting just a little behind with, with the sessions back to back that it makes it difficult to answer them. So thank you so much. I have the next speaker here. Mm -hmm. How's it going? Hi. Good. Hey, how's I'm, it going, Javier? How are you doing? What good. are you going to talk to about talk to us about today? Uh, well, today I've got uh, this project called Experimental Mobile Blazor Bindings, and I'll do some demos of that. Perfect. Let's get started. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elon Lipton, and I'm a principal software engineer. And I work with the .NET team and the Xamarin team here at Microsoft. And in today's session, I'm going to show a project that I've been working on for a little while called Experimental Mobile Blazor Bindings. And this is a project that lets you use Blazor, which is what this whole conference is all about, use Blazor to build native mobile apps. So let's, let's dig into that. So, when we say um, experimental mobile Blazor bindings, what this does is you can use uh, your favorite tools, that's Visual Studio, your favorite languages, that's C Sharp, your favorite platform, that's .NET, and your favorite 
programming model, which is Blazor, and all that to target iOS and Android native mobile apps. So why, why would we do this? Well, today there's already ways to use .NET to build uh, terrific mobile apps uh, with uh, C Sharp. You can use XAML with C Sharp using Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, so you can write your uh, UI all in code without using XAML. Typically, these are used with the model view, view model, MVVM pattern, and that's a pretty familiar model to a lot of folks who are mobile developers. But there's another audience that we'd like to have a more uh, targeted approach for. And so for people with a web background, and Blazor is all about web, we want to offer something new and something that feels a little bit more familiar to people who come from that web background. So if you are a Blazor developer today, I think this could appeal to you. If you're not yet a Blazor developer, but you're watching this conference today or watching this session at some point in the future, high future, um, we think that this is something that could be really interesting to you. So we want to have something that mixes Blazor and native mobile apps, and that's what this project is. But really, why are we doing this? So let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been on the ASP.NET team for, since before it was actually called ASP.NET. So for 17 years I've been, I was on the ASP.NET team. And um, I come from a web background. I worked on update panel and grid controls and data sources and MVC and ASP.NET Core. If it has anything to do with ASP.NET and it came from Microsoft, I probably had something to do with it or you can blame me for any of those things. But coming from that web background, I got really familiar with Blazor. I've used it in production applications, and I wanted to start building mobile apps. And I felt that combining Blazor with all the great work from the Xamarin team for Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, we could really build something cool that would appeal to other people who are web developers. So out of millions of developers who use .NET, we want folks who come from that web and ASP.NET and Blazor background to have something that um, they might find more natural to them. So what does this look like? So uh, a lot of folks know C Sharp and HTML with Blazor. That's, the, that's what we have out there. You can run it on the server with ASP.NET Core. That came out a few months back in uh, .NET Core 3.0. And then a lot of folks I know are excited to run it in the browser with WebAssembly. That's out in preview, and it's going to be uh, released later this year. So you'll have the supported uh, version of that. And this is what that code looks like. You have some uh, HTML tags, like a paragraph tag, a button tag. Uh, you mix your C Sharp and your HTML markup. You've got event handlers, and then some additional code to handle the application state and event handlers and so forth. What does this look like when I'm targeting mobile platforms? Well, I'm not using C Sharp and HTML anymore. With mobile Blazor bindings, I'm using C Sharp and native mobile UI components because I want those to render using the native UI of the device. And then I can run and deploy those either in the emulators or I can run natively on an Android phone or an iOS phone or tablet, of course. What does that code look like? Well, if you compare the left side and the right side, they're pretty gosh similar. So you have your stack layout. That's kind of like a div you can think of in HTML, and then a label and a button. You can guess what those are. And the rest is almost exactly the same. The C Sharp code is exactly the same. It handles a click. It increments a count. And you can go ahead and run that on your Android emulator or iOS simulator or on a physical device, and you get your app. And this is a native app running uh, on Android in this case. So Let's go ahead and actually do that. So these are, uh, we released the code this morning, so you can get go to the GitHub repo. I'll have links to that later in the deck or check Twitter. Um, let's use, uh, you can, I've already installed the templates. You can do this uh, at home as well or at work if you're at work. Uh, .NET new mobile blazer bindings, that's the name of the template. Once you've installed it, check out the instructions online and I'll call this .NET conf demo. And let's take a look at what that created for me. So we see here it's got a solution file, which is great. And then it's got three projects. It's got the shared UI, which we'll spend most of our time in. And then it's got an Android project and an iOS project. So let's open that up in Visual Studio. Uh, you can do this in Visual Studio 2019, the public bits, or in Visual Studio for Mac. It works great as well. And now we've got the solution open. 
So let's dive into these projects. So one thing uh, I want to show is what does this project look like, this shared UI project? So as you can see, it's a mixture of C-sharp, uh, one C-sharp file in this case, and some Razor files. That's exactly what you would expect in any Blazor application, at least the UI portion of that application. And then the rest, it's a pretty boring CS proj file. It uses the Razor SDK. That's how you get all the uh, support for .razor files. Sets the Razor language version, has a few settings. And then here, it's mixing together Xamarin forms for the UI, and then this new project, Mobile Blazor Bindings, to bind Blazor with Xamarin forms. So let's go ahead and launch that. We'll get that running in the emulator while I show, oops. Oh, one thing, of course, I always forget have to set Android as the startup project, or if you want to run it on your uh, iOS device, set the iOS project to be the startup. It's got my Android uh, emulator running here. As you can see, it's a bit chilly in uh, Celsius. That's uh, what, minus, uh, minus two degrees Celsius, if you're uh, not as familiar with our American Fahrenheit's. So while we get that running, uh, first time you open the app in the emulator, it can be a little pokey, but it, gets, it speeds up after that. Uh, the app.cs file is the main entry point and has a lot of things that are familiar to uh, people who have used Blazor before. In particular, you can register services in your dependency injection container. And then ultimately what we do is we add this Hello World Blazor component to the application. And so here's that Hello World component. Now the Hello World component is a very simple one. The main thing it has is a counter. Uh, if you've seen anything about Blazor in the last few years, you've seen that Blazor is all about counters. And here is that counter, and I think it's up and running now. Here it is in the emulator. So I, as we click increment, we can you know, hit the button and then the value increments. Again, pretty straightforward. You've probably seen this code about a dozen times today so far, and the day's not over yet, so you'll see it probably a dozen more times. Uh, but let's start uh, tweaking this application a little bit. So in addition to incrementing count, I want to support doing a decrement count. Very creative, I know. So let's do decrement count, and we'll do count minus minus. Let's add another button. So instead of increment, we're going to decrement. And then, of course, you have the full power of Visual Studio with IntelliSense, so I can call my decrement method. I'm going to change the layout a little bit. Instead of being a horizontal layout, I'll do a vertical layout, which is also the default, so I don't have to, I don't have to set that. And I don't want the count to get below zero, so if the count is zero and you hit the decrement button, I want to show a little alert saying, uh, sorry, but you can't do that. So display alert, error, count is already zero, and then OK. Now this is an async method, so I have to await it, or else the compiler will yell at me. So we just mark this as an async method that returns a task. That error will go away in just a second. And let's go ahead and set a breakpoint in here. Because again, we have the, the full power of Visual Studio here. So all the normal things you expect to work in Visual Studio, uh, IntelliSense, debugging, breakpoints, um, those errors that just popped up are innocuous. We're working on making those uh, go away. So you'll see, you might see those errors pop up a few, time, a few times. So here we can increment our value. That's great. We're up to four. And then let's decrement it back down. And then when we get to zero and I hit decrement one more time, of course, I could tap on the screen. I have a touch screen, so I can tap on the screen. We hit our breakpoint. The count is zero, as you can tell. And then I'll press F5 to continue the application. Error, the count is already zero. So in just a few seconds, we got an application written using Blazor and .NET and C Sharp and Visual Studio running on the Android emulator. So that's pretty nice. Uh, what else can we do? This can do a little bit more than just, um, just counters that increment, oops, that increment and decrement. So let's switch back to the uh, presentation. To see where this kind of fits into the, the broad picture, you've probably seen this spectrum uh, before. All the way at the top, we have Blazor running on the server with HTML. And then as you go all the way down to this last box here on the bottom, we have this native experience with Blazor, which is experimental, as I've mentioned. And this is about rendering non-HTML UI. So let's check out a few more UI components and build a slightly more interesting application. So the application we're going to build is a to-do app because right after you build a counter app, you have to build a to-do app. It's the Blazor way of doing things. So the first thing I want to do is change the overall layout to be this little pre-canned um, 
component. This is a built-in component that has a tabbed page. In my case, it has two tabs, each with a content page. So it has the to-do app, which I haven't written yet, and then the counter app I've put in this second tab over here. So for my to-do app, the first thing I need is a class to host my to-do item, make it public, and then add a couple properties to represent my to-do items. You've probably seen Steve Sanderson and Dan Roth do this a million times, but you haven't seen it this way. So is done and text. It's a very simple to-do app. And now I need a way to display those to-do items. So I will add a razor component. Let's call this to-do display. Now get rid of the HTML that's in there. So we want another stack. Stack layout is one of the most common uh, types of elements that you see um, because it's, it's kind of like that div that you have in the HTML world. And so we want a horizontal orientation. And we want a switch. A switch is kind of like a checkbox-ish type of thing that has an is toggled property. So we can set it to a static value. Of course, for a real application, that's not what we want. And then we have a label to show the text of the item. And of course, we'll just put a static item there for now. But we want this to be a live component that displays the value of the to-do item. So we'll use, uh, again, standard uh, Blazor syntax at a parameter so we can accept a property that is the to-do item. Okay, so now instead of binding to these static values, we want to get the current is done value. And the current, oops, not that, the current text property. But these are one-way bindings. So this will happily display the current values, but it will not let you interact with them. So we want to do something a little fancier. So let's do a little something where while the item is not done, so it, when the item or when the item is done, we'll set the text decoration to be strike through, so it's crossed out. And then when it's not yet done, we'll do no text decoration. So that's nice. So as I toggle this switch, I want the value of is done to change, and then I want the label to re-render with the new style. But as I mentioned, this is a one-way binding. Fortunately, with Blazor, it's very easy to do a two-way binding. So now we have the switch with a two-way binding on the is toggled property. So as I toggle the switch, it'll mark the is done property true, false, true, false, and the label will re-render appropriately. So now we need a way to show a list of these items. So I'll have a to-do list. And here we want a vertical orientation. Actually, let me cheat and I'll copy some of this stuff so you're not just watching me type a whole lot. Okay. So we have an outer stack layout with another stack layout inside it. So I need some UI to render, uh, to allow adding a new to-do item. So an entry is like a text box. And we need to have a binding to, oh yeah, yes. We need to have a binding to some fields. So I want a string new text. And I want this entry to have a two-way binding to the new text. So as the user using this application types text into this text box, this new text field will get updated automatically. And we want a button to add the item to the list. And this has an on-click event handler. And we'll go write that event handler in just a moment. Uh, to do a little bit of layout to make things look nice, what we want is for this to expand layout options.fill and expand. So we want the entry to take up as much space as possible, and then the button will take up the remaining space. And then we need to render out the to-do list. But we don't have a to-do list yet. So let's do that. We'll have a list of to-do items. Items equals new list of to-do items. And here in this list, what we want to do for each item, and again, this is aside from these being stack layouts instead of divs that otherwise you'd think it's HTML, uh, we have a to-do display that has an item property that is bound to the current item. And we want this to iterate over the items collection. Okay, so that looks good so far, except for one thing. We can't add any items yet. So we need an event handler. So void, add item. And so whenever the user clicks the button, we want to take the current text, which has been set into this field, and add it to our list of to-do items. 
So now we set the text of the new item to be the new text. And then we clear out the new text to be empty. And the very last thing we need to do to make this work is in our application, here where it says put the to-do app here, we need to show the to-do list. So unless I've gotten this completely wrong, which is entirely possible, uh, we're going to see this run and we'll have our very simple to-do app running in Android. And again, like I said earlier, these errors are currently expected. Um, so we'll just make that go away because it looks uh, not so nice. So here we have our tabs. And again, these will look a little bit differently on Android versus uh, iOS, but it's, it's still the same application that we had earlier. So when I get to, to zero here, it'll show that little alert. But back in the to-do app, let's say um, where we have to buy milk. That's always the, the first thing in a to-do item. Uh, buy, buy a cat. I like cats. Let's sell the dog. We don't have a dog, but if I did, mm. Uh, probably starting a war on Twitter now. And actually, I've got a special announcement today. My family at home is watching. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, control people. Oh, there we are. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's somebody very special to me. Um, announce wife's birthday. So, hi, wife. And uh, buy, buy a cake. Oh, okay. So, buy a cake. And there we go. So, there's the cake. So, Anjana. Sengil chuka amnida. That's happy birthday in Korean. We can switch back to the computer now. Thank you, control people. Uh, so let's see. So uh, we bought milk a few days ago. I did announce my wife's birthday, and I did buy a cake. So happy birthday. Uh, let's continue with the demo. Um, I hope my wife is actually watching. Otherwise, she'll have to wait to watch this later. Uh, so there we do. There we go. We have this uh, really cool to-do app. It, you saw me write all the code. Uh, aside from just a little bit of the layout that I, I copy pasted. And there we do. We have a to-do app running as a native Android application. So I could deploy this to an Android phone, deploy it to a, a, an iPhone or a tablet, and there you go. It works uh, perfectly naturally. So uh, let's go back to the uh, deck and see a, few, a little bit more. So what we've seen so far is a pretty basic application, but the fact that we're running on a phone or a tablet means that we can take advantage of the native capabilities of those devices. And as we all know, these devices have tons and tons of sensors. So how do you access these things? So the way a typical Xamarin app works, and this is all based on the, the Xamarin platform and Xamarin Forms UI elements. Uh, this is not, it's not a new pixel stack. This is just a different way of writing the UI. You have your various native uh, UIs. And you can write C-sharp targeting those devices directly. But what we really want in this big, light blue colored box is to have most of your business logic and calling platform APIs and your user interface to be shared between them. So you don't have to write those multiple times, uh, but give you all the access that you need to everything. So the, the, what we're talking about today is contained in this light blue box in the bottom. But how do I actually talk to all those native things when I want to access things like GPS or phone? Well, the amazingly smart folks on the Xamarin team have this really cool library called Xamarin Essentials. Instead of having to directly invoke each platform's uh, APIs for things like email, geolocation, battery status, do I have a network connection, uh, you can use the Xamarin Essentials library, and it does all of those things in a platform-independent way, but it's taking advantage of all the features of those platforms. So where does that fit into this diagram? Well, it slots right in. So your shared C Sharp code just talks to Xamarin Essentials, and it has really friendly APIs for talking to all those device to all those uh, sensors and pieces of functionality that your devices have. So let's see a demo of how to do that and make this from a well pretty boring to do application to something a little bit more interesting. So let's go back to the list here. Now I'm going to kind of pre hydrate so you don't have to watch me add the same to-do items uh, dozens and dozens of times. Um, I'm just going to put a few pre-canned items on here. And now I want to add some smart buttons to my uh, to-do to display. So for each item, what I'm going to do is detect, if it has a URL, I want to launch a web browser. If it has a phone number, I want to be able to call that phone number. If it's a place name, then I want to get directions to that. And I found this cool little Formula One car emoji. Maybe it's an IndyCar or a go-kart, but anyway, it's cool. Um, so 
okay, it's not as simple as that. I have to go write some code, or in my case, I'm gonna cheat and copy some code. So I have a few helpers that I wrote to detect things. And so all they do is I wrote some extension methods that I'll, I'll add in just a second that scan the text of the current to-do item and detect whether it has um, a URL or a location name. So I'm gonna add some helpers. Uh, I'm gonna add a class called util. If you ever find yourself adding a class called util to a project, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, it's it's a, kind of a dumping ground, but eh, for the sake of a demo, I think this is okay. So in here, I have some helpers. Please don't use these regular expressions. I, I took, I spent about five seconds writing these regular expressions to detect URLs. This is not, not the actual correct way to detect URLs. Uh, back to the to-do display. So now we can detect if the text contains a URL or has a phone in place, and we will render these buttons conditionally if it has one of those elements in it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then how do we actually launch the browser? Well, that's in the Xamarin Essentials library, and that's in this NuGet package that I'll add to my project. Xamarin.essentials, it's already in my autocomplete. Let's install that. This is a fantastic library. If you're doing mobile apps with .NET and you haven't used Xamarin Essentials, you are missing out on some really, really great stuff. Okay, so now we've added the Xamarin Essentials uh, NuGet package to the project. So now I can try to go launch the web browser uh, or phone dialer and so forth. So to launch a web browser, so if uh, this element is, if this to-do item contains a URL, I want to detect if the user has network access. And if so, I'll launch the browser, and if not, I'll show an alert saying, sorry, you don't have internet access. So we have to import the namespace for that. Fortunately, with Razor, it's really easy. Uh, instead of doing it in every file, you can just go to your imports.razor, which is shared with all the files in this folder and subfolders, and just import it in one place. So now all these things light up. So when we have internet, we'll launch the default web browser on your operating system, and then if not, We'll show an alert. And then we'll do very similar things to make phone calls. So if it's a phone call, we'll open the phone dialer. If it's a location name, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's really cool with all these built-in APIs. We can use the geocoding API to get the latitude and longitude of the location that's specified. And then we also will use the geolocation API to get this device's last known location. And then I copied some helper code from Stack Overflow, that's what you do in a project, to calculate the distance between two locations. And then I'll either show a message saying, sorry, that's, that's more than 200, this is kilometers, so if it's more than 200 kilometers away, I will refuse to navigate. But if it's a reasonably nearby location that you can maybe drive to, I'll launch the map and show directions to that. Now, the last thing you need to do with using Xamarin Essentials is you have to enable them. And this is, there's some device specific code. And so that's what's located in this Android and this iOS project. You have some device specific code that boots up the application, uh, requests the device specific permission. So in my case, uh, and you don't have to remember this code. This code is just copied from the documentation uh, that you can find. So when you search for how to use Xamarin Essentials APIs, it tells you, oh, you can use it. This is the API you call. And then you just have to copy paste some of this code. So um, when you launch an application, the first time it uses, tries to use location information, it usually pops up from the operating system a little message that says, hey, this application wants to know your location. Do you want to allow that or deny that? So you have to handle those things. And then in the application's manifest, oops, not there, in the properties, uh, you can either do it in the XML file or I personally prefer to do it using these assembly properties. And again, you just copy paste this from the documentation. Uh, we're going to specify that this application requires some location information, and it already has some information, uh, some permission requests for getting uh, internet and, and, and things like that. Okay, so let's quickly, well, let's get this running. And then um, just as a reminder, all we're doing is scanning text that's in the to-do item, showing buttons that go do some native device functionality, and then taking the appropriate action um, when those are when those uh, bits of text are located uh, in the to-do text. So we'll let that reload. Um, I was having earlier some problems with the location information. So in the Android emulator, for example, in the settings, you can say what your location is, and you can even do 
playback. So if you want to test uh, motion and things like that, you can do all. There's all those settings. Um, I started getting some weird errors with that in the emulator, so I'll I'll try clicking it and see what happens. Um, so in this case, we want to we have a URL here that was detected. So this little laptop icon. When I click that, it's going to launch the default browser, and so it's going to go to the blog post that we released earlier today. Hey, that's me. Um, but if I go back to the application, if I put the Android emulator into airplane mode, which means we lose internet connection, instead of launching the browser now, it says, uh oh, no internet. So we see that really cool integration in just a few lines of code to get the native device functionality. If we want to call a phone number, that's, I think, the Microsoft, I hope that's Microsoft's main number. Otherwise, I don't know, sorry, 882 um, We can make a phone call. And then here's where I'll, I'll, I'm pre-warning that it's probably a demo fail. Uh, I'll click the car icon because it's going to detect, oh, go to Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, Boston, that's my hometown. Yeah, I was getting some weird errors uh, earlier, so unfortunately, I, I can't show that. But trust me, otherwise, it would work. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is. I'll have to talk to some of the Xamarin folks and get a little bit of understanding about uh, what's going on there. So there we have it. We have a uh, native application. Uh, written using Blazor code. So these are the things you're familiar with. We have for loops and we have if statements that conditionally render content. We mix our C sharp uh, with the markup. The markup, it's not HTML, it's native mobile components. Uh, just a tiny bit about the architecture to see how these things fit together. Uh, we have the great Xamarin Forms library that does the, the rendering of the components. And then we have ASP.NET Core Razor components, Blazor. This project, Mobile Blazor Bindings, binds those two things together. It binds the mobile and the Blazor to build this great experience. And then you have your app's shared UI. That's the one with all the Razor files that talks to that. And then you have your various backends, your Android, your iOS uh, backend. So pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, should hopefully make sense to a lot of folks. The last demo I want to show, and this the full app is available um, in the on the GitHub repo. So if I go to native to do, this is the, the full, uh, or I should say, larger to do app that talks to a SQLite database so it has to load content. And oh, hey, look, I just did a Blazor uh, demo. And so cross that out. Um, this also does speech to text, or not speech, to text to speech, so you can speak things out and so forth. Uh, so this is, this is a, a nice full demo you can try out and launch uh, locally when you try it out. As far as kind of where we are in this, this is early stages, but we have several components that are already available for use. Um, this is not a complete list by any means, but you have things like activity indicator, which is a little spinny circle, the shell component, buttons. We have a few more components that we'll hopefully get out very soon. And then there's a whole bunch more components that we need to uh, add support for. So expect all of these eventually to be available. Uh, and then Really, the main thing that we're looking for is your feedback. We want you to try it out. This is an experiment. An experiment is nothing if we can't get experimental data. We want folks to try out these bits, download it, play with it, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like, give us your suggestions, and we'll work with you to, to try to come up with a solution that is really appealing for you. And we'll get more previews out there, more docs. We have some uh, good docs out there with tutorials getting started, some uh, information, more advanced scenarios, how to do dependency injection and how to wrap components. We're going to look at hot reload support, support for more controls that I mentioned, support for inline text. Right now you have to set the text property. That doesn't feel super natural to somebody doing um, web UI. So we want to support something like this down here. And uh, check us out. This is the early stages. Go to our GitHub repo. It's in the Xamarin org on GitHub slash mobile blazer bindings. And you can find me on Twitter at original underscore EJL. And there's the links once again. The NuGet packages are live. Please check it out. Thank you very much. And I think I'm being told in a passive aggressive way, I am done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> there's you. a camera in my face. <laughs> All right, Elon, we actually have some questions. Wonderful. So, yeah, um, people seem to be actually really excited about this. I want to show you uh, just this kind of just cool tweet. Somebody's really blown away on Blazor mobile bindings. These are amazing concepts. I really love how Blazor and Xamarin comes together. So, it was just some great feedback. You asked for feedback. Yeah, great that's feedback. great. Keep it coming, guys. Um, so, here's, a, here's a, a question right here. So, phew, we get XAML, componentized pieces. Okay, okay, looks cool. I want to take for a test drive. 
how much of the components can we share with Blazor on the web? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, the, the simple answer is that because the, your web components are based on HTML and these components are based on native mobile components. Oh, the one with the red light, that's where I should talk. Um, the, you're probably not going to share the UI itself. Your business logic can certainly be shared. It's probably in a .NET standard library. You can do your uh, web calls, use your SQLite database. That's all .NET standard. That's wonderful. Uh, the UI itself is unlikely to be shareable with this model. If you do want to do something like that, then something like uh, web window and PWAs might be something that's more appealing to you if you want to use exactly the same UI between, uh, between different apps. Great cool. question. Awesome. All right, so here's another one. Is Blader Native planning on supporting UWP or WinUI? Ah, so that's another question. Um, we've mostly been experimenting with uh, iOS and Android. Uh, in principle, anything that Xamarin Forms targets should be runnable. We just haven't played as much with that because the, the main focus at first was to target the uh, phones and, and uh, tablets running those operating systems. But in principle, should work. I haven't tried it. If somebody wants to try it, let us know how it works. And we can easily add that to the project templates as well. Cool. Uh, here's one directly to you here. Um, hey, do I need the preview version of Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio to execute the Blazor bindings for Xamarin, or can I do this on the stable version too? Yeah, so it should work on the released versions. I happen to be running Visual Studio uh, 2019. I forget which update, but I am running the public preview of that. You don't need the public preview, though. You can run the stable RTM release of that, and that should work just fine. That should be true for Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Mac. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, I think that's about it for questions. I mean, like we just have another person really here just saying, this is so awesome. It's a simple to-do app running as a native Android application by utilizing both Blazor and Xamarin Forms. I dig this. So I think awesome. you guys are uh, hitting, a, hitting a nice sweet spot for a lot of people. So that's very cool. Yeah, we're, we're super excited. I mean, this, this builds on, on all the great work from the Xamarin and Xamarin Forms teams, and then all the great work from the Blazor team, which is where I, I, I came from. And so I have that web experience, and I'm, I'm, I'm new to the mobile area, but I just love this mixture of proven technologies that's out there. So basically, like, uh, the, gist of the gist of what I'm hearing is if you're doing mobile development with Xamarin and XAML right now, that's great. We're providing another option for folks that are more used to web syntax, web light syntax. Exactly. Is that the thing? That's exactly so Xamarin right. is actually the technology that's under the hood. It's not going away. This is just an experimental like layer on top. Yep. Awesome. And we, we need feedback. Awesome. Very cool. All right, guys. You heard it. We need feedback. Check it out. Uh, head over to the GitHub repo and uh, yeah, send us your feedback. You know how to get a hold of us. Cool. So Javier, are we uh, ready for our next guest yet? Yes, we are. We have our next presenter on the Skype call. We have uh, Ed Charbonneau, who is going to be talking about authoring custom components on Blazor. Ed, how's it going? Uh, it's going great. Thanks again for having me on .NET Conf. Hey, thank you for always taking your time uh, vol and volunteering your talent with this great conference. Uh, what do you got in, in store for us today? So I'm going to share some tips and tricks on creating some components in Blazor, and then we'll learn a little bit about building a component library that we can share on NuGet. Excellent. Take it away, Ed. All right. So welcome back to .NET Conf. My name is Ed Charbonneau. I work for a company called Progress. You might know us by Telerk because we build the Telerk brand of UI components. And we've been building our Telerk UI for Blazor components since 2018. So we've got some experience with building components. And I wanted to share some things with you all today. And I've got this uh, little bit of an agenda set up. We don't have a whole lot of time, so we're going to cover a lot of material really fast. So if you have questions, please pop those into Twitter uh, using the .NET Comp hashtag. And you could also tweet me directly uh, by my name. Uh, so we're going to cover child content and templates. And then we're going to look at how events are handled and how we can build nice APIs around those events with our components. And then we'll push some of these components into a Razor class library so you can see how uh, to build your own component library libraries and share those on NuGet or share them within your organization as NuGet packages. So as we go through these demos, again, I'm going to be typing uh, very little. And I might be using some of my snippets that I've shared on the Visual Studio Marketplace. So you can find those on Visual Studio Marketplace under the Blazor Pro Code Snippets uh, v6 installer. Uh, 
So if you see, see me using those in Visual Studio, that's where you can get them. So we're going to talk about child content, child content and templates first. Uh, one way to make sure your components are nice and flexible is to make sure that you can uh, allow users to customize them and add templated regions. And what we're going to focus on is this problem statement of how can I maintain a list and count the items within a list uh, using uh, child components and templates. And uh, this was a question that I actually grabbed off of Stack Overflow at one point. And uh, somebody was asking how to count the number of components inside of a UI container. So I'm going to show you how to do that uh, in just a few easy steps. Uh, so some of the things that we're going to be using to build these components, uh, when we talk about child content, uh, this is a template that we get uh, through convention in Blazor. So we're going to use the uh, child content uh, uh, convention, and that is a render fragment object type. Uh, so this is something specific to Razor components. And when we want to build these template sections, we'll be using render fragments. So these are objects that get uh, injected into our render tree when our components are built. Uh, so you can only have one child content uh, field in your component. And uh, we'll look at ways to add multiple sections with templates uh, later on. And we'll do that through a named template. So we can have one or more of these. Uh, unlike the child content template or child content parameter, we can have multiple uh, content templates. So in, in this quick example, we have a loading and a content template, and we can set up special uh, regions within our, our uh, within our component where we can add custom, uh, markup in, in UI. Uh, we'll also look at the type parameter or T item uh, type of template where we use a generic uh, list type of uh, component in Blazor so we can iterate over some data and build up a templated UI. So this is going to be super handy. Uh, we'll jump into events after we get done uh, with some of our uh, project here. Um, so let's let's start off real quick again with that problem statement. We're going to look at how to maintain a list of items, a list of components, and get the count of items that are in it. So we'll use some data binding to do that. But first, we need a component to work with. So I'm going to start with a single alert message. Let's use uh, some bootstrap code here. I'm just going to pop in a quick div element. And I've got the bootstrap class of alert and alert danger on there. We can go ahead and load this up in our project. For the most part, this project is the hello world experience that you always get with file new project. So we have our counter component and our index page and a fetch data example in here. We're going to modify these as we go along. And they're just simply using some bootstrap CSS. We have our first uh, piece of markup. So this is just uh, a regular div class. It's not a component yet. So let's use, <clears throat> let's add a new component so we can reuse this as a reusable component in Blazor. So I'm going to click File, Add, and add a Razor component to my project. And I'm putting these underneath of a component uh, folder over here in my project. This is going to help me organize them. Uh, just a little bit better. And you can see I've already got some preloaded components in here that we'll talk about uh, near the end. So I've got some spinner components that I'm going to use later on. So we'll keep adding to this folder here. And I'm going to create an alert message. So my alert message component. And for my alert message component, I'm just going to take that same code that's on our index page. And we're just going to move that over to this file. So now I've got my alert message in a component. So for all intents and purposes, it is a component already, uh, but it has a static message here. So we want to be able to allow users to customize this internal uh, message. And I want to do more than allow them to pass a string. I want them to be able to control the inner HTML for this component. So I want, them, want the, the consumer to be able to replace that span tag with whatever HTML they would like. So that's where our child com uh, content comes in handy. So I'm going to create a code block here. And I'm going to use my Blazor Pro code snippet pack that I've installed from Visual Studio Marketplace. And I'm going to type para cc and hit tab. And that's going to set up a parameter that is a render fragment called child content. Now, if I reference my child content up in 
side of my component code like that. IntelliSense finishes it out for me. And now the user of this component can specify that inner HTML. So we'll go back to our index page and we can set up an alert component. So I have my alert message. And notice the namespace here is really, really long. Uh, this is because by default, our components are inheriting their namespace from the, the folder structure uh, that they're placed in. So I'm going to take this namespace out and I'm just going to move it to my imports. So I'll just put a using statement right inside of my imports file. So this is going to be component libs, components matching my directory here in my solution. So we'll go ahead and save that out and our alert message lights up and we can now go back and put a span in here and any type of HTML or markup we'd like can go in this region and it will render in line. So I'm just going to call this message 2.0. We'll refresh the window, go back to our, um, our index page and we'll have our UI component right there. This is message 2.0. And again, I could put any HTML I want in here thanks to that child component. Uh, that child markup convention that we have, the child content parameter. So now let's think about that problem statement again. We want to build a container that can have multiple alert messages in it, and then we can count the number of children that are in that container. So let's add a new component that can have multiple alerts bound to it. So I'm going to go back into my components folder, I'm going to click add new item. And this time I'm going to make a component called alert messages. I'm going to make this plural. And in here I'm going to build a component that can do some data binding to a list of items. Uh, what's really nice about Blazor is we have a convention built in for this. And it is a generic, uh, generic component um, that we can pass uh, any type of object and template over that type of object. So we have the T item. So I'm going to use my code snippets again. I have B T item that I'm going to type in. And when I hit tab, if I do this in the right order, there we go. It's going to stub out uh, what I need to make this templated generic component work. And I've got a type parameter up here at the top. So this gives me a component of T. So my type parameter is of type T item. And you can see it's set up to iterate over an on-order list. And this is just boilerplate code that I'm going to reuse. So I'm going to take out that list item. And I'm going to leave the for each loop here because I'm going to iterate over a collection of T item. If we look at the parameters in our component, we have a render fragment of T item. And that is my item template. And I also have a, a read-only list of T item. That is my data that I'm going to send uh, this template. So now in my for each loop, I'm going to iterate over these render fragments and render them out uh, using the template. So I'm going to put in my alert message here and render out several alert messages. And inside of that alert message, I'm going to place the template that the user supplies. And what's nice about this is it's going to pass that T item back to the user and let them access any object that they pass into uh, this messages component. So now I can go back. Uh, let's actually, let's rename this before we get back into um, our next demo. Let's make sure that uh, we know what the item template is going to be. I'm going to use my refactoring tools here and hit uh, Control RR, and I'm going to rename this template region to an alert template. Now I have an alert template. We've got our changes persisting up here in the markup as well, so that's good, and I'm ready to move on to using uh, this new alert message. Now this is uh, similar, or this is the exact um, counter that you see when you do file new project. 
uh, we've got the counter component. And I'm going to reuse the counter component to show just how simple we can bind a list of anything uh, to this generic collection. So right now, it's the standard counter. When I click on it, it just counts up a number. So instead of counting, what I want to do is just push those integers into a list, and we'll reuse uh, this counter component for our new demo here. So let's go ahead and remove this code block. We're going to rewrite this section anyway. So instead of counting up, I'm going to go ahead and paste in a snippet here. And I've dropped in a horizontal rule here so we can see where our new component lives. And I've got my alert messages component. And in my items property, I've bound to uh, an alert array. So we'll take a look down here. What is an array of alerts? Well, I'm simply just pushing uh, an integer into a list of int, and I'm calling that alerts. So when we click our button, we'll push those items into that alert array or collection. So next thing I need to do is uh, make sure I'm displaying the current count. You can see it's underscored up here in red. And the way to do that is just to take a little bit of a link method and stick it right there. So now we have our alert messages, and we are counting those alert messages because we're just counting simply the array of objects that we're passing in. So what's nice about this is I don't have to worry about my component trying to maintain the state of how many children it has. I'm just going to focus on the data binding and let that do the work for me. Um, also, what's nice about these templates is I can name the T item uh, field whatever I'd like through this context property. So this is something that we get out of the box with Blazor. And if you notice inside of my alert template now, I'm still rendering a span, but I have this at message property here. And that's coming from this content property that I have. If I were to erase this content property out, uh, this would need to be named context. So. I can alternatively name that just by setting this property. So now let's go back into our UI and take a look at what we have. So we're going to go back to that counter component. And instead of it just counting up uh, from 0 through whatever we click, we're going to get alert messages rendered uh, as many times as we click as well. And it's still able to keep count because we're binding to the array that's there, the list of items, and we're getting the count off of that list of items. So the next thing we're going to focus on is how to raise events with our components and look at some really easy practices that we can put in place to allow the consumer of the component to handle the events instead of trying to put all of the event handling logic into our component and force it to rend, um, manage the state of what's contained in it, we'll go ahead and we'll just pass that off to the user uh, with some delegate methods and let them uh, handle any events that we need. So let's add a delete button uh, to these alert boxes and let the user handle how they want to control how the alert is deleted. So that brings us to our next uh, slide here, and we're going to handle some events. So how can we implement, implement some create, update, delete operations? We're going to implement a delete operation now so I can show you how that works. And we'll do that using an event callback. So this is a special delegate that comes uh, in the box with Blazor. And this type of event handler uh, or delegate, it also invokes the state has changed method within that component. So what it does is it alerts the system that some type of state has uh, changed so the component can re-render. If we were to use an action instead of an event callback, uh, we might click on a button and we, we would be doing work in the background, but we might not see the UI update uh, along with those events that are happening. So to signal to Blazor that some, some type of event has happened, we'll use an event callback of T. T will be the object that we're going to return back to our consumer. So we'll go back into our project. And I'm going to go into my messages uh, component. And we'll add a delete functionality to it. And again, I'm going to use my Blazor code snippets. And I'm going to add a parameter of type event callback. Uh, 
So para EC here, hit tab, it'll auto complete for me. And I'm going to return an object here and we'll name this on delete. So now I've got my event callback and I need to wire up my event callback somehow. Uh, we need to invoke the on delete delegate when something happens inside of our UI. So we'll add a simple delete method in here. So I'm going to call this void handle delete. And this is going to take a T item of item. And there is a special way to invoke this. We will call on delete dot invoke async. And we also need to pass in our argument, the item. So this will, uh, we need to trigger handle delete from within our UI. And then that will invoke the on delete method that the consumer has supplied so they can handle the delete uh, how they see fit. Um, we're going to pass back the current object um, from our UI that is bound uh, inside of that, that actual uh, record there, that, that state, that actual item that it's sitting on. Uh, so we'll pop that back uh, into uh, that argument and pass it on up to the consumer. Now, I've used T item through here, and I have object here because the consumer is not going to know exactly what T item is. So we get an error. Uh, compilation error if we didn't use T item here. So we'll pass back an object. You might want to create your own special event arguments for these. Uh, we're going to keep this super generic right now and just pass back an object. So now we're going to go back into, oh, sorry, we need to add a delete button. We need to invoke this event, uh, this handler. So I'm going to just paste in a delete button that I have uh, saved so you don't have to watch me type all of that out. And first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to double check and make sure the on delete uh, event callback has a delegate supplied to it. So that's just a quick way to see if there's something uh, there's something handling that on delete method. If there isn't, I'm just not going to show the button. So when I do have a delegate, I'm going to call on click. Uh, when I when I click on the uh, button, I'm going to bind to the on click event, and I'm going to pass in the current element. And then we'll just render out a um, bootstrap button here. Uh, and we've got the uh, X or time symbol inside of that button as an icon. So now we should be able to go back and look at our counter page. And we'll re-render this. So let's go ahead and run this in the browser, see what it looks like. And right now, we should be able to go back to counter and click count. And you'll see that I get a list of elements, but there's no close button yet. And that's because I put that check in there to make sure that we don't render the, the close button if there's nothing to handle it. So I'm going to come back into my alert messages. And on delete, I need to supply it with a method to handle this delete operation. So what's nice about us pushing this uh, event back to the user and allowing them to handle the, the delete rather than trying to do it internally within the component, is I might be binding to um, an entity framework uh, entity. I might have a web API callback that I need to make to delete an object. Uh, there's all sorts of things that I might want to do on this delete method. So we'll let the user handle it, and then we'll just rebind the data. So now let's add that delete method. And it's really actually simple. We're going to call delete item. And since it has an event callback with an item of object, we'll just consume that object and we'll cast it to an int because we know that's what we're going to get back. And then we'll remove it from our array of alerts. So now if I rerun this, just that one line of code right there, that simple um, event handler of delete item that I added will give us the functionality that we need. And you can see the delete buttons appearing over here on the right hand side. And if we click on those, we can delete our items from the UI. So that's a nice way of exposing that type of functionality to your users. And again, inside of this delete item method, I could do any type of functionality that I want.
And since I'm removing the items from the alert, the UI uh, is updated, removing those items through data binding. So let's look at how we can extend our app with more components in templates. Um, I'm going to go into my fetch data component now. And this is a common pattern that you'll see. We'll go ahead and run this. I've modified it slightly, so I have a little bit of a delay. So you can see the loading message uh, show in the grid right here. So that's done on purpose. I've got a task.delay right there. And if we look down in our, our on uh, initialize method, you'll see that we're waiting for, um, awaiting for uh, about two seconds. So inside of this component, we have a guard statement. So we're going to check and see if forecast is null before we render the table that is displayed on the page. And if the data is null, we're going to go ahead and display a loading message there. This is a pretty common pattern that you see in Blazor is where we're populating some kind of data from an API, uh, whether it be a web API or something coming from a database. And we're starting off with an empty container, uh, a field of some sort that's waiting for a list of data to get bound to it. And the onInit method is going to run uh, with this null at the beginning. So if we take out this expression here, we're actually going to get an error uh, when we try to load this page. So we'll go ahead and rerun this here. We'll make sure our uh, code is commented out properly. And we'll give this another try. And it's going to initialize with a null uh, field for forecasts. And this page isn't going to work. So instead of implementing this null check over and over again, because I always forget to do it, I'm going to build a component that's going to handle that for us, and we can just wrap that component around objects that need to be loaded. So I'm going to go back to my components, and I'm going to add a new item. And I'm going to call this my spa loader component. This is a super simple abstraction of what we're doing uh, in this fetch data. So we're, what we basically have is an if statement, and when these the if is uh, true, uh, we are going to show a loading message. Otherwise, we're going to show the content that we need. So we can build a really easy component to abstract this away and reuse it. So I'm just going to, instead of typing this out, I'm going to go ahead and use some copy and paste. Uh, so you don't have to watch me type that out. But it's really simple. We're going to say, if this is loading, show a loading template, else render the content. And again, I'm using those render fragments, the, uh, the child content, um, to, to do this. So we have two templates. We're going to call this a loading template and a content template. And this should map pretty easily to what we're doing here. So we can take out this if statement. Well, let's go ahead and put our spa loader in here. So we have a spa loader component now. And in our spa loader, we have a loading template, and we also have a content te template. So we have loading and content. We'll move our table into the content template. And we will move our loading message into the loading template. And now we need to set uh, the is loading property on the object or on the component. And that is loading uh, is going to be a flag that is just going to check that the forecast is loaded for us. So now we've taken a, a really uh, repeatable pattern that, that we see in a lot of uh, component scenarios, and we've wrapped it in a simple container that we can reuse and eliminate the need to rewrite those if statements all over our code. And it cleans it up, makes it look like nice uh, smooth HTML. And we can go back to our fetch data. You'll see the loading message. And now we have our table showing up. So let's take this another step further. I'm going to go ahead and remove this again. I'm going to wipe out the entire example. And I'm going to show how far along uh, we can push this concept into a nice set of reusable libraries. So I'm going to paste in a new 
example. This one's a little bit more complex. There's a bit more markup here, but I'm going to close out uh, some of this markup. This is mainly uh, used for the demo you're about to see, but I want to show that we have our, temp our table here again. This is the same weather forecast table as before. Uh, we're going to go ahead and show the header. And inside of the body, I've got a component called spin loader. Uh, this is something that I'm using in my project. I've taken my spa loader and I've, I've moved it down the road a little bit and gave it some more functionality. I've still got my is loading method, but I also have an is faulted method because my data may not always load correctly. So I need to be able to show an error if something happens. So now I have an extra set of templates that I can use. I also have a loading template that has a spinner in it. So I've got the spin kit uh, CSS project um, as a dependency on these components. And I can reuse this nice spinner UI um, by just calling out one of the spinner types that I'd like to render. Now, I, close, I can also set the colors of these things, uh, center them, and in my template, I can center it uh, as well within that data grid. Um, I also have a content template, which is going to loop over my uh, columns in my database or my, my data and render those out in the table. And then I also have a faulted template. So if something goes wrong, the user isn't stuck with a spinner that, sh that just keeps loading uh, because it's, the, the data is always null. So let's take a look at this and see how it looks in our running application. So we'll go ahead and control F5 and go back. Uh, let's do a little tab bankruptcy here. Let's close all the other tabs out. Uh, let's go over to our fetch data component. You'll see I have my nice spinner there, and then up pops my data. Uh, we can retry that to see it again. That's our spinner that's being provided by the spin kit CSS. And I can also force an except exception here. So if I retry, this is going to look for my data and fail. And I have a nice UI. Uh, display there. It's very simple, but at least it tells me that something went wrong, and I can go back and retry my um, my refresh again. So this is a nice reusable piece of uh, component that I'd like to take and put into an external project. So that's what I'm going to do next. So under components, I have spinners, and spinners is all of my uh, components that run my spin loader. And I'm going to take these and move those into a component library project. So let's go ahead and create, uh, let's right click on our solution and do add new project. And we will create a razor class library. I'm going to click next and we'll call this spinners. And we'll click create. And it looks like I've already done that. So let's uh, let's take a look. I've probably just got an empty folder sitting in here. We'll go ahead and drop that empty folder out of the project. So I can go back and add. Uh, let's try this again. Add new project. I'm going to select Razor Class Library. I'm going to name it Spinners. And I'm going to cr click Create. And we'll get a uh, new project dialog here. Go ahead and click Create again. And then we'll get a templated um, Razor class library project uh, right here in our solution. So I'm just going to drop some of these default items out of here. We're not going to need uh, component1.razor and the interop example. We'll go ahead and remove those. And what I can do now is go into my main project, and I'm going to take all of my spinners and just go ahead and cut these and paste them into my spinners project. So I'm going to remove this folder from my main project here. So I don't need that anymore. And I also need to bring over any CSS from my project. So I'm going to come in, in here. I have a libman.json file. What libman.json does, it brings in uh, third-party libraries from uh, JavaScript or CSS ecosystems. And I'm going to copy that into my uh, Razor class library as well. And I'm just going to change the output folder here. I'm going to put the 
uh, CSS that it's going to grab from the web and put that file in my WW root folder. And you can see it's already uh, gone out and grabbed that dependency and deposited it where I want it. And again, we'll do some tab bankruptcy here. I'm going to close these all out. So now I've moved my CSS over. I've moved all my logic over. I might need to change some namespaces because I've moved some of my code. So we'll go ahead and clean up just a few simple files here. So we're going to change any of the .cs files, but the Razor uh, components themselves will automatically inherit the namespace from the folder structure. So we don't need to change all of those. Um, I also need to make sure I include my NuGet dependencies. So I have one NuGet package that this project depends on, and it's called Blazor. Um, Blazor Component Utilities, and this is a nice uh, utility to help me do conditional styles and, and class attributes uh, for my components. So we'll go ahead and bring that in as well. And now I should be able to compile my spinner project. Let's see what output we get here. Uh, I'm missing an import statement, so I brought in my dependencies. I just need to make quick reference to those uh, in my imports.razor file here. So I'm going to say using and Blazor component utilities, and now I can build uh, my spinner project. And back in my main project, all I have to do to consume this is right click on my dependencies and hit add reference. And now I have my spinners project added to my, my local project here. I can also come into my spinner project and I can uh, right click on properties here and I can set up a quick NuGet package build. So if I check this generate NuGet package on, packages on build uh, checkbox, I can save that. And when I build the project, I can then send uh, fill out this metadata and put that NuGet package up on NuGet and share that with the world. So it's just that easy to create a reusable library. Now I need to consume it inside of my uh, main project here. And I've already added it, but I need to make sure that I'm using all of the references that come with it. I need to add a reference to the style sheet. So I'm going to come back and replace uh, the existing one that I had. So it was in my CSS folder. Now it's going to be in a folder that's set up by convention. So this is going to be my content folder. So it's underscore content. The name of the assembly is going to be spinners. And then uh, the folder that I'm looking for in the WW root of that project. So spinkit.min.css will be there. And I should be able to go into my import file and change uh, this dependency here. We're going to remove this namespace and reference our spinner project instead of the internal one that we used to have. And we'll do a quick rebuild and see if we checked all the boxes. And all of our builds succeeded. And earlier I noticed there's a little bit of a caching issue that, with this. We might not see the spinner. And so we'll go ahead and uh, close this out. Um, let's see. We need to clean and rebuild this project. We closed out all of our browser tabs. Uh, we'll give this one more run, and we should be able to see that spinner pop up. Again, there's, there's something that's being cached there that's causing it to look uh, for the old spinner um, CSS file. So we'll load this up one more time. And when we click on our fetch data page, there's our loader. So that's how you can take and create, uh, first of all, simple, um, simple components. Uh, you can expose some nice APIs for your users. And you can wrap uh, some pretty interesting uh, reusable logic around some templates and make a nice experience that you can share easily on NuGet as a NuGet package library. So I don't know how we ha how we are doing on time, but I'm up for questions if we if we have any time left. Um, otherwise, back to you guys at the Channel Nine Studio. 
Hey, Ed, yes, we do have some couple questions, so we have uh, time for that. So, Beth, you, can you put the question up there? Yep, we got a question right here. All right, we'll see if it can get it up here for us. Question. Maybe There, there we go. go. All right, here's a question for you, Ed. Are there components available that make JavaScript and CSS widgets available as Blazor components? Specifically, I'm looking for something that makes boost, Bootstrap easy with Blazor. Uh, so there's some community projects out there. There's Blazor Strap. Uh, that's one component library that wraps um, the Blazor uh, components. Okay. And we also have our Telerik UI components that are uh, fully featured um, and have uh, charts, graphs, grids, all of those things that have a Bootstrap theme as well. So those two things actually mix really well together. So you can start with some of the basic stuff with Blazor Strap, and you can move on to uh, the more robust controls as you need them with the Telerik UI for Blazor. And then, of course, there is a custom theme builder within the Telerik UI components where you can start with that Bootstrap theme and totally customize uh, all of the colors however you'd like. I think we have. I think we do have another. Yeah, Professor one, Sassy is asking a lot of questions. I know actually, Professor so. Sassy is being pretty <laughs> yeah, sassy. So you do have another one. So we got another question over here. Is there a, is there a way to change a components tag without renaming the dot razor file? Is there a named a way to change the components name without changing uh, that dot razor file name? Without changing the razor file name. The extension, basically. Just so the extension. Like, for example, if, if it's called foo.razor, the component's going to call, it's going to be called foo. Can I call it foo bar, right? And then, but without changing the file name itself. So I don't believe we can do that directly okay. um, without changing the file name. But what we can do is we can control the component's namespace through the at namespace directive. So we can set the namespace. So uh, by default, this would be under the components folder. So it would be components.alert message. If we wanted to change that to um, alert components, it would then change the namespace. So this would now be uh, my project.alertcomponents.alert message. So we, we do have some control there, but it does still uh, get the name from uh, the razor file. Perfect. So well, at least that's it. Hey, well, that's that's great because we obviously know people on the Blazor team. That's a good feedback for them as to give them. It's like, hey, how can we actually rename these components without renaming the file structure where it sits? So that's that's great. Uh, great workaround for that. Uh, any more questions, Beth? Nope, that's it. We're all done. Well, uh, Ed, uh, any parting thoughts? Um, I just want to say it's been uh, a lot of fun working with Blazor since. Uh, Jeez, it's about one, 0 0.1. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw it at the MVP Summit, I knew it was something that uh, a lot of people were going to enjoy. So uh, we took it back to our uh, engineering team at Telerik. We've been building ever since. Um, I do a live show every Friday on Twitch. So if you follow me um, on Twitch or on Twitter, you can get updates on those shows and when they're happening. And uh, a lot of the things that you saw me build today uh, came from many, many shows that we've done. Uh, so it's it's nice to distill some of that information and, and run it on Channel 9 here. Uh, you can also find the library, the sp uh, the spinner library that I showed and the spin loader component is under the project uh, blazerpro.spinkit up on NuGet. So you can just consume that right in your project now. Um, you can also find the source code for that on, on GitHub in case you want to see how all of the uh, inner workings of that were uh, created. So it's a nice uh, boilerplate for creating your own components. Um, and then the code snippets as well, those are up on the Visual Studio Marketplace. Uh, just search for Blazor Pro code snippets and you should be able to find them. Perfect. Well, Ed, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, everybody hold on tight. We have Michael Washington, who's going to be talking to us about uh, using Microsoft, Google, and cookie authentication and authorization inside your Blazor application. We are going to go to a quick break so we can um, swap out um, Skype calls here, but we will be right back more with .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. Hi, today we're going to talk about discards in C Sharp. So, Myra, discards are those little underscores that I see floating there instead of variable names, right? What are those? Why do we have them? Yeah, so in C Sharp 7.0, uh, we introduced discards, which are these 
temporary dummy variables. They are write-only, so you cannot read from them. Um, they are useful when you don't care about the value of a variable. Right. So instead of me like making up different variable names and going A, B, C, D and never actually calling those, I could just use a discard? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that helps with like saving memory allocations because you're not having to save and use those, all those variables that you don't care about their value. Wow. Okay. And I think there's particular situations that these would be useful. Let's hop into some of your examples. Um, so one one particular scenario where uh, discards are useful is with tuples. Um, so here you have a method that returns a tuple and it has string double in, in, in. So, but when you're working with that data, you don't care about all of them. You just want to see the population. So you can, instead of having to declare a variable for each, you just use discards here to say the ones that you don't care about, you just discard them. Um, another example where it's useful to have discards is without variables. Uh, so here um, I'm declaring uh, the result uh, in the out parameter, but I don't need that if I'm not going to use it. If I'm just, I just care about the result of try parse, I can just use discard instead. Nice. So if I wanted to learn more about discards, where should I go? So the C Sharp guide has a very complete guide about discards on docs.microsoft.com. Uh, it goes over the scenarios uh, that you can use between tuple and pattern matching. Also the standalone discard that I didn't show here. Um, and there are lots of examples and more information. Great. Okay, so we should use discards when we have temporary dummy variables that we don't need, especially in cases of uh, tuples, making them easier to write, as well as out variables. Thanks for watching. All right, everybody, we are back with .NET Com Focus on Blazor. We have on the phone or Skype call, uh, Michael Washington, who's going to be talking to us about authentication and authorization in our Blazor application. How's it going, Michael? Hi, thank you for having me. Great. So what, what, what kind of content are you going to cover for us today? Well, we're going to cover how to authenticate your users with your Blazor applications, including covering some scenarios for implementing some out-of-the-box or unusual authentication oh, awesome. situations. Great. Well, take it away. It's, it, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you. Hello, .NET Conf. Um, this is Course Focus on Blazor, and we're going to be covering Microsoft, Google, and cookie authentication and authorization. Again, I'm Michael Washington of the BlazorHelpWebsite.com. What we're going to cover today is Microsoft, uh, Google, and cookie authentication. However, I'm going to start off first with an overview of the authentication state and the authorized view component. The takeaway I want you to get from this overview is that what I'll be covering will apply to everything. So it doesn't matter how you authenticate your users, whether you're using Microsoft, whether you're using server-side or client-side, the authentication state and the authorized view code that you will write will be the same. So let's go ahead and dive in. So this is the overview. Authentication state. Is the person authenticated? For server-side Blazor, it's pretty much built in. So the authentication state provider is just building upon what's already in the ASP.NET Core. Um, but for client side, you'll typically need to implement a custom authentication state provider. So we'll walk you through every single step that you need for that. Uh, a couple more things on authentication state. So you'll first want to set it up uh, in your app razor file using authorized uh, route view or wrapping the code in cascading uh, authentication state like you see and I have in the image below. This allows you to uh, get access to the authentication state in procedural code using the cascading parameter that you see here. So as you see here at the top, I um, uh, put in the cascading parameter. In the middle there, I'm able to then determine who the user is. 
And then once I know who that user is, I can then, of course, pass that user along to, for example, this method says only get the forecast for the currently logged in user. The authorized view component, this is used in your Razor markup, and it's a very simple thing where you just have your authorized view component, you have your template, authorized a template, not authorized template. Obviously, what's shown in the authorized template only shows when the person's logged in and not authorized, um, you know, the opposite. Okay, so let's dive into some examples. So I'll first show some slides and then I'll show it to you live. So for Microsoft Authentication, using server-side Blazor, this is the built-in system. It's really easy to use. You just open up Visual Studio, create a new project. We'll select Blazor app. Of course, we'll give the project a name. We'll select Blazor server app. In the next example, we'll be doing the Blazor WebAssembly app. Um, under Authentication, we'll click Change. And the menu that you see here is the standard menu that you would see with any .NET Core project with all of the various options. In this case, we'll choose the typical option, which is individual user accounts, store user accounts in app. We'll go ahead and click Create, and we have a project. We could hit F5 here, run this project, and it would actually work. Um, it'll be using uh, local DB for the database. However, what I like to do is connect to my local uh, SQL server. Here I'm connecting to localhost, and I like to create a new database and, of course, give the database a name. And when I go into properties for that database, I can get the connection string. I can then take that connection string go into the app settings JSON file of the project that was created for me and there'll be a default connection uh, property. I can go ahead and put in the connection string to my local uh, database and then run hit F5 to run the project. At this point the project has been created however the database has not been set up. To set up the database the first person to go in which is me uh, clicks on the register button, uh, creates an account and then the application realizes that the database is not set up, so the migrations uh, screen will come up. I go ahead and say apply migrations, I refresh the web browser, I click the continue button, there will be this register confirmation page. Um, if you don't want this to happen, because you are not, you don't plan to actually have confirmed emails, in the startup file there is an option that you can turn off um, confirmed accounts uh, or or default is set to true, you can set it to false, and then you won't see this register confirmation page. Either way, go ahead and click the link, click on the name of the application, and then everything is set up. At this point, I can click the login button to log in with the account that I just created, and the application works as normal. Okay, so let's see a demo of that. Minimize this here, and minimize the channel 9 thing there. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing everything here. And, of course, minimize that. Okay, so I started up a Blazor app. I, of course, am on... Hey everybody, we're having a small technical difficulty. Let's see if I can get uh, Michael back on here in a Skype call. Uh, give me one second. Oh, let me call him again. All right, so we're having a little bit of trouble calling him, so let me do this. Let's kick to a quick break. Let's get him back on, uh, get him back on the same page, and we'll go from there. We'll be right back. 
Hey friends, I'm Chris and I'm a program manager on the NuGet team. Today I'm going to try to answer the question, what is NuGet? But before we start, if you're just arriving here and you're completely new to the concepts of .NET or libraries, I highly recommend you check out the .NET Core 101 series before continuing. Otherwise, so what is NuGet? NuGet is the official package manager for .NET. That means we provide a platform and tools to help developers create, publish, and consume .NET packages. So if you're wondering now, OK, so then what's a package? Packages can generally be thought of as compiled libraries packed together with descriptive metadata into a nice shareable unit. So you might recall from the .NET Core 101 series that a developer platform like .NET can generally be defined as the combination of its languages and its libraries. NuGet's job is essentially to make those libraries as accessible and easy to share as possible in the form of packages. NuGet lets developers leverage an entire ecosystem and build on top of existing solutions instead of building everything from scratch. To get a better idea. Technical glitch here with Skype. Michael, we're, we got you back on the call. Let's take it away. Okay, so what I've done is I've created uh, my test database and I'm going to go into my app settings uh, JSON file and I'm going to insert the connection to my local database. I'm going to go ahead and click uh, F5 to run the application so that it'll then come up. Give it a second to build and open up my web browser. And I'll go ahead and crank up the resolution there a little bit so you can see what's going on. Now at this point the application is um, set up, however the database hasn't been set up. So I'll go ahead and click the register, go ahead and create an account here, put my strong password in, click register, at this point, the application realizes that it hasn't been set up, so the Applied Migrations comes up. I go ahead and hit Refresh, hit Continue, and click this button, click here, and now the application has been set up. So at this point, I can log in using the account that I just created. And when I'm logged in, the application will work. Um, in addition, when I click on my name here, I can have options to change my email, my password, as well as this personal data section, whereas I can download my data and, of course, delete my account because there are certain uh, legislative things where you have to uh, offer th th those sorts of options. So now, we will look at client-side authentication, and in this example, we'll be using uh, Azure AD. So again, we're going to start a new project with Visual Studio, create a new project, create a Blazor app, give the application a name. However, in this case, we're going to check uh, the Blazor WebAssembly app. If you don't see this template, go to blazor.net, click on documentation, and there'll be directions on how to download and install this template if you don't already have it. So once it's installed, we select it. We also ensure that we have ASP.NET Core hosted, uh, selected, and then we'll create the project. Actually, we'll create the solution, which creates three uh, projects. A client uh, project at the top, which will be running um, in the person's web browser, uh, a server project that you see in the middle that, of course, runs a server-side code, and a shared project that will have uh, components that are shared between the server and client project. So the next step is to set up uh, Azure Active Directory. Um, and we need to have a URL callback into this application, and we'll need the port settings. So we're going to go ahead and open up the launch settings JSON file, and we're going to copy this port setting for the SSL port, because we're going to need that in the next step. We're then going to go to portal.azure.com. We'll create a free Azure account if we don't already have one. If we do have one, we'll go ahead and log in, and we'll click the Azure Active Directory node. We'll then click the App Registrations, New Registration, and we'll uh, create a new registration. 
the key thing here is on the redirect URL that points right back to our application after the person is authenticated, you'll need to replace that 44302 with the SSL port we copied earlier. After we create uh, this uh, registration, we go to the overview tab and we'll see a client ID. We're going to copy that because we'll need that in the next step. And before we leave this, we're going to go to the authentication node and ensure that ID tokens is set and go ahead and click save. Now we're going to return back to the Visual Studio, back to the project, open up the app settings JSON file, and we're going to add a new section called Azure AD with three properties, instance, client ID, and callback path. So you'll copy this and use this exactly as you see it. However, with the, for the client ID, you'll use the client ID that you copied earlier. Then we're going to add some NuGet packages to support the login uh, flow functionality. So we'll add a NuGet package, Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.Authentication.AzureAD.UI to the server project. And to the client project, we're going to add the Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.Components.Authorization package. Um, also in the server project, we're going to open up the startup file, add a couple of using statements, and then add a configuration property to allow us to read the settings that we put into the app settings JSON file. Now here's the meat of it. It's the, the middleware. So in the configure services section, we're just going to put this boilerplate code that will uh, control the authentication flow for logging into um, using Azure AD. And in the configure section, we're also going to add uh, using authentication and using authorization. Now, in the client project, we need to have some import statements, so we're going to add those. And now we're going to start the process of implementing our custom authentication provider. The custom authentication provider first needs to know, is a person logged in or not? So in the shared project, we're going to make a new class called Blazor User, which has a single property of username. And we're going to create a user controller in the server project whose only purpose is when it's called to either return a username or not return a username. This is to indicate if the person is logged in or not. Also, in just to demonstrate how you protect your server side code, in the weather forecast controller that was created for us by default, we're going to add some using statements and then we're going to put the authorize tag. So this means that the only way to call that controller is if you're an authorized user. Now we're going to implement the custom authentication state provider. And this is actually a lot easier than you think. So we just create a class, doesn't matter what you call it, I call it custom authentication provider. And I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but your custom authentication provider needs to inherit from authentication state provider. Then it needs to implement just one method called get authentication state. And this method needs to create a claims identity either with a person in it or blank. If a person is in it, then that means that the person's logged in. If uh, the claims identity is blank, as you see down here, then that means a person's not logged in. So in this implementation, it's going to call that get user uh, controller that we created. And if it says that there's a user, it'll create the claims identity uh, for the person. So just again, what the custom authentication provider needs to do is just create a claims identity with a person if they're logged in or a blank one if they're not. And that's how Blazor will know if the person's logged in or not. Now we just need to register this. So in the startup project, in the client project, we just add some using statements. And then we basically have these three lines. First, we turn on authorization by making a call to, uh, by invoking add authorization core. We then register our custom authentication provider. And then finally, we set our custom authentication provider as the authentication state provider. And now we've set up uh, the custom authentication provider. We're going to go open up the app.razor, which I uh, mentioned before. And um, by using authorized route view, if a route is found, uh, the authorization will be passed through. And if it's not found, we just wrap that code in cascading authentication state. So therefore, in our login display, we can now use the authorized view um, uh, tags to say, OK, show the sign out if they're um, uh, authorized, or show the login if they're not. In our main layout, we'll just put our login display in there. 
Uh, one quick thing, when a person is signed out, they're sent to a URL, account slash sign out. We really want the person to end up on the main page. So we can just add this additional uh, uh, routing tag to the main page so that when a person signed out, they'll be taken to the main page. So we kind of get the flow that we're looking for. In the fetch uh, data page, we can now use that authorized view tag to only show certain sections if they are authorized. In our procedural code, we have access to the cascading parameter where we can get uh, access to the current user. And then in this code, we only call the, the server-side uh, weather forecast controller if the person is authenticated. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. Sorry, I thought I already had that opened up. The key thing to take away from this is that this code here with the authorized view, um, it doesn't matter how the person uh, logged in or was authenticated, this code to handle displaying things or not displaying things or determining who the uh, current user is, that code is the same. So whether it's server-side Blazor, client-side Blazor, whether we're using Microsoft, whether we're using Google, that final part of the code, that part stays the same. So here, as you see, I'm not logged in. If I go to fetch the data page, it says I'm not logged in. When I click log in, notice it's going to redirect me to Microsoft to log in. And unfortunately, because I was already logged in, it didn't show me the login screens, but it did authenticate me through Microsoft. And now when I go to fetch data, it takes a little moment for that server side, but see, it uh, shows that I'm logged in. And of course, the rest of the app works as normal. And if I refresh uh, the web browser, of course, it still keeps me logged in until I log out. Go ahead and stop that. And let me get the next one ready for us here and return back to the slides. Let's look at Google authentication. Again, we'll just create a normal Visual Studio project, create a new project, Blazor app, give it a name, and it just creates a very simple Again, we're back to server-side Blazor, but again, you could make this work with client-side Blazor too, but we just have a simple Blazor app actually with no authentication. We're going to go ahead and install a NuGet package. This time, we're going to install the Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.Authentication.Google, and like we had to set up authentication on uh, Azure for the Azure AD, for Google, we're going to go to Google Sign-In for Websites and configure a project. We'll give the project a name, we'll give the OAuth client a name, we'll select Other, and when we click Create, they will give us back a client ID and a client secret. We're going to copy that down, we'll need that for the next step. We'll return back to Visual Studio, open up the AppSettings.json file, and like we did with the Azure AD, this time we're going to add a Google uh, section with four properties, Instance, Client ID, Client Secret, and Callback Path. Use the code as you see it here, except replace the client ID and the client secret with the ones that you obtained earlier. In the startup file, like we did before, we have some uh, using statements. We have our configuration property. Now for our middleware, in this case, we are um, invoking uh, using cookies and we're um, configuring uh, adding Google. Notice here I'm um, asking for additional claims for example, I want to see the picture in, in the profile so that I can display the picture in the Google uh, profile in the application. So therefore, um, to access this later, I'm uh, invoking the HTTP context accessor. So I'm configuring that. Again, I use a cookie policy and use authentication. Now I'm going to implement my own login and logout pages. And the login page is actually quite straightforward. When a person comes to the page, uh, we declare the Google provider. We call challenge result. This will trigger that middleware that you saw uh, me configure in the startup file. The person will be sent to Google to uh, authenticate. When they come back, that's the section at the bottom. And essentially what this does is, is it creates a, a claims principle like we were doing before. And 
that pretty much sets the cookie. It does a redirect. The app uh, refreshes, and the person's logged in. For the sign out page, it simply calls sign out, which simply removes the cookie. We can go into our login control. Here at the top there, you can see that um, I'm going to have the avatar. This is where it's going to display uh, the avatar, the Google avatar. So in the procedural code, that's where I'm calling the HTTP context assessor so that I can pull um, that out of uh, the claims that were uh, generated. My main layout, I just have my reference to my login control. But then at that point, your authorized view uh, tags, all your cascading parameter stuff, all that works exactly the same as before. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. And I'll go ahead and run that. Again, you're seeing this code on the fetch data page where the authorized view looks exactly like it did with um, the other authentication that we did for Azure AD. So here, we're on the page. I'm not signed in. I click login. It redirects me to Google. Google, of course, takes care of the authentication, passes me back to the app, and you see I'm able to actually pull in my uh, avatar. And now the fetch data page is showing me that, OK, you're logged in, and we're now going to show you the page. And of course, I can log out. This guy wants to hang around. OK, so for the final example, jump back into my slides. So the final example will be cookie authentication. The reason why we're covering this is let's say that you had some sort of authentication that's just not covered by any other scenario. For example, let's say you want to authenticate someone against the mainframe. This is how you would do it. Go ahead and create an application, server-side Blazor app, manage NuGet packages. In this case, we're starting from scratch. This is bare bones, so we have a lot more packages to, uh, to install here. But we go ahead and install them. In the startup file, we add our course or using statements here. There was nothing to put into app settings so that we don't have that part. And for our middleware, we're just declaring cookie authentication. So we have a cookie policy at the top there, and at the bottom part, it just simply says we're adding authentication, and it's cookie authentication. We have to add um, the HTTP context accessor and the HTTP client. And of course, we have to wire up a, a couple more things here than normal because, you know, this is bare bones, so we have to do everything ourselves. But that's pretty much it. Now let's look at the login logout page. What's surprisingly here is that this looks pretty similar to what we were doing with uh, the Google one. Um, however, in this example, because I'm actually not doing authentication, I'm basically saying whatever's passed in, I'm just going to create a uh, claims principle and sign you in. But at, so it's a box in the middle. The, the box at the top basically signs you out to clear the cookie. But the one in the middle, that's where you could launch off into any sort of other authentication you wanted to do. And if you say, OK, the person should be logged in, you just create that claims principle, call the sign in, and they're signed in. It's really that simple. Sign out page looks pretty much exactly like before. It just calls sign out. So again, you've seen this before. The login control, I can use the authorized, not authorized uh, uh, sections. Everything will display, work as expected. Main layout, I have a reference to the login control. The app.razor, I can just wrap the whole thing in cascading authentication state. That lights it up for the entire application. The only caveat here is, is that if you're going to make a call into a server-side controller, with a Blazor server-side application, there's a couple of more steps that you uh, will need to do. So here I've got a server-side controller that will just uh, return the logged in person's name. It's very simple. Got a Razor page set up to call that. The highlighted thing simply shows that I'm just calling that get user. When I run the application, I sign in, creates a cookie. As you see, it says, hello, test user. So Blazor says the person's logged in. But when I make a call to that uh, server-side controller, it's blank. Why is it blank? Well, it turns out 
that with this scenario, you need to make sure the cookie is passed in the headers. So here it's showing you the code that you can use to grab the cookie, to pass it in the headers, and then everything will work um, as expected. So let's take a quick look at that as my final example. Close that, open that, run that. And also what I'll do here is I'm going to hit F12 so that we can actually see, right now I don't have a cookie here. I'm going to go ahead and say test, password. When I click login, if you can see there that the cookie was set. And that's why it says hello test. Of course my server side works. I hit refresh. I'm still logged in. Everything works. If I were to right click here and delete this cookie, when I hit refresh, notice I'm logged out. So it's pretty much just setting the cookie, Blazor sees that you have the cookie set, and everything pretty much works. All the code that I've covered here, as well as every single step, I know it went really fast, is on my website, blazorhelpwebsite.com, and I'll also be loading, uploading the code to the GitHub repo that they're setting up for the blazor.net conf. And that's it. Hey, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any questions right now from, uh, from Twitter. Um, however, I, was, I have one, and I was wondering, how, when you set up the form, when you were posting the cookie in that, is that something that I can also um, uh, provide extra metadata uh, besides just using a password, say, if I need an extra ID or anything like that, and, and authenticate that in the back end? Well, when you create the claims, um, uh, the claims principle, you can actually add uh, uh, more information in there. So in my example, I was trying to keep it fast and straightforward and simple, but you could put more information there. You can also set additional, just additional cookies. So I was showing the, a very straightforward, simplistic example, um, assuming that the extra information that people would want, they would probably put in the database and they just need to know what the username is. However, the scenarios are, are, are different. One more thing, you can use JWT, um, uh, so therefore the flow would be different. Um, however, in this case, I did concentrate on doing the cookie-based authentication because Dan mentioned earlier in the opening that the templates that they plan to ship for client-side Blazor in the future will probably be cookie-based authentication. No, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's it, with everything being so, I was new, people are just trying to figure out how to, again, take my old skill set and trying to mash it into Blazor and build great application with it. We actually, funny enough, we actually do have one question, and it's okay. right here. Uh, can I use other providers like Twitch or Yahoo to sign into with Blazor? Yes. So I try to quickly, you know, put Google in there. Um, so the, the Google example will probably be the flow that you would use for, you know, Twitch or something like that. If there is a .NET uh, library available, for example, I'm pretty sure I think uh, Twitter and Facebook have something like that. Um, otherwise, that cookie-based authentication that I showed, you should be able to hack away at that to uh, work with any provider. Perfect. No, that's great. Yeah. So it sounds like any provider that we have out there that supports OpenID and OAuth and those uh, op uh, those open standards, we should be able to use with Blazor, right? Yes. Perfect. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time uh, and uh, to share your talent and your passion for Blazor. Uh, that's it we have for now. We actually, I'm going to kick it I, over yeah. to Beth a I little bit. I was just going to mention, because Michael is a very humble person, um, someone is reminding us that uh, he's blazing through this massive presentation at .dot com, and I recommend checking out his blog for details, blazerhelpwebsite.com. So um, check out Michael's stuff. This is really good stuff. Um, now I know it's kind of like it's the middle of our afternoon now here on the uh, West Coast, and um, I wanted to just give a big shout out to everybody still watching. Here's someone watching uh, .dot com for the Learning Blazer from Honolulu. So it, it's a perfect time for you to watch in Hawaii right now. Um, I guess it's probably just right around lunchtime. So um, and I just want to go ahead and say everybody. 
go ahead and take a picture of where you are and uh, hashtag Donette Conf and we'll throw it up on the tag board too. Even if you don't have any questions, let us know where you are. I know we've had, we have thousands of people watching this concurrently. I know this. So I know you're out there. Um, if you don't have any questions, let's have some fun, okay? All right, so um, I think we're going to run a short video uh, while we get our next speaker set up. That is correct. Cool? Yep. All right, let's we'll go be to right break. back. Watching our previous series with Scott and Kendra on object oriented programming in C Sharp, this series is all about Link. So, what is Link? Yeah, so Link, it's in the name. It stands for Language Integrated Query. And the cool thing about Link is once you know Link, uh, you can use it for any data structure. So you can use it for XML documentation, arrays, SQL databases. It's pretty sweet. Collections, whatever. Exactly. Things not for Microsoft, others can use it, right? Yes. Cool. All right. So let's look at this using try.net, which is a tool that we built that helps you explore different libraries in Link. So in the description, you're going to see a link to our .NET try samples repo, which is the one I'm showing here. And in the README, there is the installation instructions to go ahead and get started with the .NET Core SDK and something called .NET Try, which is a .NET global tool. And all the instructions are right here. Right. So first you need .NET Core SDK. And yep. then once you have that, you can go ahead and clone the .NET Try um, samples off this GitHub repository. And I've already done that. So we're going to start with the 101 link samples. And then you just have to run a tool called .NET, which you learned about in the earlier series, and then do .NET Try. And that's going to start up a new browser window for me with all of these wonderful link samples. And once it loads up the browser, we're going to get a new localhost window on our space. And there we have 101 link samples and our friendly .NET bot. And we're not going to run all these. These are crazy. Yeah, I mean, link is powerful. So link let's start with one of the most common queries. Click right. the restriction operators link. All right. So restriction operators, the where keyword. And so I get this window, and I've got a run button. So now when I click Run, I get this other window that shows here's the results from our query. So this query, if we look at, it's looking for lower numbers from num in numbers, like you say, just like SQL in some ways, where num is less than 5. That's kind of that restriction operator for where. And then we select the number. Yeah, so and let's change that to a list. Right. So we we said we could do this with anything. So I'm going to change that numbers to a new list event. I'm going to have to change it on this side. That was one of the things we learned about earlier in our object oriented. That's the only change I have to make. I'm yeah, so you don't have squiggles. to change the query at all. It just yeah. works pretty much. And then we'll just run it again. And once again, there we go. All right, so let's look at a couple others here. So um, let's look at the properties of an object in the input sequence. So OK, so if I take this very next one, we've got a list of products. So that's some object oriented collection that we're building. And I'm looking at with that where clause here on anything where there's nothing in stock, right? So that should print everything that we've sold out. Those are the popular ones. And there, it's just looking at the same sequence, and it's printing out everything about that particular product. So what else can we do with this where method? Let's look at the, the last page, which shows the syntax for a where clause. OK. So um, this, this yeah. one does look different. Yeah, it's using a where method instead of the where keyword. That's right. So this one uses a where method. It actually does the same thing that we saw in these other ones that we were doing with this where clause and a keyword. What's different is the language compiler says translates one into the other. And there's a slightly different feature here. If you look at this where clause or this where method, we've got two different arguments. One is that index that says it's its position of that element in the sequence. So if we run this one, what we're going to see is in addition to the strings up above that 0, 1, 2, 3 with the letters, it also knows the corresponding number, the number 0, the number 1. And it has, it's printing out any words that are shorter than the value. So like the number 6 printed out has fewer letters than 6, and so on and so forth. And that's everything with the where method. Great. So let's look at that projections operator link right there. Right there? All right. Now we're on to select. We kind of saw some of these, but I'm going to just do one quick. So if we look, I've got one here where we're taking things in numbers and I'm mapping from one to another. So our first select just grabbed everything from our input sequence. And here you can see I'm taking something from a numbers collection. And what I'm selecting is the corresponding string from another array. So select lets us project into some other collection. And that's 
what we see in a lot of quick, just about every query, we'll see some kind of a where to filter something and some kind of a select to have some output sequence. So that was an intro to Link, and we also showed you how to use our try.net tool, and we also showed you all of the uh, 101 Link examples. And next, we're going to talk about the Link query syntax. See you then. Hey, today we're going to talk about async main. So Myra, I'm familiar with async and main, but these are smushed together. What is this language feature? Um, so that's a, a language feature that I was introducing, C Sharp 7.1, uh, and it allows you to add the async keyword to your main entry point. Okay, so why do we want to do that? Um, so when you want to run async methods from, from the main entry point, uh, before you kind of had to do not a hack, but it's like you mm -hmm. had to do a separate call into an async method because you could not await directly on your main method. Yeah, let's let look at an example of that workaround. Sure. Um, so here's what the old code looks like. Um, and so you would have your like regular void main uh, entry point. Uh, and then here's where I'm calling the do async work method with this, get a waiter, get a result. Um, that's kind of how we had to do it before. With this um, new feature, we can await for that. And instead of void, we can do async task and call that. So, but that still looks bad because I'm still having that separate code there. So I can go even further and await right here on the method and get rid of this method all completely. Oh, nice simplification. Yeah, so you, it looks much cleaner like that. Yeah, okay, so if I wanted to read more about async main, where would I go? Uh, so docs.microsoft.com is your go-to resource for C-sharp content. Um, so check it out, the what's new section in C-sharp 7.1, and we'll have links for more information. All right, thank you. So use async main whenever you have a console application that's returning an asynchronous oper operation so that you can actually add the task and task of type int return types. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Hi, today we're going to talk about expression bodied members. So, expression body members, they've been around. There were a yeah. few in uh, C Sharp 6, mm -hmm. and this is the little equal sign greater than operator. Yeah. And uh, so you can more easily declare um, single line expressions, but we could only use it for methods and read only properties. Yeah. So, what's new in C Sharp 7? So, C Sharp 7 introduced, expanded the scope of where you can apply them. So, you can use now on constructors, finalizers, uh, and get and set accessors on properties and indexers. Ooh, let's see what that looks like. Okay. So, here I have a class that have a few of the examples of where, what I was just talking about. So, this is the old syntax without an expression body member. Um, and so Visual Studio pops this little quick action icon that I can just use it to transform into an expression body member. Cool. So it will transform that single line expression and use the equal greater sign here. Mm -hmm. um, I have my, dis my finalizer here, um, and then I can apply the same logic here. So I'll use the keyboard now, control uh, period uh, to get that. Uh, transformation I can preview changes and I'll use that for the get accessor as well um, and so it makes it a cleaner code as oh you definitely can see. gets rid of some extra curly braces and yeah. white space we don't really need cool. exactly so if I wanted to learn more about expression body members where would I go uh, so docs.microsoft.com has a guide um, 
that explains all about expression body members when they were introduced and where you can use them. Great. All right, so use expression body members to more easily declare um, members that have only a single line expression inside of them. Yeah, and thanks to the community for implementing those features in C Sharp 7. Right, so that came from the community. Awesome. Thanks for watching. In this quick video, we're going to learn all about out variables in C Sharp 7. So Myra, what exactly are out variables? So in C Sharp 7, we introduced the ability for you to declare in line the out parameter on a method call. So for me, I'm very familiar with output parameters where I declare some variable and then I'd say, you know, try parse and I'd say out, you know, whatever that name of that parameter happens to be. Yeah. So now this is something different. Yeah, so it's just making your code look cleaner uh, by giving you the ability to declare in line. Uh, so I think we can just jump into the code and show how that looks like. Sure, let's take a look at your computer. Okay, so here we're in docs for Microsoft.com. And this is a traditional way of you doing an out parameter. So you have your method call and you had to declare a numerical result before you call the method. So with out parameters in C Sharp 7, you can remove that declaration and move it here and then just run it. So it makes it look cleaner, you have less code lines. Um, the other advantage of this is that you can use var here now because the compiler lot now knows what is the type of that parameter when you're calling that method. So you can just simplify your code by using var. Awesome. And then also, I'm guessing, once you declare it on that particular line, that variable is only within scope of that if block, right? Well, you can use it after it, but if you have nested ifs, then that's where you can have to control the scope. So if you have nested ifs, or so you will be in the scope of where um, that code is. So in this case, you could continue to use numeric result after that if statement because it's in still in the global scope. Awesome. Thank you so much. And now we've just learned all about doing out variables inside of C Sharp 7. Hey friends, I'm Chris and I'm a program manager on the NuGet team. Today Hey everybody, we are back. Sorry for the little longer break. We had to some more fun with Teams and Skype and all the fun internet things that happened, but guess what? We have Ryan Nowak on the phone right now, on a Teams call actually, so we can learn about how to scale our Blazor applications on Azure. How's it going, Ryan? Hey, Javier, good to hear from you. Glad to finally be on the call and be able to show my content. This is I, great. I know. We've had a lot of fun today, right? Trying to get all this going. Well, it's been, you know, it's good when your conference begins with like a snow day. That's right. Um, and everybody <laughs> being buried under mountains of snow. Um, so this has been exciting. Great. Well, so, uh, so we uh, make the most of your session. Let's get started. Take it away. Okay, great. I assume you can see. All right, let's get started. So um, Javier already introduced me. Uh, my name is Ryan Nowak. Uh, you can find me on Twitter if you want. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about scaling Blazor server, and in particular SignalR and the Azure SignalR service, and why these kinds of things are important for your scale up and scale out. Um, so about me, um, I'm, I'm a developer on the .NET and ASP.NET team at Microsoft. Um, I was engineer number two on Blazor, so I came into the project at the very, very early days um, before we had things like server-side Blazor, back when things were looking pretty different. Um, you'll be able to find all my presentation materials, demos, slides, etc., on my GitHub. 
uh, at that repository. Uh, sh shortly after the presentation is done, I will push the latest version. Um, and about some of the things that I work on, um, I've been part of the .NET Core project since the beginning, since before we called it .NET Core. Um, and I pretty much worked on just about everything um, within the ASP.NET Core side of, of .NET Core. So um, MVC, Razor, Bl uh, now Blazor, lots of different stuff. So if you use .NET Core, you use ASP.NET Core, um, chances are we've crossed paths in one way or another. Uh, so before we can really talk about scaling Blazor server and scaling up Blazor server with the Azure SignalR service, we need to get a sense of what is Blazor server, what is a Blazor server app, and how it sort of works. So we've probably seen a lot of Blazor WebAssembly demos today. Uh, what makes Blazor server unique, um, probably among all of the different web frameworks and UI frameworks out there in the world, is the way that Blazor server is implemented and the way it works. Um, so you've got ASP.NET Core running on the server with your Razor components running .NET inside your application. And you've got users out there with a browser and a browser DOM that's being manipulated by the Blazor application. And you can sort of think about those yellow arrows in the middle as like events coming back from the browser and DOM updates going to the browser. And there's just this never-ending cycle of the browser saying like, hey, I got some information for you to process and the server saying, okay, here's how to change the UI in response to that. And there's a few more things that fly back and forth, but basically that's the gist of it. Um, and you can think about that thing in the middle um, that SignalR with the poor contrast that you can probably barely make out. Um, SignalR is the communication mechanism between Blazor running on the server and the piece of Blazor that runs inside your browser in a server-side Blazor app. And that's really going to be our focus today. So I'm going to jump out of slides and we're going to jump into a quick demo. Um, I've got a little app here and I'll go ahead and run that up. And I'm just going to .NET run this app and it's going to fire up. Uh, meanwhile, I'll bring it up in a browser here. And it's just running on port 5000. We're still waiting. We're still waiting. I don't know why it's slow. I think it's only slow when you're, when you're demoing something. There we go. All right, let's refresh this. And here we go. And we're going to talk about this page later, so I'm just going to hide that real quick. And I want to focus your attention to this this sort of UI that I have here, as well as some of the things that are going to be going down, going on down in the browser tools. So you've probably seen a lot of counter pages before if you've watched a lot of Blazor demos in the past. And mine is special because it's got this little very exciting banner here. And when I click this button, you can see that not only is the count going to go up, um, this banner is going to toggle back and forth between bold and not bold. And this is going to be our little sample to talk through for the purposes of demonstrating how Blazor works. So one of the things that's really neat about Chrome, I can come over here and I can highlight this thing. And Chrome will give me a nice visualization. I think other browsers do this too, by the way. Um, but Chrome can give me a nice visualization of what changes when I click the button. So if you look down here in the gutter here in the sort of elements view or the, the, the view of what's in the DOM, if I click, you're going to see some pink flashes. And you're going to see that I can prove that my, my style tag is collapsing and then going to say font weight bold. Yeah, I know, boo hiss, inline style, you know, throw everything at me. Um, you can also see that your current count here, this little, this little number, we're just updating that little span of text, right? And that's the only things that are changing is these two things changing. And the, you get a key insight about Blazor about the, from, from this demo, and by the way, this is true of both Blazor Server and Blazor we, uh, WebAssembly, is that Blazor does, in general, the smallest DOM update that's reasonably possible. So we're, we're literally just updating this one attribute and this one span of text. Um, if Blazor were throwing away the whole page and kind of just pasting over it with a whole new HTML document, you would see the whole thing light up pink when I click this button. And it's really just that one part. So the other thing that we're going to learn from this app is here in the network tab. And if I refresh this page, we'll be able to capture the network traffic and I can click on this, this web socket here, this, which is probably what we're going to spend the bulk of the time talking about today. Um, and if I look at this web socket and Chrome shows me kind of what's going on, I can see there's a bunch of different messages that are coming through this web socket. So you see protocol blazer pack that tells us we're doing blazer. And then there's a whole bunch of binary messages going back and forth here of varying sizes. And every time I click my button, 
you'll see that there's a few more messages that get exchanged here. So you got a 291, a 229, a 27. I'll click the button again. I got a 291, a 211, and a 27. So every time I click this button, you can see those messages are flying over the internet. And ultimately, that communication with the server, that communication over this WebSocket right here, is the thing that's kind of making our application run. Let me jump back to my slides real quick. So we've seen sort of how Blazor Server works. We're, we're updating the DOM, we're updating the UI, and we're sending messages over that WebSocket connection. Uh, looking at my code, this is the code that goes along with this demo. I've got this fancy span component, which is a component I wrote. It's, it's pretty useful. I should probably publish it. And it just toggles back and forth between bold and not bold. Other than that, it's a normal span. Um, I've also got an event handler hooked up to my button so that I can call this increment count button, uh, increment count method every time that button is clicked. And I'm just going to update the current count variable, um, which will trigger an update to both my fancy span style and to the current count display. So how does Blazor update UI? Well, on a conceptual level, you write components. Components respond to events. And then when components respond to events, they do what we call is a render. A render means basically that this code that's right here that represents all that HTML runs. Um, and the output of render is basically a list of, like, what are the HTML elements? What are the attributes? What are the text? What are all the things that need to appear in that document or need to exist in that document. Uh, you can think about that as being what happens when you do a render. Uh, the other thing that we learn about a render is that a render can trigger updates to other components. So in this case, like, we need to update both the counter page, which is this page, as well as our fancy span. Um, and the way that that actually works is because the parameter value of our fancy span has changed because the current count has changed, so is bold is going to go from true to false to true to false and back again. We know that we need to re-render fancy span. And those are some of the things that the Blazor runtime does for us. So in this case, when we click the button, well, what do we need to update? Ultimately, when we do the render pass of the counter component, we see that that little span of text where current count lives needs to update because the frame that represents that piece of text is going to be different. Uh, likewise, we see that fancy span will need to re-render itself because we see that the parameter value that we're passing to fancy span is going to be different every time we update. Uh, that's kind of the essence of how Blazor works when you do rendering. So what happens next? Well, the components produce their frames, which represent all the things that show up on the page, as well as represent the other components that they contain. The runtime takes these these frame outputs from the components, and it processes each component that produced an output. And for each component, it stores the previous output, and it can compare the current output to the previous output and produce a really efficient diff. And you can think about that diff as sort of like, a, like an assembly language, like a low-level set of instructions to the computer, to the browser, about how do you get from the current state to the future state. Then the runtime sends that diff back to the browser, and that's what's going to go over that WebSocket connection. So before we talk a little bit more about SignalR, I'm just going to pull back the curtain another little step here, which is that if we highlight one of these messages, you can see down at the bottom, and it's, it's kind of small and tucked away, you can see down at the bottom what was in that message. So this 291 byte, you can see it has an up arrow. This was sent from the client to the server, which is what the up arrow means. And you can see that it's got, well, it's got some JSON in it. That's, that's kind of what this is. It is a binary message, but it contains some JSON. And if you've done some DOM programming or some browser programming before looking at Blazor, you'll probably recognize this as all the data that you get when you click a button in, in a browser-based application. Like, we literally serialize the event data to the server as JSON so that you can get it on the server. So if you've used event handlers in Blazor and you've seen the same kinds of data that you get in the browser, that's how that works. We send it from the client to the server. We also know that for the typical case, it's not that big. 291 bytes is not a very big message. It's not a big amount of data to send back and forth every time you click a button. Um, then the response to that is this thing called a render batch. Now, there's a bunch of stuff here that's not going to show up in any sort of readable way, and that's because of that low-level instruction format that I talked about, that diff format. But the one thing that I will call out is you can see something here that kind of looks right, kind of looks like text, 
it says style dot font weight bold. There's my cool inline CSS. So you can see sort of the makings of what is going to show up in the UI. Um, you can also see that eight is here. This is probably what uh, what toggle the current count or something like that at some point. Um, so you can see that roughly it's a binary format. It's not intended to be human readable, but it roughly represents what you see in the UI. Um, the Blazor code in the browser is what's going to decode that and understand how to send it back and forth. So what is SignalR and what is SignalR's role in all of this? Well, SignalR is an application framework that's part of ASP.NET and it's useful for doing two-way real-time communication. So you think about your typical browser-based application, pre-Blazor, of course, in the old days. Uh, you would go to the server, you would load the page, you would get the HTML, and that was the end of the story. Well, um, that's because HTTP is a two-way um, request-based system where you get a request and a response. Um, well, there's a lot of user experiences that we use today that are like more dynamic and more proactive and more real-time than that. We, we tend to use the word real-time to describe something that's not request-response, um, at least within the bounds of the web. So SignalR is an application framework that's useful on its own for building those kinds of experiences that require two-way communication between a browser and a server and require that kind of communication to be done in real-time. Uh, SignalR is an RPC-based framework, so it's like you define a hub on the server, which is pretty similar to defining an ASP.NET Core controller, and then the client can call methods on the server. Likewise, the server can call methods on the client. Uh, SignalR supports a variety of different communication patterns. You can have one-to-one, -one, you can have many, you can have different groups and broadcasts, and it's really designed for all different kinds of communication paradigms that you might need to do when you're writing applications that are real-time or are event-driven. Um, likewise, you can do communication using SignalR from the client to the server and server to the client. Um, and SignalR has a server implementation in .NET. Um, there's, one, there's one for older ASP.NET, and likewise, there's one for ASP.NET Core. Uh, but there are clients in many languages. I think there's C++, there's JavaScript, there's a bunch of different clients that you can use. There's Java as well. Um, there's a bunch of different clients that you can use to talk to SignalR uh, on the server running in anything. And in addition to that, SignalR supports many transports. Uh, and what I mean by transports is like, well, how does the communication with the server actually take place? Because we said that HTTP is request response. Um, and the answer is that there have been a bunch of different technologies that have existed for this over periods of time. So in the beginning, the way that these techniques were done was with something called long polling. Um, because long polling just relies on HTTP. It's a very primitive technology. And the way that long polling works is the client sends a request to the server and basically says, hey, server, tell me when the next thing happens. Uh, that's a way to allow the server to communicate with the client. So the client sends a request to the server that's just basically going to hang out until the server has something to say. So then the server has an event, it triggers a response, and then the client has to immediately start a new request to basically start waiting again for the next event. Um, upside of long polling, it can be supported on pretty much any browser because it's a very old technique and a very old technology. It just requires HTTP. Downside of long polling, well, low bandwidth and low, um, low bandwidth and low um, sort of like high latency because you might need to open a new, you need to send a new request um, before you can get a response again. If the server has a lot to say, it's probably not going to work very well. Um, after long polling, there came along something called server-side events. Server-side events actually use the same request and response and allow the server to just stream out individual events. So the client creates an event source. This is a JavaScript API, um, which opens a request to the server. And then the server can trigger multiple events within the scope of the same request. Um, so that's not really, really two-way. It's more of a one-way pipe. So if you're doing server-side events, you still want sort of a side channel for the client to be able to communicate with the server. So server-side server -side events are somewhat new of a technology. It's been around for maybe, maybe seven or eight years, maybe slightly longer. But they don't really see a ton of usage in the wild um, because something better came along. Another thing that's better is WebSockets. 
So WebSockets basically op just open a two-way pipe over HTTP. So the client makes a request to the server and says, hey, server, I'd like this to be a web uh, WebSocket. And then the server says, yeah, that's okay with me, and they open a WebSocket. And then they have a bidirectional pipe in which to communicate. And a WebSocket basically works like a TCP connection from the point of view of the code you write, where you don't really have to juggle the details of the protocol. You just send the messages back and forth. Um, WebSockets are currently kind of the state of the art in terms of bidirectional client server communication. And WebSockets are kind of like what you hope you're using if you're on ser server side Blazor, or really what you hope you're using if you're using any of these technologies because they're the most modern and the best. Um, some older versions of Windows or some older browsers may not support WebSockets, but other than that, there are fewer drawbacks compared to the other technologies. So those are some of the transports and some of the kinds of things that SignalR can do. SignalR basically provides you the same API and the same programming experience, which regardless of which one of those underlying transports are using. So if you're programming to SignalR, you don't really care if your client is using uh, server sent events or your client is using long polling or your client is using WebSockets because SignalR is kind of higher level than that and hides those details from you. Blazor uses SignalR down in its guts, um, which is why Blazor is able to work with long polling or Blazor is able to work with WebSockets. And we don't really care about the details other than wanting the one with the best performance. So Azure SignalR service is an Azure service that exists to help scale up and scale out uh, usage of SignalR in the cloud in Azure. Um, now, the reason why you might want Azure SignalR is that you might need to, say, uh, have multiple apps that all communicate through the same uh, sort of SignalR backplane. You might want to scale your usage of SignalR up to thousands of connections. Um, you might want to have one, one IP address or one address that clients connect to, regardless of which instance of your backend they're talking to and get a uniform experience. Um, you might be deploying on app service or one of the other environments in Azure where you don't get access to a ton of WebSockets. So you can basically think about Azure SignalR service as like your dedicated service to help scale up the SignalR part of your application and the WebSocket part of your application independent of uh, the rest of your application. You might not need too much processing power to actually serve a Blazor server app, um, but you might want to offload the WebSocket processing capability um, either to reduce resources or to increase the number of connections that you can handle. And the SignalR service is here to help you with that. One of the really nice things about the SignalR service is that using it now, uh, I think as of Donna Core 3, is just, add, just adds a NuGet package to your project. You don't actually have to write any code. So you don't have to do the dance where you say, like, well, I don't have this in my local environment, so I can't run it. I need to ifdef this, and I need to switch by environment. Uh, using the Azure SignalR service ends up being pretty transparent to your application. Uh, it just adds a NuGet package. Um, so how to visualize this and how to think about the role of the SignalR service. You've got your ASP.NET Core app there. You're serving some pages, and you're doing server-side Blazor. And if you're not using the SignalR service, then all of your web traffic and all of your SignalR service is all going directly to your app. If you add the SignalR service, then your web traffic is going to your app, your SignalR traffic is going to the Azure SignalR service, and it's sort of just getting bounced back to your app. That's that, that sort of grayish arrow in the middle there. Now, why would you care about this? Why, why do you actually care? Um, the answer is in the size of the arrows. So imagine if you had like a million clients or like 100,000 clients or 5,000 clients. Like that's 5,000 connections to the Azure SignalR service in this one. If you're in the first example, that's 5,000 connections to your website as well. So that's a lot of resources that need to be allocated in your website to handle the details of processing the WebSocket connections. And that's a lot of connections inbound and outbound that your app itself needs to be able to make. What happens when you're using the Azure SignalR service is that those connections get multiplexed between Azure, Sig Azure SignalR and yours. So Azure SignalR and your app will open a measly five connections between each other and will multiplex the connection, the, all of the transport data over a very fast network connection between Azure SignalR and your app. So the result is your app basically does less work handling the WebSocket part, 
Um, you can scale much higher in terms of number of connections you can have because Azure SignalR service is purpose built for that for that reason. Uh, reduce load on your app, reduce number of connections you need, and it has a bunch of really nice features if you start talking about scaling out a Blazor server side app. So one of the things that Blazor server side needs is it needs what we call stickiness in web terms. Uh, when you do a when you do a request to a Blazor server side app. It wants, the, it wants the WebSocket connection to be opened to the same server that served the HTML. Um, likewise, uh, when you, if you get disconnected, which would be unfortunate, but if you get disconnected from that WebSocket connection, Blazor has a reconnection feature. The browser client will try to reconnect and will try to put you back into the same state. Uh, that you were in before. Well, since all your state lives on the server, what would happen if your reconnection went back to a different server? Your state wouldn't be there, so it wouldn't work. So when you actually scale out Blazor Server by deploying multiple apps, uh, multiple apps via app service or something like that, if you're using Azure SignalR service or anything else that provides a sort of sticky, sticky sessions for WebSockets, then you don't really have to think about these kinds of server affinity problems. They're just done for you. Um, the server that serves your HTML is going to serve your WebSocket because it's going to be sent there by the SignalR service. And if you get disconnected, the server that you reconnect back to is going to be the same one, so your state should hopefully still be there. So in that way, the SignalR service is pretty useful for scaling out your app. Um, what it looks like for you to hook up Azure SignalR is if you're publishing to Azure, and you're like ready to go, you probably see this warning um, down in the bottom here if you haven't configured Azure SignalR. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and publish. Like Nothing's going to stop you from doing that. Uh, but what's in that sort of green box at the bottom? That's not in the Visual Studio UI, by the way. I added that so you could see it. Um, you get a warning that you're not using SignalR. Um, and what this is is Visual Studio is able to detect basically that it's a Blazor server app. And it's able to say, hey, you, you really might want to think about this, um, in particular if you're deploying to app service and you're not using Azure, Azure SignalR. You really might want to think about that. Um, the next thing, if you click Add, it's going to take you here and it's give, going to give you choices about different dependencies. Um, then you pick the Azure SignalR service from this list and it'll do that. Um, so some of the considerations for scaling up Blazor Server um, and scaling up the number of connections that you can take. Um, first of all, Blazor Server needs to keep um, Azure SignalR can give you that. Uh, Blazor Server needs a WebSocket or another SignalR mechanism connection per user. Um, what we find with App Service or other Azure services or other cloud-based services in general is they tend to under-provide on the number of WebSockets you can, can, you can handle in an app. So you tend to have, if you provision sort of standard app on App Service, sort of reasonable amount of capacity to serve uh, web traffic, but a pretty low amount of capacity to be able to serve WebSocket traffic. Um, Azure SignalR service is a dedicated service to offload that WebSocket traffic or that other SignalR traffic so that your app can do app stuff. Uh, and it means that you could probably get away with a smaller number of app deployments if you're using Azure SignalR service um, because you're, you're offloading the WebSockets to something purpose-built for that. Um, the Azure, if you look down at the bottom in the details, um, Azure does document what the limits are for WebSockets on various app service SKUs or various other environments. Um, the, the limits that they say that they have for these things are kind of like best effort. Like they'll, they'll give you at least that. You might find that in some cases you're able to actually do more connections than they say you're able to do. I was doing some testing on this earlier today and found that I could exceed the number of connections that they said I had available. Um, but what that really means is that it's not reliable. They're not guaranteeing you that you'll always be able to make that number of connections. It's kind of a, well, if they're available, you can do it. And if not, it won't, it won't work. Um, I also found that when I was doing that kind of testing, comparing the amount of load on my app with and without the Azure SignalR service for same number of connections, there was significantly more load on my app when I was not using the SignalR service. So it's definitely a factor to consider if you're planning uh, how much capacity you need to put Blazor Server in production. Um, another word on sort of planning Blazor Server capacity and thinking about how, how your application might scale. Um, these are the results of an experiment that I did recently. And you should think about these. Don't think about these numbers as necessarily applying to your app. Think about these numbers as sort of like, this is where the framework puts you. 
um, everything that your app adds on top of this is is kind of yours to think about and yours to plan for. So um, I did this experiment by basically setting up a couple of VMs and opening a, million, a bunch of connections in between them. And I only went up to about 5,000 in this case. Um, what I find is that if, if you've got a very simple like template style of app, each connected client you have reserves about 86 kilobytes of server-side memory. So there's about 86 kilobytes of memory that you're going to have reserved for each client. Um, and th again, that's what the framework requires of you. So as you're thinking about capacity and scaling and size of your Blazor app, think about the number of clients you need to support. How many clients and how many users do you expect to have at a time? Um, what's what's the max? What's the average? And also think about what kind of data are you going to manipulate in your app? What kind of things are going to be in memory? What kind of things are you going to access in the app? Does everybody need to load one megabyte of data into a data table? Uh, plan for that. Add that to that 86 kilobyte number. Um, your usage is going to vary pretty dramatically on the needs of the application. Uh, the other the other sort of note here is. The things to think about in terms of planning scale, um, for the most part, we think that for Blazor server-side apps, the things that matter most are like the amount of memory you have available to you. Um, you're, you're probably more likely to run out of memory than you are to run out of CPU or run out of some other resource other than WebSockets. Um, so that's probably the first thing that you should think about when you're, when you're planning your capacity. And again, this is based on a framework, a frame, what the framework does based on creating a really simple app and then sort of test driving it. Um, the way that this is tested is we have a headless client for the Blazor, Blazor protocol that we use for security testing and a bunch of reliability testing that the team developed. Um, and I basically use that to just open a bunch of connections and test drive an app. Um, this, is what, this is what the memory usage looks like, uh, all of these data points after doing uh, triggering a garbage collection. Um, and that's with each of these clients doing some work. So each of these clients is going to that counter page and clicking the counter button every every half second or so. So it's not 5,000 connections sitting idle. It's 5,000 connections doing here, uh, actually doing something in the app. So let's talk about how we can sort of visualize connections and how we can look at these sort of things. I've got another demo running here. And I've actually deployed, um, in this case, I've actually deployed this demo to the cloud and deployed it to uh, Azure App Service. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start running this. And we will, um, I'm going to get to the right tab here. I'm going to go ahead and deploy this and run my script. And then we can talk about what it's doing while that's running. Okay, and I don't have my scripts folder here. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this locally then since I appear to be missing a folder here. So. I'm going to go back to this tab, and I'll go ahead and start running my demo app. And I'm going to talk about this um, connections page that I sort of skipped over again here. And in the meantime, I'm going to start running something. So I'm .NET run-p, my demo client, and the arguments I'm going to pass to it. Run this with localhost 5000. And let's go up to... Go up to 500 connections because team seems to be putting a lot of effort on my machine. So this is going to start opening connections in a few seconds here, and it's going to start sort of chugging away with this local web server. So if I come back to my app running here, and I refresh, I'm going to go to home, and this is going to start updating. I have a background timer on this page, and it's going to start updating. So this this component in this this page here is just basically running a little timer loop. And every little bit, it's going to track the latency of its connection to the server. And it's going to track my number of active connections. Um, and you can see that sort of going there. This thing's, this thing's updating about every three seconds or so. So 500 connections, not super exciting. Let's try, uh, hot, let's try a higher number. Let's try going to 5,000 and see if we can do it. And again, this is just running locally on my machine for now. I had an Azure demo set up. Um, seemed to have lost it. So I'm not going to I'm not going to waste your time trying to track down what happened to those files. Um, in the meantime, let's sort of look at the let's look at the code of this, and I'll sort of show you what's going on here so we can understand this a little bit better. So we're just going to bring up code VS Code over here. 
so again, see, we're we're chugging away here and getting more and more connections. And you can see the latency here is still pretty low because I'm on the same I'm on the same machine. I'm running locally. And if I come over here to VS Code, hopefully this will have loaded in and we can look at some of the stuff. It was not open the right. So it's not in the right folder. So we can talk about what's going on in this app and how this kind of works. I think people might appreciate a little bit seeing sort of how this is put together and how I'm measuring these things because you might be interested in doing some of these things on your own. So what's going on in my index page is I have got a timer running here. Um, the most important thing that I will point out to anybody anytime I say the word timer and blazer in the same sentence, implement I disposable, please. Um, so this component creates a timer. It also is disposable so that when it goes away, it will stop the timer. Um, what I'm doing inside of my timer loop is I'm making a JS interop call and I'm just timing it. So I've got my stopwatch here. I'm starting a new one. I'm making a JS interop call to this ping function, and I'm capturing the number of elapsed milliseconds. If we flip over to my page, where uh, this is my host page, I, this, this is all it takes. This is all it takes to measure your latency to your server. So this page is just going to, in real time, every couple of seconds, update and show you what your latency is. Um, as far as measuring the number of active connections and being able to track the active connections, um, we have this feature called the circuit handler. Uh, circuit handler lets you attach to some events, so you can be notified when there's a connection coming up and a connection going down. Um, and I'm just keeping track of basically what are all the circuit IDs that I have available. You should think of a circuit, uh, it's a term that I made up actually, a circuit is a browser tab. It's the equivalent of a browser tab um, in Blazor server-side terms. The reason why we call it circuit and not connection is that Blazor has reconnection. So a circuit can span multiple connections. That's why we use the term for it. So I'm just keeping track of how many circuits I have open via this little like uh, concurrent dictionary here. And I have a connection tracker service that is just keeping track of those things that gets incre incremented and decremented. And then in my index page, this loop is going to run, I think I said, every three seconds. I'm going to capture the latency. I'm going to capture the number of ac active connections. I'm going to say um, status change. I'm going to set what time um, what time I updated it, and that's the whole thing that powers. Um, that's the whole thing that's powering this UI. That's really all it takes to sort of see what's going on with your scalability. Um, you can see now that we've got up upwards of a thousand or so. Um, this is starting to chug down and starting to be a little bit slow on my poor little Mac that's trying to do uh, Teams and Skype and this at the same time. Um, Anecdotally, when I've measured this, what I typically find is that um, the client will end up using more resources than the server. Um, so if you do this, if you do any sort of testing of load, um, you can you can sort of look at what we've done and crib from that. Um, but my my advice would be to try and try and test as real of a situation as you might actually encounter, um, because you might find and and check yourself because you might find that your uh, load testing setup actually requires more resources than the server, um, which is the case with mine right here. So with that, I think I'm out of I'm out of sort of stuff to say. Um, hopefully this has been useful and you've you've enjoyed hearing about server-side Blazor and scaling and um, Azure SignalR and all the all the aspects of deploying and scaling. So I'm going to turn it back over to Javier. Hey Ryan, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this is really great. Uh, quick note, everybody, we're actually for .NET Conf we use SignalR service behind the scenes. It's a great platform where it can scale up to all, all you viewers uh, out there, and it's it's great. So thank you so much, Ryan and team, for all the work that you have. Unfortunately, we don't have any questions, and we're right at time. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to pass it to Beth Massey, so she can uh, kind of go through some of the community tweets that we've been receiving through the uh, through the conference. Yay, thanks, Javier. Right. Yeah, so I uh, asked you guys uh, last session to start uh, throwing up some cool tweets of where you are. Uh, this one actually looks very familiar to what it looks like in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, or Middleton, sorry, Wisconsin looks very familiar to what it looks like here in Redmond um, in the snow. Thanks for watching there. Um, we've got in the UK, Ben Haddleton here is uh, hooked this right up, casting into the living room. Um, coming up, he's sticking around until Jeff Fritz is going to be on at 1 a.m. his time. So. 
Jeff. Stay tuned for Jeff. He's going to talk about uh, Blazor for web form developers. Um, and uh, Cody with David, look at that. Cute. We've got uh, his group of his posse basically watching with him. So keep your pictures go coming. Uh, we'll get you up on the tag board. Uh, next, we have an awesome presentation with Daria and Fabio on uh, serverless apps, building serverless apps with Blazor. So take it away, guys. Hi, thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here and talk to you about building serverless web applications with Blazor. I'm Daria Grigoriou, and I work in the Azure Functions team in the um, program manager role. I'm Fabio Cavalcanti. I'm also on the Azure Functions team in the engineering team for functions. When we talk about serverless web apps, we're really talking about the concept of distributed microservices. This is a design pattern and architecture. And the two main components that we're going to focus on today are the client front end experience, basically the implementation of a web app with static content and without web servers, and the dynamic backend implemented with serverless APIs. In the context of realizing this design pattern specifically with Blazor WebAssembly, let's just revisit the elements. With the distributed microservices, you can enjoy independent development, independent um, DevOps lifecycle, which makes versioning really easy. You can also mix technologies, programming languages, hosting platforms, and um, this way you get fault tolerance and uh, really good granularity in your development. Now when we go to the client, the front end, you can use Blazor WebAssembly to create rich web apps. They have reusable UI components that are running directly in the browser. You can implement your dynamic backend, your serverless API with Azure Functions. And this way you get high productivity development, um, especially with our programming model that is able to streamline development. And you also get the benefit of adaptive scale, dynamic scale that is based on events, which enables you to pay only for what you use. So how do we go about designing some of the serverless solution? How do we take a, a, an application, a Blazor app, and designing that to, to leverage some of the serverless offerings that we have? So we want to start out with this very high level uh, diagram, a uh, very high level overview of how we are breaking up this application into the different components that, that we're using as part of the overall solution. So we continue to have our, our Blazor app, but now the Blazor app is being served up, all of the, the static content is being served up from Azure Storage. Um, we're deploying there, uh, that, that is eliminating the need for us to have a web server in place. Uh, so we're getting all of our contents when the, the user first comes in um, and issues a request on the browser. That's how they're getting that the Blazor app to run locally. Once the Blazor app is now running in my browser, all of my API calls, all of the communication um, in this particular case to retrieve the data that we need to provide the information requested by the, the user is being served up from an Azure function. So we, we're exposing a set of uh, different APIs from Azure functions, which is uh, now also uh, abstracting away a couple of different serverless services that we, we have in Azure, um, namely, in this case, Cosmos DB and Cognitive Services. So if we, if we start diving into looking into each one of those components, um, you've been hearing about Blazor all day today, uh, but we thought we'd have a, a quick um, recap here, just talk a little bit about what's, what that's giving us. So we have uh, a, a reusable, uh, that's a framework that provides a way for us to build reusable UI components that are implemented in C-sharp. They are written in .NET, uh, our language of choice, the language we're familiar with, uh, .NET combining, combining that with HTML and CSS um, for UI. We're running .NET uh, in WebAssembly, um, and uh, given, that gives us the ability to leverage the, the rest of the .NET ecosystem, not only, from, uh, uh, not only giving us the ability to consume dependencies um, available um, in .NET, but also use common uh, .NET patterns and uh, all of the .NET tooling that we are familiar with. Uh, we're combining that with Azure Functions. So if we start looking at Functions, um, Functions is really a service that gives us the, the, the ability to react to events. 
and write our business logic and all of our code to react to um, what we call trigger, um, triggered events. Um, those events can range all the way from an, an HTTP request and something as simple as a, a queue message on storage, all the way up to um, a change feed and document change notification from Cosmos DB. When we combine that with uh, uh, the pre-built integration that you have as part of the, the function service, um, you have the ability to react to those events, focus on your business logic, and uh, generate a uh, take-in input that comes from some of the, some of the pre-built integrations we have, uh, but also generate output that will talk to storage, Cosmos DB, and a number of other uh, pre-built integrations that we have in functions. And we typically refer to those as uh, bindings. And the bindings are an ever-growing list, so um, you can check back in a little bit of time and you'll see the list that is continuing to grow. So when we're leveraging and using bindings, what does that programming model look like? Right. So we have a, a quick example here, which is actually taken from uh, the demo app we're going to be walking through um, uh, during the presentation, showing how we are actually using Cosmos DB in this particular case. Um, what you notice here is that we have a declarative model um, that, where I have the ability to configure my, my binding. Um, and uh, I can continue to focus on my business logic, the, the logic that, that matters to the problem that, that I'm trying to solve. Uh, in this particular case, you notice that we're not using um, the, the SDK directly. I surely have the ability to do so if I wish to do so. But having the ability to just leverage the, the binding capability gives me that productivity boost. Um, I, in this particular case, we're just working with the document that's been provided as an argument to my function. So you get the same kind of benefits that you get uh, uh, from um, Blazor in functions. Um, that familiar development experience, um, you have the ability to use your, uh, Visual Studio as your primary IDE, the .NET tooling. Um, this is running on top of .NET Core. Um, so you get the full power of the .NET ecosystem, uh, the ability to consume dependencies, um, bring in anything that you need in order to, to solve the problem um, that you're trying to, to solve within functions and um, take advantage of those dependencies and the ability to, to continue to use the same patterns um, that you typically use in your other .NET applications. Um, now for example, things like dependency injection, which we'll take a look, a brief look at uh, a little later. It sounds like Blazor and Azure Functions fit well together. It's, it's a great combination, yes. To illustrate some of these concepts, let's go to a demo. The demo for today is implementing a question and answer game. And this question and answer game, of course, is implemented using Blazor, um, especially um, for this context, Blazor WebAssembly. And it calls into an API powered by Azure Functions. So we can ask a question here, like, what are Azure Functions features? And we see an answer about um, the key Azure Functions features that we can go and read. This is coming from our interaction of Azure Functions with Cognitive Services Q&A Maker from a knowledge base that we already populated with serverless specific topics. Now, we actually want to use Azure Functions to abstract the different kinds of services that we're working with. So we also created the ability to generate answers based on keywords. So one of them is meaning. So let's ask, what is the meaning of life? Easy question. And um, if you don't like the answer, you can ask again and again until you find something that you like. So I'm going to settle on this one. Um, I think serverless technologies may not be the meaning of life, but they can make your life more meaningful and more productive. I'm happy with that. And I just want to call attention to the fact that here, Functions is really wrapping a multitude of services and really being able to abstract complexity and distribute business logic across all of those. 
Another thing to notice here is that we are going to Azure Front Door, which is aggregating my client and my API. So we'll talk more about that later. Now, how did we make that happen? And one interesting point is to look at the inception of the developer experience. So here we have uh, these, both the client and the server running in uh, Visual Studio. And we have uh, Blazor WebAssembly uh, calling into our um, API. And then we have our Azure function here. And uh, Fabio talked earlier about the programming model. So you notice here that we are using um, the Cosmos DB binding, and we're also calling into uh, the Q&A service. So what we can do is um, we can run this locally. It's actually already running. And I can um, even set up breakpoints and um, work with the local debugging experience. If I go back here, I have this running locally. So I'm going to ask another question. What is Blazor? Let's submit. And we have a breakpoint here. And I can go and um, I can debug. I can work with this answer. I don't like this answer, so I'm going to change it to Blazor is a great idea. Let's continue. And there we go. So what, what is really interesting here is that this is not running an emulator for Azure Functions. Right, right. When you run locally, you're really, you're really running against the, the same exact runtime um, packaged with the set of tools that, that we, we make available for a local development experience. But it's the same exact runtime that you would be running, that you will be running against if you deploy your application to Azure. Uh, which gives you a full fidelity environment, right? It gives you that, that assurance that if something is working um, locally, if you validate that, that things are, are working against your, your local set of development tools, um, they'll likely continue to work as you deploy. Um, so you're running against the, the, the full end-to-end -end runtime. One of the things that I did notice here is that, yeah, you're highlighting the fact that we're using um, a feature here, um, injecting our, our service directly. So it's just an example here as part of your, your service and your code where you are using some common .NET patterns that you may be fami familiar with in contexts outside of functions. Uh, and you're registering that service and using that uh, from functions. So anytime your function executes, that service is automatically injected, um, giving you the ability to, to just manage that service and use that directly from, from your function. They have the lifetime of that service managed by, by functions itself. And uh, the other thing that we mentioned earlier is that you really don't need to learn all the APIs and SDKs for services that you want to bind to, which is the case with um, Cosmos DB here as well. Right. So you can notice that I'm, I'm just being um, very direct in how I write my code and referencing this. Um, really without any kind of um, SDK or API interactions. Right, there's, there's very little in this code that, that is uh, specific to Cosmos DB, right? And this goes back to the point of really being able to focus on your business logic. So now that we looked at the local development experience, let's go back to the slides for a moment. And um, let's just um, move on to how do we host all of these components for serverless web apps in Azure? So for this particular um, example, this particular demo, uh, as we, we saw in the, the initial diagram that we had, we are using a couple of different serverless options uh, from Azure. So we have a, a, a couple of different services uh, to in interact with. Um, the first one being Azure Storage. Uh, we're using a feature of Azure Storage that gives us the ability to host uh, static content, which works very well for Blazor uh, WebAssembly applications, right? So as we, we deploy the static assets to, to storage, and that's where the initial requests are going to. Uh, when the, the user comes to our application, they are requesting um, the, the files uh, that we need to run uh, to load that and run that, that Blazor app, and that's all coming from, from storage. So, the important thing to keep in mind here is that that completely eliminates the need for me to 
stand up and maintain and run a web server, right? So that's completely taken, um, taken away and abstracted away by this feature of um, um, storage. And the next service being uh, Azure Functions, which is hosting uh, all of our APIs, all of our dynamic content, all of our custom logic that's running on the server side is coming from Azure Functions. That's also providing some of the abstraction over some of the, the other services Dario just mentioned. Uh, so when we're communicating with uh, Cosmos DB or cognitive services, that's all happening from within functions. So the information on how to communicate, how to connect to those services is maintained on the server as part of those APIs. And that's giving you um, the, the dynamic scale capabilities, is giving you the, the billing model um, that, that you have the ability to take advantage of because of the nature of how the, those serverless offerings op, um, function. So in this particular case, um, for functions, um, if I have no load, um, what, what's going to happen is that my function is going to be idle. There is absolutely no code running. Um, and what we see here is that um, we don't have uh, your app loaded and executing any code, which what that means to you is that you're not paying anything for that code. So if there is no traffic, you're not spending any money with the infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure is handling all of the scaling, the dynamic scale for you. Uh, so as soon as the first user comes in and we see that first request, the infrastructure will automatically stand up an instance of your Azure Function app and make those APIs available to that user. And that's going to happen and continue to happen as more users come in and we see that the load is increasing, uh, we'll continue to increase the scale, we continue to automatically scale the, those, uh, that function app to additional instances to keep up with that demand, to keep up with that load. Um, the inverse will also happen as the load goes away, as um, um, our app is no longer being used, uh, we'll scale that, that application down. And you're only paying uh, for the, the time uh, and the execution of your functions. That gives us the ability to have the very flexible billing model um, because of the dynamic and automatic scaling um, that you can, you can enjoy when using some of those uh, serverless offers. And this should help your application be more successful globally. And as you get more end users, you can expect them to be globally distributed. So, what do you do to optimize your experience to ensure fast delivery of that content and reduce the latency? And there are a couple of options in Azure that um, we decided to call out. The first one is Azure CDN. With Azure CDN, you can cache content near the end users for fast delivery, and you can also manipulate HTTP at the, at the edge, at the request, the response, um, with the help of the Rose engine. So Azure CDN is a great pattern to use when you have static content. Now, if you have something similar to this example where you have a lot of dynamic content, a mix of static and dynamic content, a good choice for that is Azure Front Door. Azure Front Door provides dynamic app acceleration. And it provides this global load balancing with near real-time failover. It has points of presence that essentially allow you to achieve that low latency and fast delivery. And then it also allows you to leverage the URL-based routing and redirection for dynamic content. We talked about the resources in Azure that compose our solution. And it would be interesting to actually visit them and explore First of all, how they get delivered, and then what they look like. And specifically, let's focus on the example of our um, Azure Functions. Here we have our function app. This is um, the repo where I've included uh, an Azure pipeline definition. So this is my YAML file that defines how to build and how to deploy. Um, in this case, we're archiving and deploying uh, the package to functions. And you can see the pipeline. Uh, you can see the different executions that we went through. And you have the opportunity to go and inspect um, the different actions and results that were provided part of that pipeline. So now you can see this was a successful deployment. And it resulted in the content being deployed to our Azure Functions resource in Azure. 
And for this specific solution, because we're building a serverless web API, you can see that on the management plane, we have cores, rows defined. And um, also, just going back to the point that we talked earlier about, um, we have this deployed through the pipeline, so you can see the status here as well. However, this is a composed solution. So here is my resource group with a bunch of different resources that compose this solution. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, we are using Azure Functions to abstract the connections and business logic with other services as well. So this is my uh, Cosmos DB. And you can see um, I'm storing different answers um, that I can provide to my end users. And this is my um, Q&A maker. Uh, with the knowledge base that we pre-populated to address serverless topics. And tying it all together is Azure Front Door. Here, you can define your front-end hosts. Um, you can include a custom domain if you um, go beyond the demo step. And then you can define your backend pools that are referencing the services that are actually composing the solution. So I pointed this to storage, and I pointed um, the back end to my um, Azure Functions. And I also created routing rules that essentially enable me to define um, how I want my end users to see the client. And then I can even define rules that point me to the API directly, unified under one URL, because I don't want to expose the different resources that compose the solution to my end users. So let's go back to um, our slides here and talk about what more value we can add with this pattern. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how we go about enhancing one of those apps, right? So we just took an application um, that we broke it down into a, a couple of different components um, that are hosted in different areas, different places in Azure. Uh, so let's look at what we can do to, to enhance this. When we were thinking about that, um, uh, a very clear option was um, uh, some real-time communication, some real-time features. So leveraging a topic that, that has been covered today um, using SignalR. Uh, so we decided to leverage yet another serverless option um, on Azure using the SignalR service. Um, the very nice and convenient thing is that there is a pre-built integration for a signal R service in Azure Functions as well. Um, and uh, making that process extremely simple um, for us. Uh, so the pattern that we're going to be using here, we have uh, our function will be posting messages to the signal R service anytime a new, a new question is asked. So anytime we see any user using our application uh, posting a new question, uh, that question will be published as, a, as an event. Uh, that event is actually going uh, to all of the, the clients that we have connected up at that point in time. So if we look at the diagram, we have a persistent connection between the client and the, the SignalR service. This is a bi-directional um, connection. And we're sending those events to the client, um, giving us the ability to, to have some insights into what other users, how other users are, are, are using our app. So let's take a, a quick look at that. So what, what we're going to do here is uh, Daria has a, a new version of the app that we've been looking at that's been enhanced with uh, that capability. Um, I have the same version of the app here on my, on my machine. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to submit a question to the service. And what we're going to be able to see is that Daria was able to, to see that question, that recent question that just popped up uh, that's being asked. Um, and I didn't do anything. <laughs> her hands are off the keyboard. Um, and uh, this, this shows the, the real-time uh, communication and the push from the, the server to the client. So the clients now have the ability to see those real-time messages, mm -hmm. see um, those questions coming from all of the different clients that are using um, uh, functions as the API. Um, my question here was, um, asking how we could use the Azure SignalR service from Azure Functions. So instead of just talking about it, I thought it would be a good idea for us to show uh, the code that we had to write to make that happen. Um, we actually have a PR open against Daria's uh, repo. And we can see here that we have to touch a, a couple of files. But the, 
the core change that we had to make was really to use that declarative programming model using the bindings that we talked about earlier um, to leverage the, the signal R binding. So we, we had to reference that binding, is a pre-built integration uh, that I have the ability to reference from my, my .NET project, my function project. Um, we have uh, this additional argument uh, as part of my function that, that's being decorated with a signal R uh, service attribute. Um, essentially with a, some basic configuration and metadata to define how that, that binding is going to work. And I have uh, just a few lines of code here to add a message to the service anytime a new question is asked. So that, that was really the extent of the change that I had to make uh, from, from a functions perspective. That's really all, all I had to do to enable the capa capability um, as part of my, my functions, as part of my APIs. And oftentimes we talk about using just a handful of lines of code to accomplish really complex tasks. And in this case, we've enhanced the application with real-time communication. And the, the functions runtime is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Right. There is some additional code on the client to connect and, and keep that persistent connection. But from a, an API perspective, the change that I have to make to my function in order to enable the capability is, this is really all there is to it. So let's um, just recap for a moment because um, we have a few concepts that reference back to this demo. Right. So what we've been able to see is that functions abstracts away a lot of the, the complexity uh, that would otherwise live on the client. So all of the communication, everything that we're doing against uh, Cosmos, against uh, cognitive services, and now against SignalR uh, has been abstracted away from the client. The client doesn't have to... to those are concerns that have been removed and you don't have to worry about the logic on the client anymore. Uh, giving us the ability to also manage that independently. Um, we, we've been able to leverage these pre-built integrations. Um, in this case, we, we've been able to show how we, we've used the SignalR extension and binding um, to, to add the new capability to our API. And we, we also wanted to, to show that a serverless solution may be comprised of a lot of different services. You're not restricted to one option uh, you can combine um, several services um, like functions, uh, in this case, um, storage, signal R service, um, document DB, um, logic apps is another great option of a serverless mm -hmm. uh, option that is often used in conjunction with, with functions. So it, you have a lot of options and typically uh, a full end-to-end -end serverless solution is comprised of a lot of those services. So now that we've talked about each of these components and demos and concepts in isolation, we have a few takeaways. The first one is that you can really leverage the power of distributed microservices to create complex serverless web apps um, that are really not that complex to implement. The client front-end experiences um, have a great opportunity in the form of Blazor WebAssembly. And to get started with that, you can go to AKMS Blazor WebAssembly, and that's a good starting point. The dynamic backend content can be implemented with Azure Functions for your serverless APIs. And to get started, you can go to AKMS Azure Functions. Also, if there are any questions that we won't get to answer today, we have our contact information presented on this slide as well. Cool. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I mean, it no, doesn't look like you. we actually have any specific questions about uh, your talk here. We had one from the last one. I don't know if you want to answer that one. But I, I did want to point out that some, someone is streaming this over Teams. Uh, we've got a virtual meeting. So apparently, they're having a watch party. And we didn't even like we didn't even solicit watch parties. And apparently, we have a watch party going on. So that's awesome watching the community watch you guys. Um, so I think uh, thank you very much for sh coming. Uh, great talk. We have uh, we have le last but not least, OK, uh, one, the one you probably have all been waiting for. Um, we could start a little early because I think this particular talk could use an extra 10 minutes. Um, it's the very, very famous oh. one and only <laughs> Mr. Oh, <laughs> Magoo. No, Mr. Jeff Fritz. Oh, my gosh. He is going to talk about Blazor for Web Forms developers. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening out there. How's it going out there, chat room? My name is Jeff Fritz. 
Welcome to .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. Get in a little bit closer. We're going to break that fourth wall here. We're going to have a great time today writing a ton of code for web forms developers. We're, it's, it's like a back to the future thing, right? Except we're not going all the way back to 1955. We're going back to 2002 or something like that, right? ASPX makes a comeback. We're going to talk about controls. We're going to talk about ASPX pages. We're going to talk about postback, view state, yeah, that's a thing. So I've got I've got my favorite jacket with me here, and uh, I think I, I think I make this look good. I think we're gonna we're gonna get in here. Let's talk about Blazor, and I want to specifically talk to you folks about uh, those folks who are web forms developers. I want to make sure that those are the folks who are stepping to the front here. So if you're watching this on the recording, slow down. Get ready to ask some questions. We're going to answer your comments in the area below the recording here. If you're watching us on Twitch, if you're watching us on Twitch, I'm watching the chat room over here. Let me know. Should, give me a one there in the chat room. Let me know that you're still out there watching because we're going to have some fun talking about web forms now for you Blazor developers, soon to be Blazor developers. So let's talk about Blazor again. Make sure that we recap, go back to the beginning that we, we talked about with Dan at the very beginning of the day today, and let's talk about Blazor and how this works again. Of course, you have a browser and you're connecting to some sort of a service out there in the cloud, right? And, and we hope you're using a very blue cloud, but you're going to connect out to that service and that service for web forms folks is running .NET. You've got ASP.NET out there and we know that we're rendering and delivering content there. Now, you may have some JavaScript that runs in the browser with one of your favorite frameworks. Frameworks, it might be Angular, it might be Vue, it might be React, but that flavor of JavaScript that you have out there is making connections and doing those requests back and forth to the server to get new content to paint on the screen. And we think, we think there's a better way to do this for those folks who enjoy and prefer to use C Sharp and .NET. And that, of course, is Blazor, why we're here today. So to make sure that you web forms developers know what Blazor is, Blazor is that client-side web UI that you can use with .NET instead of JavaScript. You can write reusable web components using C Sharp and Razor. And you can then share your .NET code with both client and server implementations of your user interface. This is important. The, the ability to share that code gives you an opportunity to take your web forms and do something a little bit more. Get the migration pattern that we want there that is going to give you some flexibility going forward. Also with Blazor, you can call into JavaScript libraries and browser APIs as needed. That's pretty big. Typically with web forms, right, we emit some code. We emit some markup that we'll call JavaScript that is already written and built for the browser. But you can call that directly now from your .NET code. You can learn more at blazor.net or you can keep watching this video here with me. So I hope you stay tuned. Um, so, why would you choose to run Blazor on the client or Blazor on the server? This is a question that we get a lot. Certainly, those of you out there watching on Twitch, I know you've seen this question come up a couple times during one of my streams over on Twitch. When you run Blazor with WebAssembly, of course, you have Razor components in .NET that compile together and sit on top of WebAssembly, and that's what we call Blazor, and it interacts with that HTML DOM in the browser. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty, pretty next generation. That's really 2020 that we have there. But when we run on the server, and this is the part that I think is compelling for web forms developers, you're going to take those same Razor components, run them on top of .NET, in this case .NET Core, on the server, and we're going to send changes back and forth to the document object model that's in the browser. We used to do this with web forms. In fact, we had those Ajax panels. Do you remember the Ajax panels, friends? Where you had some code that sat in a square and when you had a postback that happened with that component inside that square of functionality on the screen, well, you got just that area refreshing. It built the XML and made that exchange for you. We're going to do that for you instead using Signal R. So you don't have to think about it, just like you didn't have to plan or arrange or make that Ajax connection work, 
SignalR will do the same thing for you. Of course, Blazor WebAssembly is in preview. We've been talking about that a lot throughout the day today. Uh, that we expect to ship in May 2020. And Blazor Server Side shipped as part of .NET Core 3, and it is part of the long-term servicing release in .NET Core 3.1. So that's dependable, and you will get support for that. Why would you choose one versus the other? We know a little bit about the technology of those two architectures. Blazor for WebAssembly is great for offline support or progressive web applications. You have folks that might be going out into the field and they're going to download that application and run it locally on their device, whether it's a tablet or a phone or some other mobile device. You're going to have great low latency user interface when they use Blazor with WebAssembly. And you can serve it as a static website, just like we heard in our previous session. You can push all of those DLLs that you're going to serve out to a, a static location and let that be delivered to a device and achieve that progressive web app type of experience. Now, server side, Blazor Server, where we want to have our web forms folks start to think, well, that's great when you have a thin client. You want that browser that doesn't have a lot of content downloaded to it. And you're going to send just the changes that happen down to that. You want to have a full .NET runtime available to you. In this case, .NET Core, running on a server that could be in the cloud, in your own data center, and all of your code then is going to run on the server. That's pretty big if you start thinking about things around security, okay? And you want to have validated systems. You're going to have that flexibility when you use Blazor server side. How's it going there, chat room? I've, I haven't seen too many messages come by. Are you, are you still with me here? Let me know out there. I can see the folks hanging out in Twitch. If you're over there in YouTube, let me know what's going on over there. We want to get your questions by the end of this session. I've, I've got all kinds of answers for you if you want to know more about how to use web forms with Blazor. So make sure you send us your tweets. Send us your messages in the Twitch and YouTube chat rooms. All right, so that's a little bit about the two different architectures here, but they're actually more similar than you might think. Look at that, it's right there. So web forms, of course, we've been doing this for how many years? We've got your applications configured in that global ASAX file. Oh my gosh, how many times have you been in that global ASAX file and looked at the application events configuring your application? You built pages and controls, your ASPX pages, your ASCX pages that were out there that interacted to pre present your user interface. You built raw HTML mixed with, with these special controls that were rendered for you, and you didn't know too much about how they behaved. Rendered content on the server, and you would execute and interact with JavaScript in the browser, right? So that's pretty good. We, we understand all that functions. But what about Blazor server side? Well, check this out. Very similarly, we're going to configure an application in now a startup CS file. So we have similar application startup events that we can handle and configure. And in our first demo, you're going to see just how similar they are. Instead of building pages and controls, you're going to build components that can be compiled and listen on a route, much like a page, or consumed like a control. So a lot of flexibility there in what we can do with a component. Instead of uh, building with raw HTML mixed with controls, will you build with Razor templates mixed with components? And those Razor templates we've been doing since MVC. Well, we know how to use Razor. That's pretty good for us to move on with. You're going to continue to render content on the server. And now, instead of just generating some, H some text that executes as JavaScript, you can actually call directly into and interoperate with JavaScript. Now, it's interesting, I'm saying not just call into, but interoperate, right? You can execute JavaScript, and you can have your JavaScript execute your .NET code. Interesting. We've seen some of that in earlier sessions today. I want to make sure you go back and check those out. Now, the differences. What do I need to know, know as a web forms developer that's going to change for me when I get to server-side Blazor? Well, in web forms, I've got those ASPX files with the B-sting notation, right? I've got the less than percent, percent greater than notation where all my c -sharp or VB code executes. I've got view state. I've got post back. Those are, those are things that I know how to manage. I know how to interact with. 
And I've also got master pages. I can execute in .NET Framework 1.0 all the way up to 4.8, right? I've got libraries that are written that target .NET Framework that I can use in web forms, and it runs on IIS on Windows. I've got one place to think about deploying. It's Windows. I'm running on Windows Server, and everything is good. It's a very fixed target uh, that I'm going after. But when I'm running Blazor server side, well, I've got Razor files with that at notation, right? I'm going to wrap my C sharp code with the at notation that I'm used to seeing with Razor. All of my state is managed on the server. There is no view state that I'm passing back and forth to the client. That's important because we know that view state created some problems for folks who were developing their web forms applications back in the day. Our state, okay, it's managed on the server, but now we also get to send those changes back and forth using what we call the SignalR channel. And we heard a bit about how SignalR is used for that from our friend Ryan Novak in the earlier session today. So SignalR now is a better vehicle than that HTTP XML request that we used way back with web forms. We also now run on top of .NET Core 3.0 and later, 3.1, and we do know that it's going to be part of .NET 5. Components for Blazor are written using .NET Standard 2.0 and 2.1. So we can use all the latest versions of, uh, and features of C Sharp that are now available to us. And of course, because Blazor server-side runs on top of .NET Core, that means I can take my content and I can put it on Windows, Mac, Linux. I can put it in containers, run it with my favorite orchestrator, and get a lot of flexibility there in how I build and deploy my applications. So a lot of positives, a lot of negatives that we can see here, changes that you might need to make in order to move back and forth between the two technologies. Let's actually Let's actually take a look at our first set of demos here. I want to compare web forms to Blazor and show you, show you what a migration application that we started putting together for, um, for a little bit of documentation, what it looks like to have that initial web forms application and what the eventual Blazor application looks like and where things change, where things are similar. So I'm going to go over to um, Visual Studio here and we're going to take a look at this first sample um, called eShop on Blazor. So I'm going to escape out of PowerPoint here and get over to, this is not the GitHub repository I wanted to show you. Here it is. This is on my GitHub. This is github.com slash C Sharp Fritz slash eShop on Blazor. The demos that I'm going to show you today as far as comparing and migrating from web forms to Blazor are based on this repository, which is based on uh, forked from another repository that is um, actually part of a book that we're writing. And I'll talk to you more about that when we get to the end of the session and I show you our resources. So inside of here, and this is marked private, I'll make sure I make this public before the end of the session. So inside of this project, I have a eShop Legacy Web Forms project here, and I have an eShop on Blazor project. My eShop Legacy Web Forms project, let me show you the properties on this. This is .NET Framework 4.7.2. It could be .NET Framework 4.8. It could be one of the earlier .NET Frameworks down to 4.6.1. We want to make sure that we get our applications as close to the current version of .NET Framework as possible before we start considering any type of change to Blazor or .NET Core. So this is the version that I'm working with here, and you're going to see this is a pretty, pretty garden variety application that we're working with here. Um, if I open this up, and I, I can already see I've got a bunch of ASPX files mixed with, I've got a log for net XML, packages, config, some master files there. Um, and I've got, I've got some modules over here that I can see. And of course, I have my global ASAX right here. And when I look at the code inside of that, I've got it set up as a container provider accessor because this application takes advantage of dependency injection with web forms. So I can set up and inject services into my web pages as they're being built. So I have a container, I have database access, I have some configuration information here in my session start. 
Um, and I have a, a database configuration here that hits a database context. And that database context is, it's an entity framework database context. Pretty standard look and feel here of how I build and interact with this application. But importantly, in this global ASAX, of course, I have application begin request. When the request starts, set this information, do a little bit of debugging interaction, and prepare for how I'm going to present my page. And when I look at my default ASPX over here, I've got, I've got some content that's hosted inside of a layout. I have a list view here that if I have an empty data template, I'm going to output some information that no data was returned. I have a layout template here that has a, a table layout. And inside that table layout, I have scrolling down here, I have a placeholder, right? We know what ASP placeholder is, and it has some place that I'm going to drop the content for this list view. I have item templates that define here's what each element inside of this collection is going to look like. And I have, I have some data binding here to output what, what my items need to look like inside of each element of the, uh, each cell of this table. So, not bad. ASP hyperlinks here. I'm outputting information. It's pretty straightforward what, what we're trying to accomplish with this. And when I look at how this is similar to Blazor, and I go over to the Blazor version of this application, I have, um, I have my startup CS. And startup has configure services. I'm configuring my container here. And I can scroll down here and I have configure. This is what happens when a request comes in. We had application begin request and here's the handling of what happens when the request begins before we hand off to the interaction. Same thing happens here. Here's what I'm going to do to set up that request and pass along control. And set up, there's my logical thread context for my activity ID. My request information that I'm going to paint on the screen. And I've got some other information that I need to configure for routing and for Blazor so I can set up that SignalR interaction here. So we know how, how some of these things work because it looks and feels and conceptually is similar to what we did with web forms. My index page has a layout as part of this. This, this razor template is going to be rendered inside of an outer layout that's already defined for me. Um, as part of, um, I always get this wrong, let me make sure I get this right. Nope, it's not App Razor. It's Index Razor is, uh, is my page. And is it host? Is that the one I'm thinking of? There it is. So there's my layout where I've got my HTML and body and here's the app. This is where it's going to render that content and place it inside there, just like I had a master page before. My app is going to render and I have a main layout and this is very much the same content as what I had in my master page before up here inside of web forms. So I have a header, a section, and some footer, and this is where I'm going to place my body. Well, site master has, after I get past some of the required web form stuff, I have a header, I have a section, here's my content placeholder where I'm going to place my content, and a footer. So concepts are the same. I just need to know how to pick up and move these into these into their appropriate places that are going to be painted inside of my web forms. So conceptually similar. Let me run the application for web forms and show you what it looks like and we can talk about how we're going to get this to look and feel the same using Blazor. And while this is compiling and starting up there, I'm going to check in with the folks here in the chat room. How are we doing over there, chat room? Let me know. I'm going to refresh and see what's going on over there. Here comes the web page over here. Look at this. I'm double fisting it here, watching what's going on. So I've got a basic grid here for a catalog manager, and this is specifically the web forms version of this. And I'm scrolling down. You can see it's, it's a 
generic list of here's products that we might be selling from from a dotnet shop and i've got links on the side here so i can see some more details about it and okay we didn't stretch the image quite right but i can see information about it and navigate back to the list it's really your garden variety create read update and delete type of application i'm searching for products learning more details about them updating them and being able to delete them. And I've got a little pager down here at the bottom I can use to navigate to the next page of content. Not bad. Pretty straightforward. Electric Havoc in the chat room says, we all want jackets. Let me tell you, I'm going to make this sequin jacket a thing, all right? We're all going to have sequin jackets. But in order to be a good Blazor developer, you need to have a good jacket. Am I right, Electric Havoc? Thank you for tuning in. Uh, is that Web Dev Witch says, I seriously need your jacket in your life. I I completely agree. Everybody needs a very cool, snappy-looking jacket. So this application, it's simple. This is really the start of this, and this is where we want the conversation to start when, it, when we talk about making Web Forms applications be convertible, get them into Blazor. So um, my Blazor code that goes along with this, I've already got laid out here inside of my pages for this, right? I have index, I have create, del delete, details, and edit. And if we look at my index page here, I have, here's a table. If I have content coming back inside this model, and we're, we'll see where the model is defined in just a little bit, um, I'm going to paint my table. And I'm going to output some data inside of this T body element. Um, here's my pager, and it's all written by hand, right? If you're if you're familiar with MVC and really generating your HTML by hand, this might feel comfortable to you. To other folks that are Web Forms developers who enjoy the component, the control-driven experience, this isn't the best of experience, and I think there's something we can do for you. Looking down here, we have a code block, and certainly we can intertwine some of our c -sharp code, some of our VB code in our ASPX files, in our ASCX files with our, um, with our markup. And that's what we've done here. We can do that in Blazor. I have code at, wrapped in this code block. And when the page loads, right, so I have on parameter set, I'm handling that event. When the parameters on this page are defined and set for me, I'm going to load the page and I'm going to call into a catalog service get those catalog items, create a paginated list that we can paint on the screen. And that's my model that I'm going to scroll back up. And if I have content, I want to put a for loop in here to actually paint that content on the screen. Not bad. That gets me somewhere. And it, it does by hand a lot of what's going on over here inside of my default page where I've got, where I've got a list view that takes care of this for me, knows how to format and present and manage all of that. Let me go back over to the slides now and, and I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be ready for Blazor. Because I've talked a, a bit about the differences, I've talked a bit about the similarities and how this demo works, but I want to make sure that you know there are some concerns you're going to have with the architecture of your application when you want to start considering getting it updated, migrated to Blazor. And I'm using the term migrate, it, it really is a, a bit of a rewrite that you need to be aware of and you need to be able to handle here. So C Sharp runs in Blazor. It runs in Razor templates. So you need to make sure you have good C Sharp that will execute in those templates. If you have Visual Basic, you're going to need to make a conversion process in there. .NET Standard very much is a thing that we can use here inside of uh, Blazor. If you already have class libraries it, or references that are outside of your application that are in .NET Framework, you're going to want to get them into .NET Standard. But as we're going to see in our next demo, that's a very good thing to get them into .NET Standard. And if you have third-party control libraries from some of our uh, for some of our vendor friends out there, uh, DevExpress we heard about earlier today, Infragistics, Telerik Progress, you're going to have to make some changes there, some adjustments in order to get into some Blazor components as well. There are some code concerns that you're going to have to address additionally. 
HTTP context and referencing HTTP context.current behaves significantly differently when we get to .NET Core. You don't necessarily have the same objects. HTTP request is a lot different. Query string on HTTP request isn't a thing anymore. So those references are going to break. The data binding with the eval notation, that's not a thing in, in Blazor or Razor templates. So we're going to have to make some conversions there to handle that. Find control. If you went through some of your composite controls so you could find tags, so you could find elements and interact with those before they were painted on the screen, it's going to be a little bit trickier to do that and you can't use find control to walk that control hierarchy. Now, page events, the page events that we know and love from web forms, and of course I'm talking about on init, on load, on pre-render, on unload, those don't exist. We have a different page event model that we can lean into a little bit here, but you're going to have to step away from those. And the closer you can get to model binding inside of your web forms, pages, and controls, you're going to have a little bit more success when you get over to Blazor. So let me move forward to my next demo and actually talk about some of those steps to migrating into Blazor. What it looks like to start pulling back and thinking about the changes you need to make to your application so that we can, we can start to shorten that on-ramp, make it, make it easier. We're not going to make it easy. But to be clear, this is not easy, but we're going to make it easier. So it's slightly less than really difficult, right? So let's, uh, let's take a look at that. How's it going there, chat room? I want to check in and see what's going on over there. No, I'm not going to be talking about Blazor to mobile. That was earlier today. Thank you, Electric Havoc, for helping out with that. Let me take a look. Uh, Surly Dev needs that Blazor. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to make this a cottage industry, getting uh, sequin Blazors out there to developers, let me tell you. So, let's head over here and talk about what it looks like to start migrating our application. So, I'm actually going to change over to a different branch. Um, I'm going to ch change over to, I believe it's... Uh, Finish demo, there we go. So I will change to that, reload things here in Visual Studio, and I want to talk about, I want to talk about first using .NET Standard. .NET Standard, of course, is that contract set of frameworks that we can use that makes our class libraries portable across .NET Framework, Xamarin, and .NET Core. If we take some of our .NET Framework code, push it out into a class library that is .NET standard compatible, well now we can start to reuse that business logic in other places. And this is a good separation of, uh, a good separation, business um, logic separation strategy, a good architecture strategy to get that business logic away from your markup, away from your user interface. A lot of folks with web forms fell into that trap of mixing and matching these. So instead of having all of our models in here, that were specific to just our business logic, I've moved these out of here into a library here called eShop Lib. And you can see it here down the left side. So my catalog brand, my catalog items that I was painting on the screen, here they are. ID, name, description, price, picture name, right? This is all the same thing that I had before that I was painting on the screen, but I have it here in this catalog item. And I have some view models here for that paginated items collection that I'm going to paint on the screen. There's nothing specific to my user interface here, so I moved it out into this project. And of course, I'm going to show you that this project is .NET Standard 2.0, and I've added my component model annotations here so that I can get those annotations that'll help me with a little bit of uh, code generation when I'm using .NET Framework. So I do have this library here, but because I've moved things out into .NET Standard, I can reference it from my .NET Framework project, from my ASP.NET Web Forms project, and continue to work with it. So if I look at, let me show you web config here, and you'll see I've actually added a reference to .NET Standard here, and I've added some namespaces to that eShop lib project. 
so that I can include and continue to reference objects with the exact same name that I had before in my ASPX code. Moving on, if I go back over to my default ASPX, none of my code changed in here. This is still the same code that looks and feels and data binds to those things. And I could run this and I could show you what it looks like. And that's kind of boring. But I could move over and show you that I have an index razor file now that is able to bind to a catalog item. And because I can build components, we put together a concept of a list view component that is going to generate my table for me. So I have a table header here that I wrote that's that first row. And my empty data template looks, it looks kind of like that empty data template that I had over here inside of um, web forms. There it is, no data was returned. So that's a start and, and right, my table header looks fine. And I've changed things inside of my markup here. Let me just put these two side by side so you can see I have scrolling down here, right? I'm doing catalog item dot name instead of the data binding eval expression over here to get some of this data bound and output inside of my code, my markup that I'm going to generate. Well, that's pretty good. And if I run my Blazor server side application now, eShop on Blazor, set this as my application that I'm going to start. We'll open that up and we'll run that using uh, Microsoft Edge Canary because I like to live dangerously. I like to use that latest version of Microsoft Edge. I get the Chrome rendering and everything renders like a standard here for me. And uh, we're gonna paint that stuff on the screen. Here we go. And now I'm running Blazor server side and I've got, well now I've got something that looks the same. And, and if I look through, I have pages here for edit and details that look and feel the same as I had before. I changed a little bit of my markup. I moved my business logic out into that um, shared library and I'm able to, with a little bit of movement of my HTML, get effectively the same application. That's a pretty good start, but, but Jeff, you wrote this list view thing over here. Let me show you that real quick. And a list view is just a component, and the component is kind of like an ASCX page. We know what those are, the user controls that I had. I'm outputting a table, and I have my empty data template. I have a table header, and I've got a row template here. And I'm, I'm calling this list view, but it doesn't really behave like a list view, does it? Because list view had, had, a, had a layout template. And it wasn't specific to tables here, right? There were other things that we could do. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a look. Maybe, maybe there's something we can do to shorten that on-ramp even further. Oh my gosh, do I see a raid there for the Visual Studio channel? Chat room, Twitch chat room, let me know. Is that a raid that I see there? This is not a pre-recorded stream there. Doc is legit. This is the real thing. You're talking to a live stream here. We're live from Redmond. We had some other broadcasts, some other uh, speakers from all over joining us to talk about things that are going on with Blazor. Yeah, I called you out there. That's right. Lana Lux with the rate. Lana, thank you so much for rating. We really appreciate you sending all folks over here to join us for .NET Conf Focus on Blazor. So let me move on and show you this idea that we have. This is another experiment that I want to show you. I'm, I'm, I'm being raided in person now. Our friend Beth Massey has wandered into the studio. I'm, I'm afraid. All right, let me, show you, let me show you what I got here. So this idea that we've started talking about here is something that, that Dan and I, Dan Roth and I, talked about on stage at, um, at Microsoft Ignite 2019, and it was the idea of Blazor Web Forms components. What if we took components in Blazor and made them look and feel and behave the same way as controls from web forms. So there might be something here to even further shorten that on-ramp if we have the same markup that we can copy and paste from web forms and get it working 
over in Blazor. So this isn't intended to be something that you're going to use to build a new application. This is intended for those brownfield applications. It's going to be a shim that's going to get you into Blazor and hopefully encourage you to take better steps, better development practices to build your application. So the goal is we want you to be able to copy and paste your markup with minimal changes into a Blazor component and it just works. Famous last words of every developer, right? Hey, Lana, thank you so much for that raid. Great to see you in the, twi in the Twitch channel. Really appreciate that. Oh, no. Now, look at this. I'm getting, I'm getting folks just uh, literally an in-person raid is happening here in Channel 9 Studio. Let me get over and show you what this looks like. Let me show you the components. I don't get distracted at all here. Do I? Do I, friends? Um, all right, so let's get over. Let me show you. We have, th this is completely an experiment, something we've been doing live on my Twitch stream. You can find this at github.com slash fritzandfriends slash blazer webforms components. And we've written a handful of components so far that will get you started with this. And you can see there's some documentation we have here and a couple of the proof of concept controls we've turned into components. And I'm going to specifically show you what we did with that list view and how we've made it better. So I'm going to check out the final branch that I have here to show you called after Webforms components. And we're going to let this reload on my index razor page. Where'd it go? Index, index. Come on now. There we go. So now let me put the index next to that default page and let's really take a good look at this because now it's going to start to get really interesting. So here's my web forms on the side here, and take a look. I have ASP list view, right? ID product list, item placeholder ID, blah, 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 right? Let me zoom out just a little bit here so we can see some more code on screen. So scrolling down here, I have list view, and instead of ID product list, I have ref product list because that's the way we reference components in Blazor. Item placeholder ID, I have run at equals server, that doesn't actually do anything, but shh, don't tell your friends. Item type equals catalog item. That's the same thing I had here, eShop lib catalog item. And I've got one more thing off the end here, context equals item. That's going to help me format how this looks. I have a layout template just like I had over here, and it's very much the same look and feel, except I took out the carriage returns to make it fit on the screen a little bit better. I have one thing here, context item placeholder, and there's my item placeholder, just like we had ASP placeholder here. It does the same thing. That's where I want to inject my content. I have in my web forms, I have a uh, empty data template, right? And there it is. I've got my TR, no data was returned. And if I scroll down further, my item template looks and feels and actually has the exact same syntax, except it's, it's at signs instead of our data binding here. All I've done is reference these new components that we're, we're talking about, we're experimenting with, and, and this is when I want to hear back from you, chat room, whether you're on Twitch, whether you're on YouTube. If you're on Twitter, let me know, does this type of thing make sense to you? Is this something that's going to lower the on-ramp and help you consider migrating from web forms to Blazor? and it compiles and runs and looks properly on screen. And I don't have view state, I don't have post back. I'm building and working with components that I know how to use, that renders the same HTML as what I had before, and I know how to work with that. So we think there's an opportunity here, and I want to hear from you. Like I said, Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, let us know whether this is something that you are interested in. Let me go over to the slides and wrap up here. So I covered a lot. There's a lot that happened here, and I want to make sure that you have some steps to go forward. There's an architecture book that we're writing right now. We're hoping to get this finished in the next few weeks. If you go to .NET, Microsoft.com, slash learn, slash ASP.NET, slash architecture, there's a book there about Blazor for ASP.NET Web Forms developers. It's going to get you started and talk about the differences between the two user interface frameworks. That Web Forms Components project that you saw, like I said, that's an experiment. You can find that at github.com slash 
Fritz and Friends slash Blazor Web Forms components. And a big shout out to the folks that have submitted pull requests to help those components. I'm talking, of course, about our friend Blazor, Mr. Magoo, and Kabazi. Thank you so much for your help. My name is Jeff Fritz. You can find me at C Sharp Fritz out there on Twitter, Twitch, GitHub, YouTube. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing streaming live, more events, more content, just like we're doing here, check me out at live.csharpfritz.com. That's a .NET conf. How are we doing, Beth? How are we doing, Javier? <laughs> Jeff, woof. Yeah. You actually have questions. I have questions? You do have questions. Uh, All right, I've been trying to keep right. an eye on that chat All right. room. So there's a couple here. Um, Hit first, me up. though, I, first a comment. Um, really love this comment right here. Okay, what do we got? Uh, excellent day of discussion. Learned a lot. Where yep. can we see the video if we missed a topic today? I'm going to let everybody know we will have all of these sessions on demand on the .NET YouTube channel and Channel 9. The crew says 24 to 48 hours because of the snow. Okay, so, all well, right. And but actually, this well, person can't stop staring at wait, you. But, but also, don't forget, you, if you've been watching us on YouTube, if you've been watching us on Twitch, you can also click that videos tab and watch the recording that's native on that platform. You're going to see the entire event. Yes, but we will, have the, we will have them broken up and, and in, in the right you know, oh, session yeah. format so you can download mm -hmm. each one that you're interested in. That one will take a little bit longer yep. to get chopped up. So, yes, you can get the whole stream if you oh, want, yeah. rewind it if you want. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this person also can't stop staring at your blazer. Okay, um, so I'm right. thinking this might be something we have to put in the swag store at some what? point. What? Because... Um, no! We no. should sell this thing, apparently. No! They want this thing. I've, I actually had somebody... It cannot be copyrighted, apparently. I, I actually so. I had somebody <laughs> ask if, if we could raffle this off for a good technical uh, charity, right? Have somebody be able to, to bid on and, and get the blazer blazer. Well, we'll figure that out. I don't know. All right, for a real question now. All right, here we go. Okay, here we go. So, uh, how to retain state based on logged in user? So, how do you retain the state based on a logged in user like we did for ASP.NET Web Forms session? So, your user object, just like you had, and we saw a bit of this uh, earlier today in state management. Um, it wasn't Michael, Wa Michael Washington talked about it in his security session. We also heard a bit about it, about it from, I forget who had the state session, but we did hear about it earlier today. It's, it's something that is available to you on the server, and it's managed in memory for us with, uh, with Blazor server side. So you actually don't have to think about it. It's handled for you, and there are ways to scale it. Take a look at some of the other sessions from earlier today. I'm not going to repeat some of the things they said. Cool. Awesome. All right, same person has a follow-up question here. Fantastic. So uh, how to migrate the session-related code to Blazor? Uh, so session does exist in .NET Core. The tricky thing with using session, though, is right. You're going to end up pushing it out of state, you're out of out of process from whatever web server it is you're using. So you hit that exact same thing. Session is there; it is available to you, but I, I would avoid it as much as possible. Use cookies. You don't need to put everything in session quite like we did in web forms. Cool. All right, Jeff, that's it for questions. Oh, uh, oh my gosh. I think we are done for I the think day, we're done. actually. Javier, come here. I want to uh, oh. just say a special thanks to uh, <laughs> Javier for helping us put together this show. Thank you to all the speakers, the product team, the community, everybody working on Blazor out there. To all of you who watched, we had so many people watching. The top countries out there that were watching was the US, Canada, and Mexico. Those awesome. are your top North three America. countries. North America. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, the Americas. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so uh, I know we had a lot of interactivity with the UK today, though, and our, a lot of our speakers were from there, so that was fantastic. Yeah. So uh, we were pretty much chasing the sun. Like we started in the Europe and the UK, and kind of working our way as across the country into all the way to the West Coast to try to make this event happen for you. So this was our first of our uh, smaller focused series of .NET Conf. As I mentioned earlier in the day, we're going to have another one. Our next .NET Conf focus on Xamarin will happen on March 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeff, your phone's ringing. So. No, that's... Uh, 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 thanks for putting up with some of our technical difficulties today. That's what happens with a live event, but it wouldn't be any fun if we didn't have a little bit of, uh, you know, hijinks once in a while, right? That's right. All right. It makes so. it interesting. And I was mentioning to Beth all this long, this is how technical we are with .NET Conf. This is a run sheet. This is the run sheet. This is what, <laughs> this is what I had to go through and make sure that people were 
specific times, calling everybody else, and this, yeah. this is super high tech. And because of the snow, <laughs> we ended up actually have to call in people, and some people did make it, some people didn't make it, yeah. so it, it kept us on our toes. It um, did. Yeah, so January events, keep that in mind next we time. We don't so. have that problem in September. <laughs> we don't That's have that right. problem as no. much in yes. September. So anyways, thank you so much. Yes. Great show. Uh, please tune in again yep. March 23rd. Perfect. You want to lead, our, lead us out back All right. so we can see yeah, the crowd right there? Go, let's Jeff. Say, All right, here we go. Whoa. Whoa. Everybody here in the studio. Come that check out, out today. Everybody working meeting, hard. Braved the snow. Here they are. <laughs> your friends. <laughs> they Hello. make, they make buddies, this possible. Cameron and Gomez. <laughs> Couldn't have done it without these guys behind the get scenes. The snow? Uh, get the snow. It's dark yeah. now, too. Yes. Uh, Hopefully, we so all make pretty. it home. <laughs> all right, guys. See you next time. <laughs>